Section 1 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 8, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Henrietta Maria, Chapter 1, Part 1. When the beautiful daughter of Henry the Great became the bride of Charles I, two centuries had elapsed since France had given a queen consort to England. The last was Margaret of Anjou, that queen of tears. Perhaps the crown miseries of Margaret had offered an alarming precedent to her countrywomen of high degree. For though several French princesses had been wooed by English monarchs, not one had accepted the crown matrimonial of England, till in 1625 Henrietta Maria wedded Charles, and at the same time became the partaker of a destiny so sad and calamitous, that she, in the climax of her sorrows, surnamed herself La Reine Malarousse. The father of this princess was the most illustrious sovereign in Europe. She was the youngest child of Henry the Fourth of France, and of his second wife, Marie de Medicis. Unfortunately, the mind of the Italian queen was by no means congenial with that of the royal hero of France. She was weak, bigoted, and petulant, and to the failings in her character, most of the future misfortunes of her children may be traced. Neither was Marie de Medicis well treated by her husband, and perpetual jealousy and flagrant wrongs did not improve her disposition. One great point of dispute between the royal pair was that Henry the Fourth had never permitted his wife to be crowned, although she had brought him a beautiful family, consisting of three living sons and two daughters. He used to say himself that his children were the prettiest creatures in the world and that his happiest moments were passed in playing with them. Nevertheless, a weak superstition prevented this great monarch from settling some disputes regarding his marriage with their mother by consenting that her coronation should take place. The queen obtained this concession just before she added to his family a sixth child and third daughter by the birth of the subject of this biography. The princess was born at the Louvre, November 25th, New Style, 1609. The king, his ministers and council, with all the princes of the blood, were, as usual, present at the birth of the royal infant, who was, according to custom, presented to her father before being dressed. Henry took the babe, held it up, acknowledged her as his offspring, and then delivered her to the royal governess, Madame de Monglot, who had thus received all her brothers and sisters at the time of their births. This lady then retired to dress the little princess. The babe was reared in the same nursery with her brother Gaston, who was at that time an infant about fifteen months old. While the queen kept her chamber after the birth of this child, by her tears and importunities, she induced her royal husband to give orders that her coronation should take place directly after her recovery. Meantime, the infant had a grand baptism. She was presented at the font by the cardinal Maffeo Barberini, the papal nuncio at Paris, afterwards the celebrated Pope Urban the Eighth, who was one of the most learned men in Italy and an elegant poet. This sponsor gave the princess the name of Henrietta Maria, called in France Henriette Marie. She was the most lovely of a lovely family. She was the darling of her illustrious father, being the child of his old age, his name child, and she resembled him in features and liveliness more than any other of his family. Henrietta was just five months old when all the preparations for the long-delayed coronation of her mother were completed at the Abbey of St. Denis. Henry the Fourth still put off this ceremonial as long as he could, for some fortune-tellers, who were most likely bribed by his audacious mistress, Madame de Verneuil, had predicted that he would not survive his queen's coronation one day. Strange it is that the mind of so great a man should be liable to such weakness, but so it was. It is probable that the rumor of this prediction, and of the importance that the king placed on it, first excited the insane fanatic who murdered him to fulfill it, and thus it brought its own accomplishment. This fatal coronation at last took place on May 13, 1610. Notwithstanding her tender age, the infant Henriette was present at St. Denis. 
She was held in her nurse's arms on one side of her mother's throne, and was surrounded by her elder brothers and sisters, who likewise assisted at the grand ceremonial, and were, with her, recognized as the children of France. These were Louis the Dauphin, who became, a few hours after, Louis the Thirteenth, Elizabeth, afterwards the wife of Philip the Third of Spain, Henry, Duke of Orleans, who died young, Christine, afterwards married to the Duke of Savoy, and the infant Gaston, Duke of Anjou, so well known in history afterwards as Duke of Orleans. The king and his children returned to Paris after the coronation, but the queen remained at the abbey, in order to make her grand entry into Paris on the following Monday, which was considered the most important part of the pageant. The next day the mind of Henry the Fourth was utterly overwhelmed and depressed by the remembrance of the prediction which threatened him, and to divert his thoughts, he ordered his youngest son, Gaston, in whose infant frolics he took the greatest delight, and the baby princess Henriette, to be brought to him, and in the wholesome relaxation of playing with these dear ones, the hero recovered his usual hilarity, and despising his superstitious fears, he went out as usual in his coach, through the streets of Paris. He was brought home pierced to the heart by the knife of the maniac regicide, Rabbe Locke. Thus was our Henriette, with all France, rendered fatherless. The whole of the dreary night of the 14th of May, the melancholy and terrified inmates of the Louvre, kept watch and ward over the body of their murdered king and his little children. At first it was believed that the blow was struck by some political enemy, and that a great insurrection would succeed. The royal little ones, the eldest of whom, Louis the Thirteenth, was but nine years old, were barricaded in the guard room of the Louvre, and the king's guards, in armor and with their partisans crossed, surrounded them. During this awful vigil, all hearts beat high with anxiety, and no eyes closed except those of the infant Henriette, whose peaceful slumbers in her nurse's arms formed a contrast to the alarm around her. It was soon discovered that the murder of Henry the Great arose from private malice or madness, and that all the French people mourned his loss as much as his family, on which the royal children were restored to their mother, and returned to their usual apartments. There the little Henriette remained secluded until the 25th of June following, the day she was six months old, when her great father's obsequies took place. She was carried forth in the arms of Madame Monglot, and made one in the long doleful procession from Paris to St. Denis. She was required personally to assist in the sad solemnity. And a spurge being put into her innocent hand, she was made to sprinkle his murdered corpse with holy water in that part of the funeral ceremony, where the nearest relatives and friends of the deceased walk in procession round the bier, and perform this picturesque act of the remembrance. It is still a national custom in Normandy for infants to be thus carried. The next public appearance of the royal babe was at the coronation of the little king, her brother, Louis the Thirteenth, which took place in the Cathedral of Rheims, October 17th, 1610, when she was little more than ten months old. Henriette was carried, at this ceremony, in the arms of the Princess of Condé, herself a historical character of no little interest. The Princess of Condé had just returned, with her high-spirited husband, from exile in Flanders, whither the lawless passion of the late king had driven them. Since the death of Henry the Great, his widow had been appointed to the regency of France, during the minority of the little king, then the folly and weakness of her character became manifest by her conduct in dismissing her husband's popular ministers and exalting her own unworthy countryman and domestic, Concini, to the head of the French government. This outrage produced the natural consequence of a violent insurrection led by the princes of the blood. The little Henriette and the rest of the royal children were hurried from Paris to Fontainebleau till the faction was appeased. It was the first movement of civil war, which never ceased to rage in France during the domination of Marie de Medicis as queen regent. Blois and Fontainebleau were the two palaces where Henriette resided chiefly in her infancy. About twelve months afterwards, the Duke of Orleans, the second brother of Henriette, sickened and died. A great outcry was made against Monsieur Le Maitre, the physician who attended on the royal infants, for no one connected with royalty was believed, in the age of crime and slander, to die by the visitation of God, but all by the malice of man. 
the consequence was that the queen regent was forced to effect a temporary reconciliation with the relatives of her royal husband and invite all the princes and princesses of the blood to see the five surviving children before the little henriette had completed her third year she was carried to the nuptial festival of her eldest sister elizabeth with the king of spain which was kept with the utmost splendor at the palace of the place royale henry the fourth from the first moments of their existence had with his own hands severally consigned his infants to the care of madame de monglat a lady who was distantly related to the queen the beautiful daughter of madame de monglat who was about the same age with the elder princesses had an appointment in the nursery of henriette she exercised through life no little influence over her mind the young king who was treated with great severity by the queen regent was excessively fond of madame de monglat and called her mamanga and the princess henriette called mademoiselle de monglat who superintended her infant toilet and arrangements by the same endearing appellation as we shall see in her letters the word is an italian amplification of endearment meaning mamma the children of france had probably learned it from the lips of their italian mother meantime the love of the infant henriette for her own mother amounted to passion for with the partiality often noted in weak parents the queen indulged her not a little and probably spoiled her of all persons that ever reigned marie de medicis was the worst calculated to train a future queen consort for england and the sorrows of her daughter in future life doubtless were aggravated by the foolish notions of the infallibility of sovereigns which had been instilled into her young mind henriette and her young brother gaston received the practical part of their education from m de brevis a very learned man who had been attached to several embassies how this nobleman managed the princess is not known he controlled her brother gaston by tying a rod to his sash when he deserved punishment there is a miniature oil painting in beautiful preservation to be seen at this hour with other curiosities in the hotel de cluny at paris which quaintly represents the princess and her brother gaston in their childhood their mother queen marie de medicis is seated at dinner in a chamber at the louvre or perhaps the place royale the croissy windows open on a garden with orange trees and embroidered parterres to the left of the royal dinner table is a state bed of scarlet velvet with a scarlet velvet counterpane the queen sits at the head of the table in a grand velvet fauteuil madame de monglat is at dinner seated at her left hand and in an angle screened from general observation by the draperies of the queen and their governess are seated both in the same low chair very near to the ground the petite madame princess henriette and the petite monsieur gaston duke of orleans they are about the ages of three and four but their costumes are according to the usages of the era grotesque miniatures of the reigning fashions the little henriette wears the ruff the hood cap and puffed sleeves of that era and her childish brother has the broad beaver hat looped up a scarlet velvet cloak and hose the conduct of this infant cavalier is by no means in unison with his mature garb the queen has just given her little ones somewhat from the dinner table henriette holds on her lap the dish out of which both are eating she looks askance on gaston somewhat disdainfully without condescending to turn her head for he has abstracted a large piece more than his share from the dish and is devouring it greedily the little princess seems equally shocked at his breach of etiquette as at his gluttony she is in the act of raising her elbow to admonish him the expression of her face is most amusing the queen in profile slyly notes the proceedings of her infants two beautiful maids of honor wait behind them the whole piece gives a lively picture of the queen regent's court in home life no male attendant is present in the scene the religious education of the princess henriette was guided by an enthusiastic carmelite nun called mere magdalene she visited this votary at stated times during her childhood and consulted her constantly respecting her conduct in life it is possible that the carmelite might be sincere and virtuous and yet not calculated to form a character destined to a path in life so difficult as that of a roman catholic queen in protestant england the taste for solid learning in the education of princesses was somewhat on the decline in the seventeenth century and in the place of the elaborate pedantry which had prevailed in the preceding age 
the lighter acquirements were cultivated. Henriette and her playfellow, Duke Gaston, had inherited inclinations for the fine arts from their Medician ancestors. They were distinguished for passionate love of painting, practical skill in architecture, and scientific knowledge of music. In after life, the Princess Henriette lamented her ignorance of history to Madame de Motteville, declaring that she had had to learn her lessons of human life and character solely from her own sad experience, which was acquired too late, when the irrevocable past governed her destiny. Marie Antoinette made nearly the same observation when educating her children in the doleful prison of the temple. The ancient pedantry had at least the advantage of introducing its pupils to the starting facts contained in the pages of Tacitus and Livy. In place of such acquirements, the youngest daughter of France learned to dance exquisitely in the court ballets, and to cultivate a voice which was by nature so sweet and powerful, that if she had not been a queen, she might have been, as Mr. Disraeli truly observes, prima donna of Europe. The education of the young princess was perpetually interrupted by the recurrence of some gorgeous state pageant or other, in which her presence was required. When she was but six years old, her mother took her to Bordeaux, to be present at the imposing ceremonial of delivering her eldest sister Elizabeth to the young king of Spain as his wife, and receiving in exchange Anne of Austria, the Spanish bride of Louis the Thirteenth. The family intercourse between Henriette and her sister-in-law, Anne of Austria, thus began at a very tender age, and she was domesticated with this sister-in-law most intimately for ten years before she left France. The political position of the Princess Henriette as a younger daughter, in a country where the Salic law prevailed, did not seem to authorize her mother in thus perpetually bringing her before the public. Perhaps the Queen Regent used her infantine beauty, and the passionate tenderness with which it was well known, the people of France regarded this child of their great Henry, as a means of counteracting her own deserved unpopularity. With this view, the young princess formed one in the grand entry of Paris, which took place in the pacification between the Queen Regent and the Princes of the Blood, May 11, 1616. This peace proved but a short respite in the civil war which desolated France during the regency of Marie de Medicis. Her reign was, however, soon after brought to a conclusion by the slaughter of her favorite Concini and the assumption of power by the boy king of France and his boy minister, the Duke of Lunay. The queen mother was sent under restraint to the castle of Blois, where her captivity was softened by the society of her favorite daughter. Nearly three years of the life of the princess Henriette was passed in this seclusion, till she was drawn from her mother's prison to be present at the wedlock of her second sister Christine with the Duke of Savoy. Henriette was not suffered to return to her mother after this ceremony. She was the only unmarried daughter of France, and her own marriage now became matter of consideration by her brother's ministry. The next year, 1620, a reconciliation was effected between the Queen Mother, Marie de Medicis, and her son, Louis the Thirteenth. By means of her almoner, who afterwards obtained such notoriety as Cardinal Richelieu, she acquired more influence in the government of France than ever, and of course took a decided part in the disposal of her daughter. The Count of Soissons, the younger prince of the Condé branch of the royal family, pretended to the hand of the princess very pertinaciously. He claimed it in reward of his great service at the siege of Rochelle. His addresses were not discouraged, although hopes were entertained that the young princess would become queen of Great Britain. This prospect did not appear till after the marriage between Charles, Prince of Wales, only surviving son of James I, was broken off with the long wooed Infanta. The early youth of Charles has already been detailed in the biography of his mother, Anne of Denmark. We left him in 1619, by her deathbed. Since that time, he had become the most elegant and accomplished prince in Europe, both in mind and person. Deeply impressed with the idea that a man's affections must be possessed by his wedded partner, whether he were prince or peasant, if he had any hopes of leading a virtuous and happy domestic life, he had early set his mind on wooing in person the bride to whom his hand was destined. The Scottish princes, since the time of their high-spirited ancestor, James V, had shown consideration to the feelings of the princesses they had married, seldom known in the annals of royalty. 
Instead of receiving the bride as a shuddering victim, consigned to the mercy of a perfect stranger, James V and James the Sixth had encountered considerable dangers to make acquaintance with their wives and induce some friendship and confidence before the nuptial knot was tied. This family example was implicitly followed by Charles when he undertook the romantic voyage incognito to Spain, accompanied by the Duke of Buckingham, in order to woo Maria Althea, the second daughter of Philip III of Spain and the sister of the young sovereign Philip IV. On this expedition, as they passed through Paris, the Prince of Wales and Buckingham, disguised in perukes and attired in dresses which they considered in keeping with their traveling names of Tom Smith and John Brown, obtained a view of the royal ladies of the French court. The Duc de Montbazon, Lord Chamberlain to the Queen of France, seeing two Englishmen among the Parisian crowd, who thronged as usual to gaze on the royal family, gave them places without recognizing their persons. The prince and his friend witnessed the rehearsal of a ballet in which the beautiful young queen of France danced, accompanied by her sister-in-law, the princess Henriette, who was childish in person and had scarcely attained her fifteenth year. Although she had not seen the prince in his disguise, yet when she heard of his adventures, so captivating to the female heart, she was heard to say with a sigh, The prince of Wales needs not to have gone so far as Madrid to look for a wife. The contemporary French memoirs of Count de Brienne and Madame de Montville, surmising causes by events, affirm that the love which struck Charles for Henriette at this view occasioned the whole failure of his purpose in Spain, and that, in consequence, he entered that country resolved to break his engagement with the Infanta. But we must go a little nearer to the fountainhead for truth in this matter. Anne of Austria, the young queen of France, sister to the one lady, sister-in-law to the other, spoke differently. Forgetting her sisterly interest in the Infanta, out of zeal for her new country, she said, she regretted that when the Prince of Wales saw her and Madame, that was Henriette, practice their mask, that her sister-in-law was seen to so much disadvantage by him, afar off, and by a dim light, when her face and person have most loveliness considered nearer. The attention of Charles was assuredly wholly absorbed in surmising whether the infanta he was going to woo bore any resemblance to her eldest sister, this beautiful young queen of France. His feeling is apparent in a letter he wrote to his father after this adventure, in which he says, Since the closing of our last, we have been at court again. I assure you we have not been known. Where we saw the young queen of France, little monsieur, that is Gaston, Duke of Vorlan, and Madame Royale, Henriette Marie. At the practicing of a mask, and in that, danced the queen and madame, with as many as made up nineteen fair dancing ladies, amongst whom the queen of France is the handsomest, which hath wrought in me a greater desire to see her sister. It is useless to follow the future husband of Henriette of France through the delusive mazes of his imaginative passion for the infanta, Maria Althea, the woeful matrimony of the Spanish princess, Catherine of Aragon, with Henry the Eighth, has filled the Spaniards with distrust of an English alliance, on the one hand, and the horrid persecution of the Protestants during the wedlock of Philip the Second with Mary the First, had given the English people still greater cause for disgust at Spanish marriages. The treaty with the Infanta was broken off by reason of the extreme unpopularity of the Union in both countries, although the court poet of Madrid, Lope de Vega, composed verses on the wooing which have obtained a historical celebrity, and the following quatrain was sung to many a guitar at Madrid. Carlos Estorado soy, que siendo amor mi a guía, al cielo de España voy, per ver estella María. Charles himself translated the lines. Charles Stuart, I am, love guides me afar, to the heavens of Spain, for Maria my star. It was in vain that poetry, romance, and mutual preference impelled the marriage. The reasons we have detailed above prevented it. Charles had his heart returned on his hands, and the Infanta, after she lost hopes of becoming his wife, resolved to devote herself to a religious life. Some authors actually believe that Maria Althea died a nun professed, she, however, lived to be Empress of Germany. The first idea of a marriage taking place between Henriette of France and Charles, Prince of Wales, was suggested to him by her eldest sister, Elizabeth. 
This princess, as the young queen of Spain, wife of Philip IV, was greatly admired by Charles while in Madrid. He wished to converse with her, but she was so sedulously guarded by the jealousy of the Spaniards, that it was with the greatest difficulty he obtained the opportunity of addressing to her a few words in French. Although a Frenchwoman, the young queen dared not to be heard to answer in her native language. She said, however, in a very low voice, I must not converse with you in French without permission, but I will endeavor to obtain it. She succeeded and made use of the opportunity to tell him that she wished that he would marry her sister Henriette, which indeed he would be able to do, because his engagement with the Infanta would be certainly broken. Charles, in the course of this conversation, expressed a hope that he might again renew it at the theatre, where, in the royal box, it appears the interview took place. But she warned him very kindly, Never speak to her again, for it was customary in Spain to poison all gentlemen suspected of gallantry towards the queens. After this charitable intimation, which was perhaps rather premature, the Prince of Wales never saw the Queen again, for when she went to the theatre, she sat secluded in a lattice box. This incident was related by Charles himself to his wife after his marriage. It is a curious illustration of the manner in which young queens were trained in Spain, and the romantic notions instilled into their minds. The Spanish wooing certainly smoothed the way for the marriage of Charles and Henriette, it had accustomed the English people to the idea of a Catholic queen. Moreover, the alliance with the daughter of the Protestant hero, Henry the Fourth of France, was not by many degrees so offensive as that with the granddaughter of the persecutor of their faith, Philip the Second. The ice had in some degree been broken with the Pope. This pontiff, who was one of the best men that ever filled the papal chair, had a great objection to the marriage with either princess, predicting the utmost misery to Charles if he wedded a Catholic. But the powerful Catholic sovereigns of France and Spain induced some degree of compliance from him. The marriage articles of the Infanta and the program of the ceremony was previously agreed on at Rome, formed a precedent for the terms of the wedlock which actually took place between Charles and Henriette. Before the engagement with the Infanta was formally broken off, James I sent Henry Rich, Lord Kensington, to France, on a secret mission, to ascertain whether the hand of Henriette Marie of France could be obtained for his son. Marie de Medicis, the Queen Mother, since the early death of her enemy Lunet, the boy minister of her son, governed the state with greater power than in her ostensible regency, and with her, Lord Kensington was directed to discuss the alliance. When the Spanish ambassador resident in Paris guessed the errand of Lord Kensington, he endeavored to raise distrust at the court of France by exclaiming to some of the French courtiers, How does the Prince of Wales then mean to wed two wives since he is nearly married to our Infanta? These words being carried to the Queen Mother of France had no worse effect than inducing a curious dialogue of explanation between her and Lord Kensington. After some diplomatic maneuvering on both sides, Marie de Medicis drew from the English envoy an admittance that the Spanish engagement was wholly broken, and that King James was desirous of matching his heir with her daughter. The Queen Mother observed, that however agreeable such union might be to all parties, yet as no intimation of such desire had been sent to the court of France, she could not consider the matter seriously. Adding significantly, the maiden must be sought, she may be no suitor. The ambassador then owned that he was authorized in what he said, and that his mission, though at present secret, was direct from his king and the Prince of Wales. The object of Lord Kensington's visit to the French court soon became public there. Of course it occasioned very earnest discussion among the ladies of the royal household, who eagerly crowded round the handsome Englishman, and questioned him regarding the person and acquirements of the Prince of Wales. The ambassador wore a beautiful miniature of Charles, enclosed in a gold case, hanging from a ribbon at his bosom. Often when he entered the circle at the Louvre, the French ladies used to petition him to open the miniature, that they might look at the resemblance of the future husband of their young princess. Charles's portrait had been seen by everyone, but by the lady most interested in it. But Henriette of France was forbidden by the laws of etiquette, to mention a prince who had not yet openly demanded her hand. She complained that the queen and all the other ladies could go up to the ambassador, open the miniature, and consider it as much as they liked, 
while she, whom it so nearly concerned, could hardly steal a glance at it afar off. In this dilemma she recollected, that the lady at whose house the English ambassador sojourned had been in her service, and she begged of her to borrow Prince Charles's picture, that she might gaze on it as much and as long as she chose. This was done, and when the lady brought it to her, Henriette retired to her cabinet, and ordered her to be called in, and to remain alone with her. Where, continues the ambassador, she opened the case in such haste, as showed a true indication of her passion, blushing at the instant of her own guiltiness. She kept it an hour in her hands, and when she returned it, gave many praises of your person. Sir, this is a business so fit for secrecy, as I know it shall never go farther than unto the king your father, my lord duke of Buckingham, and my lord of Carlisle's knowledge. A tenderness in this is honorable, for I would rather die a thousand times than it should be published, since I am by the young princess trusted, who is for beauty and goodness an angel." It was the intention of Lord Kensington to promote favorable inclinations between the Prince of Wales and the Princess of France before they met, by dwelling on their fine qualities to each other. This course he pursued very successfully, by means of his prettily written letters addressed to Charles, and by his eloquent discussions on the beauty, graces, and accomplishments of that prince, during his interviews with the Queen Mother and her ladies, and subsequently with Henriette herself. He says in one of his letters to the prince at this period, She is a lady of as much beauty and sweetness to deserve your affections as any woman under heaven can be. In truth, she is the sweetest creature in France and the loveliest thing in nature. Her growth is little short of her age and her wisdom infinitely beyond it. I heard her the other day discourse with her mother and the ladies about her with extraordinary discretion and quickness. She dances, the which I am witness of, as well as ever I saw any one. They say she sings most sweetly. I'm sure she looks as if she did. In the course of a few days, he heard this wonderful voice and adds to his information. I had been told much of it, but I found it true, that neither her singing master, nor any man or woman, either in France or Europe, sings so admirably as she doth. Her voice is beyond all imagination. That is all I will say of it. The musical and vocal powers of the Queen Mother, Marie de Medicis, were likewise of the first order, and her daughter inherited from her gifts so lavishly bestowed on the children of Italy. While Lord Kensington was thus negotiating between the affections of the royal pair, without having any ostensible responsibility regarding a marriage treaty between them, he experienced very uncivil behavior from the disappointed suitor of the princess, her cousin, the young Count of Soissons. When Lord Kensington bowed to him as one of the princes of the blood, he received the salute very scornfully, turning away his head. Count de Gramont, his friend, advised him not to make his displeasure so manifest, upon which Soissons declared, that the negotiation for the hand of Henriette went so near to his heart, that were it not in behalf of so great a prince, he would cut the ambassador's throat. Nay, he continued, were it any prince of Savoy, Mantua, or Germany, here in person, soliciting for themselves in this marriage, I would hazard my life against them. End of section one. Section two of Lives of the Queens of England, volume eight, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Henrietta Maria, Chapter 1, Part 2. When it was ascertained, by the means of Lord Kensington, that the marriage would be agreeable to both royal families, and that the religious prejudices of neither were strong enough to prevent it, James I sent over an ambassador extraordinary, in the foppish person of one of his favorites, Hay, Earl of Carlisle, a courtier chiefly distinguished for his ingenuity in hanging forty thousand pounds worth of finery on his dress. Carlyle being a mere state puppet, the diplomatic part of the marriage treaty was still carried on by the agreeable and elegant Kensington, who was now ostensibly joined with him in the mission. When Marie de Medicis and her daughter gave audience to the English ambassadors, letters and a portrait of Charles were offered by them, in form to the princess, who, turning to her mother, requested permission to receive them. 
leave being granted by the queen mother henriette took the portrait she had so earnestly desired to possess and according to the testimony of the ambassadors read the letter of the prince with tears of joy and when she had perused it twice put it in her bosom and placed the epistle of the king his father in her cabinet when james i read this account he said in a jocose manner the young princess means by this proceeding to intimate that she will trust me and love my son yet i ought to declare war on her because she would not read my letter without her mother's consent but i suppose i must not only forgive her but thank her for lodging charles's letter so well in return a beautiful miniature of the princess was sent to charles who was transported at the contemplation of those charms which though at present in the bud when fully developed rendered her renowned as one of the loveliest queens in history the only fault that could be found in the person of henriette at fifteen was that she was diminutive in stature but as our contemporary memoir states the wooing ambassador assured the king and prince that the princess christine her sister was not taller at her age and was at present grown into a very tall and goodly woman lord kensington requested the queen mother to authorize a private interview between the princess and him because he had a message from his prince which he wished to deliver in person the queen mother perhaps for the purpose of eliciting a lively dialogue with the handsome ambassador appeared to demur as to whether the interview ought to be granted she would writes lord kensington needs know what i meant to say to her daughter nay then quoth i smiling your majesty would needs impose on me a harder law than they in spain did on his highness alluding to the visit the prince made to court the spanish infanta but the case is now different said marie de medicis for the prince was in person there here you are but his deputy yet a deputy answered i who represents his person for all that returned the queen what is it you would say to my daughter nothing i answered that is not fitting the ears of so virtuous a princess but what is it reiterated the queen mother why then madam quoth i if you will needs know it shall be much to this effect that your majesty having given me liberty of freer language than heretofore i obey my prince's command in presenting to your fair and royal daughter his service not now out of mere compliment but prompted by passion and affection which both her outward and her inner beauties have so kindled in him that he was resolved to contribute the uttermost he could to the alliance in question and would think success therein the greatest happiness in the world such with some little more amorous language was to be my communication with her highness allay allay smilingly exclaimed the queen mother of france there is no great danger in that je me fie en vous she continued I will trust you. Neither did I abuse her trust, continues the elegant ambassador, for I varied not much from what I said in my interview with Madame Henriette, save that I amplified it a little more. She drank it in with joy, and with a low curtsy, made her acknowledgments, adding that she was extremely obliged to my prince, and would think herself happy in the occasion that would be presented of meriting a place in the affections of his good grace. The flattering courtier had previously informed Charles that his reputation as the completest prince in Europe in manners and person had certainly raised in the heart of the sweet princess, Madame Henriette, an infinite affection. Notwithstanding this propitious commencement, difficulties, which appeared almost insurmountable, beset the arrangement of every article of the marriage treaty. It even seemed impracticable to agree on a marriage ceremony which should be considered legal and binding, both by the Protestants and Catholics. Pope Urban was extremely averse to the Union, which he predicted would be a disastrous one, and the most dangerous step that his young goddaughter could take. The opinion of the pontiff was founded on his knowledge of the temper of the English people, derived from the information of the seminary priests, actively employed on proselytizing missions. He rightly anticipated that if the royal family of Stuart relax the bloody penal laws against the catholics that their people would not suffer them to reign long 
If, on the other hand, King James or his son continued those persecutions, how could the princess enjoy one moment's happiness in her wedlock? Thus arguing, Pope Urban Barberini delayed the dispensation in hopes of frustrating the marriage of Charles and Henriette. The Queen Mother of France was, however, determined to expedite the marriage, whether Pope Urban approved or not. After great debate, the English procurators agreed that the princess and her attendants, with their families and followers, should enjoy the free exercise of their religion in England. To this end, she should be provided with chapels, oratories, and chaplains, in the same manner and with the same privileges as those conceded to the Infanta, that her portion should be 800,000 crowns, one moiety to be paid on the day preceding the marriage, the other within twelve months afterwards, and that she should, for herself and her descendants, solemnly renounce all claim of succession to the French crown. A clause, fraught with evil consequences to both countries, and with ruin to the house of Stuart, was inserted. This was, that all the children of Henriette should be brought up under her care till their thirteenth year, thus giving to the Catholic mother the opportunity of infusing into their infant minds a bias towards the faith she professed. It is often asserted in history that by the marriage articles, the children of this union were to be brought up Catholics till their thirteenth year. This was not expressed, but all reasoning persons will agree that facilities were allowed for it. This clause was broken by Charles I, but of course considered valid by his queen, whenever she had an opportunity. The treaty was solemnly ratified December 12, 1624. One of the marriage articles secretly stipulated for a relaxation of the persecution against the Catholics, and in proof that King James meant to observe his promise, he issued instructions ordering all persons in prison for religion to be released and all fines levied on Catholic recusants to be returned. Likewise, commanding all judges and magistrates to stop the executions of papists convicted under the penal laws. From this moment may be dated the origin of the direful dissensions between the English parliaments and the Stuart monarchs. Pope Urban still delayed delivering his dispensation for Henriette's marriage. He required that the toleration on which James had acted should be confirmed publicly, and he forbade his nuncio at Paris to deliver his brevi of dispensation till this article was ratified. King James died before the nuncio, Spada, delivered the brevi of dispensation to the Queen Mother of France, and the royal betrothed of Henriette ascended the throne of Great Britain under the title of Charles I. He immediately renewed the marriage treaty on his own authority. Pope Urban's reluctance to grant his dispensation greatly displeased the Queen Mother of France, who resolved to follow the precedent of the marriage of Margaret of Valois and Henry of Navarre, and celebrate the marriage without the license of Rome. When Pope Urban found that such was the case, he ordered Spada to deliver the brevi to the French ministers. Yet Urban, says one of the Barberini manuscripts, still presaged misery to this marriage. After delaying the brevi as long as possible, he only granted it to avoid the greater scandal of the princess being wedded without the papal benediction. The Duc de Chevreuse, a prince of the House of Guise, and, through the mother of Mary, Queen of Scots, a near kinsman of Charles I, on that account was appointed to represent his person and give his hand by proxy to Henriette. The ancient custom of marrying at the church door was revived on this occasion, the formula drawn up at Rome for the direction of the Infanta's wedlock with Charles was observed. This ordained that the bride, as soon as the ceremony was over, should enter the cathedral and assist at the mass. Meantime, the English prince should, on the threshold of the cathedral, recognize her as his wife, according to the rites of the Catholic Church and with the authority and benediction of the whole pontificate. It was noticed as a point of delicacy in the conduct of the Duc de Chevreuse, that, although a zealous Catholic, when he represented the person of Charles I, his kinsman, he made no more religious concessions than if he had really been a Protestant. He withdrew from the Mass and joined the two English ambassadors, who were waiting apart, ready to take their proper places in the bridal procession from Notre Dame. This ceremony took place May 21, 1625. 
Scarcely was the marriage over at the door of Notre Dame, when the Duke of Buckingham arrived, quite unexpectedly, with the splendid train of English nobles, in order to escort the young Queen of England home. The whole court and royal family of France prepared to accompany the bride of Charles I, in magnificent progress, to the coast opposite to England, during which they were to be entertained with all the pageantry ingenuity could devise. These diversions, suited as they were to the semi-barbarous magnates of the Middle Ages, who, fierce as they might be, were in intellect like grown-up children, had begun to be tedious in an age which had produced Sully, Bacon, and Shakespeare. The only pageant of historical interest was one in which the young queen was greeted by representatives of all the French princesses that had ever worn the English crown. They certainly formed a group distinguished by calamity, one was wanting to complete the tableau of beauty and sorrow, and that one, when she took her place on the historic page, is found to be Henriette. The young king of France was attacked with an illness so violent that he was forced to give up his intended journey to the coast. The queen mother, Marie de Medicis, was struck with a dangerous malady on the route to Campania, which seems to have occasioned a delay in the arrival of the young queen in England, who was detained by the alarming illness of her mother a whole fortnight in Amiens. Different reports were circulated, assigning secret reasons of this delay. The Puritan party invented one which has taken its place in history. This was that the Pope had imposed a fortnight's penance on Henriette, to punish her for wedding a heretic king. The dangerous illness of her mother was the simple, and therefore the more probable cause. At length, the queen mother was convalescent in health, and had acquired sufficient firmness of mind to take leave, as she thought forever of her favorite child. As she bade her farewell, she placed in her hand the following letter, the composition of which had been the occupation of her sick chamber. The Queen Mother, Marie de Medicis, to the young Queen of England, Henriette Marie, 1625, June 25th. My daughter, you separate from me, I cannot separate myself from you. I retain you in heart and memory, and would that this paper could serve for an eternal memorial to you of what I am. It would then supply my place and speak for me to you when I can no longer speak for myself. I give it you with my last adieu in quitting you, to impress it the more on your mind, and give it to you written with my own hand, in order that it may be the more dear to you, and that it may have more authority with you in all that regards your conduct towards God, the king, your husband, his subjects, your domestics, and yourself. I tell you here sincerely, as in the last hour of our converse, all I should say to you in the last hour of my existence, if you should be near me then. I consider, to my great regret, that such can never be, and that the separation now taking place between you and me, for a long time, is too probably an anticipation of that which is to be forever in this world." On this earth, you have only God for a father, but as he is eternal, you can never lose him. It is he who sustains your existence and life. It is he who has given you to a great king. It is he who, at this time, places a crown on your brow and will establish you in England, where you ought to believe that he requires your service, and there he means to effect your salvation. Remember, my child, every day of your life that he is your God, who has put you on earth, intending you for heaven, who has created you for himself and for his glory. The late king your father has already passed away. There remains no more of him, but a little dust and ashes, hidden from our eyes. One of your brothers has already been taken from us, even in his infancy. God withdrew him at his own good pleasure. He has retained you in the world, in order to load you with his benefits. But as he has given you the utmost felicity, it behoves you to render him the utmost gratitude. It is but just that your duties are augmented in proportion as the benefits and favors you receive are signal. Take heed of abusing them. Think well that the grandeur, goodness, and justice of God are infinite, and employ all the strength of your mind in adoring his supreme pusillance, in loving his inviolable goodness, and fear his rigorous equity, which will make all responsible who are unworthy of his benefits. Receive, my child, these instructions of my lips, 
begin and finish every day in your oratory with good thoughts and in your prayers ask resolution to conduct your life according to the laws of god and not according to the vanities of this world which is for all of us but a moment in which we are suspended over eternity which we shall pass either in the paradise of god or in hell with the malign spirits who work evil remember that you are daughter of the church by baptism and that this indeed the first and highest rank which you have or ever will have since it is this which will give you entrance into heaven your other dignities coming as they do from the earth will not go farther than the earth but those which you derive from heaven will ascend again to their source and carry you with them there render thanks to heaven each day to god who has made you a christian estimate this first of benefits as it deserves and consider all that you owe to the labors and precious blood of jesus our savior it ought to be paid for by our sufferings and even by our blood if he requires it offer your soul and your life to him who has created you by his pusillance and redeemed you by his goodness and mercy pray to him and pray incessantly to preserve you by the inestimable gift of his grace and that it may please him that you sooner lose your life than renounce him you are the descendant of saint louis i would recall to you in this my last adieu the same instruction that he received from his mother queen blanche who said to him often that she would rather see him die than to live as to offend god in whom we move and who is the end of our being it was with such precepts that he commenced his holy career it was this that rendered him worthy of employing his life and reign for the good of the faith and the exaltation of the church be after his example firm and zealous for religion which you have been taught for the defense of which he your royal and holy ancestor exposed his life and died faithful to him among the infidels never listen to or suffer to be said in your presence ought in contradiction to your belief in god and in his only son your lord and redeemer i entreat the holy virgin whose name you bear to deign to be the mother of your soul and in honor of her who is mother of our lord and savior i bid you adieu again and many times i now devote you to god for ever and ever it is what i desire for you from the very depth of my heart your very good and affectionate mother maria from Amiens, the 10th of June, 1625. The maternal tenderness and even the sublime moral truths which occur in this elegant letter ought not to mislead the judgment from the fact that the spirit of the concluding section was a very dangerous one to instill into the mind of the inexperienced young girl who was about to undertake the station of queen consort in a country where the established religion differed from her own. It was calculated to exaggerate and inflame those differences, for wherever the word Christian occurs, Roman Catholic is exclusively meant, and the Queen Mother evidently wishes to imply that in any country where the host was not worshipped, the deity of Christ was blasphemed, and that her daughter was going among people whose creed was similar to deists or Jews part of the letter evidently urges the young queen to enter england as if she were a missionary from the propaganda about to encounter the danger of martyrdom and a comparison is drawn in most elegant language between henriette and the english and her ancestor saint louis and the heathens and instead of inculcating a wise and peaceful tolerance the utmost zeal of proselytism is excited in a young and ardent mind to this letter may be attributed the fatal course taken by the young queen in england which aggravated her husband's already difficult position as the king of three kingdoms each professing a different faith the original plan of the progress of the bride to england was by way of calais but she was obliged to embark at boulogne because calais was infected with the plague at boulogne another detention occurred owing to the whims of the duke of buckingham who having previously amazed the french court by the extravagances of his insolent passion for the beautiful young queen of france and of austria took it into his head that he would see her once more buckingham pretended that he had received dispatches of great importance from his court and rushed back to amiens where the young consort of louis the thirteenth remained with the queen mother and conducted himself there with unparalleled absurdity 
the young queen of england took no little affront at being detained while her escort was amusing himself with these freaks charles i meantime had travelled to dover where he was waiting impatiently the arrival of his queen instead of which he received intelligence of her mother's dangerous illness and her wish for a few days delay which he granted courteously and requested that she would not come till she could feel perfectly at ease in her mind during this interval the king retired to canterbury the discharge of ordnance from the opposite shores of france announced the embarkation of the royal bride june twenty third after a stormy passage she arrived before dover on sunday evening at seven o'clock where she stepped from her boat on an artificial bridge the king had ordered to be constructed on purpose for her accommodation charles was then at canterbury where he remained out of point of delicacy that the queen might be somewhat recovered from the fatigues of her voyage before the agitating circumstance of a first introduction took place between them a gentleman of the royal household one mr turwit brought the tidings of the queen's arrival to charles i with extraordinary speed it is said he was but thirty-six minutes riding from dover to canterbury the king came to dover castle to meet his queen at ten o'clock the following morning his arrival was unexpected she was at breakfast she rose hastily from the table although he wished to wait for the conclusion of the meal the royal bride hasted down a pair of stairs to meet the king and then offered to kneel and kiss his hand but he wrapped her up in his arms with many kisses the set speech that the princess had studied to greet the royal stranger whom she had to acknowledge as her lord and master was sire je suis venu en ce pays de votre majesty pour entrer commandé de vous sire i am come into this your majesty's country to be at your command but the firmness of the poor princess failed her she finished the sentence with a gush of tears and very natural it was that they should flow the sight of her distress called forth all the kindness of the heart of charles he led her apart he kissed off her tears protesting that he should do so till she left off weeping he soothed her with words of manly tenderness telling her that she was not fallen into the hands of enemies and strangers as she tremblingly apprehended but according to the wise disposal of god whose will it was that she should leave her kindred and cleave to her spouse adding that he would no longer master himself than while he was a servant to her this mingled softness and gallantry reassured the weeping girl her dark eyes brightened anew and she soon fell into familiar discourse with the royal lover in the course of conversation he seemed surprised that she appeared so much taller than she had been represented to him for finding she reached to his shoulder he glanced downward at her feet to see whether her height had not been increased by artificial means with her natural quickness of perception she anticipated his thoughts and showing him the shoes she wore she said to him in french sire i stand upon my own feet i have no help from art thus high am i neither higher nor lower at the conclusion of this interview the young queen presented all her french servants to his majesty recommending them to him particularly by name madame st george the daughter of madame de monglat the queen's governess was the principal of her ladies and to her king charles took a very early antipathy that beautiful coquette the duchess de chevreuse was of the party but she seems to have arrived in the quality of guest she was the wife of the king's cousin the duc de chevreuse who had represented his royal person by proxy at the recent marriage ceremony and completed his trust by escorting the royal bride to england the absence of madame de chevreuse from paris was in fact a species of banishment inflicted on her as penance for some of the vagaries with which from the pure love of mischief she had been bewildering all the heads and hearts she could captivate at the french court nor did she lack english admirers for the wooing ambassador lord kensington was passionately in love with her charles i received the duc de chevreuse graciously and treated him as a kinsman he conducted him himself to the presence chamber in dover castle where he found the fair duchess of chevreuse and bade her welcome the royal party left over the same eventful day that saw the king introduced to his queen on the road to canterbury the royal party passed barham downs where there were pavilions and a banquet prepared 
and all the English ladies of the queen's household were waiting to be presented to their royal mistress. The king assisted her to alight from her carriage, and on the green sod that June morning, the royal bride held her first court, and was introduced to her English ladies. At Canterbury, a magnificent feast awaited them, at which Charles served his beautiful bride at table, performing the office of carver to her with his own royal hands. The queen, that she might not refuse the viands he offered her, ate both of the pheasant and venison he laid on her plate, although her confessor stood by her, and reminded her it was a fast, being the vigil of St. John the Baptist, and entreated her not to give cause of scandal, by eating forbidden food in a strange land, at her first arrival. But the young queen, either determined to conciliate her new subjects, or being very hungry from her journey, paid no heed to these injunctions, but ate without scruple, the meat the king had carved for her. The same evening, the 24th of June, it is asserted that Charles and Henriette were personally married at Canterbury. The ceremony took place in the great hall of that ancient city, where they sojourned till the 26th of June. Charles I chose to enter his metropolis by the old state highway of the River Thames, and for this purpose took the ancient route from Canterbury to Gravesend. Ostensibly he wished to show his bride that magnificent navy which was always the pride of the Stuart sovereigns, but the chief motive was to avoid passing through the narrow and infected streets of the city of London, then reeking with the plague. At Gravesend, the royal bride was escorted to a state barge by the king. Hundreds of beautiful barges, belonging to the nobility and merchants of London, floated around ready to fall into the royal procession, which was greeted by the thundering salutes of the noble navy, riding at anchor near Gravesend. Newspapers were then in their infancy, their places were supplied by newsletters, which were manuscript epistles, written by professed intelligencers, to the different nobles distant from court, who could afford to treat themselves with such luxuries. Some of these letters are extant, and contain minute particulars of the Queen's progress to London from her embarkation. Yesterday, betwixt Gravesend and London, our queen had a beautiful and stately view of that part of our navy, which is ready to sail, which gave her a volley of fifteen hundred shot. And indeed it required firm nerves to stand a royal salute in those days, for all the guns fired were shotted, and some awkward accidents happened now and then, in consequence. At five o'clock, in a warm thundering June afternoon, the queen drew near the metropolis, a heavy shower was falling at the time, but thousands of boats and ornamental vessels followed or surrounded her royal barge. Fifty good ships discharged their ordnance as the gay floating pageant passed up the river, and last of all, the tower guns opened such a peal as, I think, the queen never heard the like. The king and queen were both in green dresses. Their barge windows, notwithstanding the vehemence of the shower, were open, and all the people shouting amain. The queen put out her hand, and shaked it to them. She has already given some good signs of hope that she may, ere long, by God's blessing, become ours in religion. One of these signs was the rather doubtful one of eating the wing of a pheasant on the vigil of St. John the Baptist, and another, more hopeful, in the answer she made to one of her English attendants, who venturing to ask, If Her Majesty could endure a Huguenot? Why not? replied the queen was not my father one? It had been well for her majesty if she had remembered whose daughter she was more frequently, but this speech, uttered some time in the course of her progress to the metropolis, comprehends the whole of the religious tolerance she was ever known to practice, though the utmost moderation was required from her, both as a wife and queen, professing a different religion from her husband and his people." The royal barge, after shooting London Bridge, made direct for Somerset House, the Queen's Dower Palace, before the procession arrived there, an accident happened which caused great alarm. The banks of the river were literally lined with spectators, who stood on barges, lighters, and ship's hulls. One of these vessels capsized for want of ballast, and immersed above a hundred persons in the Thames. But the boats that were shooting about in all directions soon picked up the unfortunate sightseers, with no other damage than a thorough ducking. Public rejoicings for the Queen's entry prevailed throughout London. That evening, the bells rang till midnight, bonfires blazed on every side, 
and as much reveling was kept up as the plague-spitten state of the city would permit. Such, however, was the appalling pestilence which prevailed, that King Charles withdrew his young bride from it as soon as he had opened his parliament, at which she appeared, seated on a throne by his side. Soon after this splendid scene, the royal pair retired to Hampton Court, where they passed their first weeks of married life. The French ladies, who had accompanied the young queen from Paris, attended her thither, and formed some of the most brilliant ornaments of her circle. Apartments were assigned to the Duke and Duchess de Chevreuse at Richmond Palace, which favor excited the jealousy of all the ambassadors of different courts then resident in England. King Charles replied that this favor was granted to them, not as ambassadors, but as relatives, and that it was occasioned by the anxiety his young queen felt on account of the situation of her cousin, Madame de Chevreuse. This celebrated lady afterwards gave birth to a daughter in England, but the queen's anxieties respecting her health were not much required, since in the course of the summer, among other freaks, she astonished the English court by her exploit of swimming over the Thames one hot evening, and obtained in consequence the surname of the female Leander. The queen's confessor, Father Sancy, very early gave offense to King Charles, who sent him back to France in course of six weeks, for officiously insisting on the performance, to the very letter, of every article in the queen's marriage contract, respecting the establishment of her Roman Catholic chapel. Afterwards, it was stated that this dismissal took place, because he had ordered her majesty a very extraordinary penance of walking barefoot to the gallows at Tyburn to pray for the souls of the persons executed for participation in the gunpowder plot. St. James's Day, 1625, is the precise time pointed out for this strange exploit. The queen had then been only one month in England, of which time we can trace scarcely a day of her residence in London. Assuredly, the visits of the court to the metropolis must have been few and hurried in July 1625. The statement was, nevertheless, formally made by the Privy Council, and most circumstantially denied on the part of the Queen, as will be seen subsequently. The infected state of the metropolis deprived it of the presence of the court, and all the public rejoicings, concomitant to the new reign and royal marriage, were postponed till the summer heats had abated. The king and his bride remained principally at Hampton Court and Windsor till the winter, when they were established at Whitehall, and the queen began to hold her courts. The sweetness and urbanity with which the queen had at first captivated the hearts of her new subjects, ever and anon gave way before sallies of haughty and stormy fits of temper. Perhaps the earliest of these indications took place the first time she kept court at Whitehall, and was perceived by a bystander, Mr. Mordaunt, who wrote the following description of her majesty. The queen, howsoever little in stature, is of most charming countenance when pleased, but full of spirit, and seems to be of more than ordinary resolution. With one frown, divers of us, being at Whitehall to see her, she drove us all out of the chamber, the room being somewhat overheated with fire and company. I suppose none but a queen could have cast such a scowl. Our queen, wrote Sir Tobias Matthew to the Duchess of Buckingham from Whitehall. Arrived here yesterday, and I was glad at the heart to see her such as she hath seemed. She is more grown than I thought, being higher by half a head than my Lady Marquess. Whatsoever they say, believe me, she sits already on the skirts of womanhood. Madam, upon my faith, she is a most sweet, lovely creature, and hath a countenance that opens a window into the heart, where man may see all nobleness and goodness, and I dare venture my head on the little skill I have in physiognomy, that she will be extraordinarily beloved in this kingdom. Another contemporary has left a graphic portrait of the young queen at this time. We have now a most noble new queen of England, who in true beauty is much beyond the long wooed infanta. The Spanish princess had fading flaxen hair, was big-hipped, and somewhat heavy-eyed, but this daughter of France, this youngest flower of the Bourbon, being but in her cradle when her sire, the great Henry, was put out of the world, is of a more lovely and lasting complexion, of a clear brown, with eyes that sparkle like stars. The pens of all writers were eloquent in praise of the brunette beauty of the queen, even before the pencil of Van Dyck had made it indisputable. 
She is black-eyed and brown-haired, declares another writer. In truth, a brave lady. A more finished and intellectual description of the queen has been preserved by her countrywoman, the accomplished Lafayette. At the epoch of her marriage, she had only attained middle height, but she was extremely well proportioned. Her complexion was perfectly beautiful, her face was long, her eyes large and black, now touchingly soft, now brilliant and sparkling, her hair black, her teeth fine, her forehead, nose and mouth, all somewhat large, but well formed, her air spirituelle, with an extreme delicacy of features, and an expression grand and noble throughout her whole person. Of all the princesses of her family, she most resembles her great father. Like him, she has true greatness of mind, full of tenderness and charity, of a sweet and agreeable temper, entering into the griefs of others, and willing to alleviate all the sorrow in the world. Charles I loved her with passion, and well she reciprocated this tenderness, as he found in the hour of peril and misfortune. This picture is, perhaps, sketched with too partial a hand. The writer evidently loved the original, yet the power of inspiring gratuitous love, which endures through changing fortune, is one proof that the fine traits here drawn were not altogether fictitious. However, if we are guided entirely by the conclusions drawn from facts, the young queen must be considered at this time as a lovely and vivacious child, somewhat spoiled by her mother and her flattering female court. End of section two. Section three of The Lives of the Queens of England, volume eight, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Henrietta Maria, Chapter 1, Part 3 The king's first admiration of his wife, in the course of a few months, assumed the feelings of deep and intense passion, full of disquietudes. He soon felt jealous of the influence of her French attendants over her. In all regal marriages, in whatever country they may take place, the native attendants of the bride are invariably dismissed in a few days, for they are always objects of suspicion either to the king or to his people. Assuredly, the marriage article stipulated for the retention of a greater number of native followers than had ever been previously permitted to remain in the household of a queen of England. The king knew it was against his agreement to remove the large colony the queen had brought with her, but he was not for that the less anxious to get rid of them, nor could his people hate them more intensely than he did. Among other grievances was the toleration of the mass at Whitehall, where the queen claimed the right of her chapel or oratory for the celebration of the rites of her religion. This was granted with reluctance, and instead of a chapel according to the marriage articles, the most retired chamber in the palace was assigned for the purpose. The first mass that was celebrated in England since the winter of Queen Elizabeth's accession is thus described in the words of an angry newsletter. The queen, at eleven o'clock, came out of her chamber in a petticoat and with a veil over her head, supported by the Count de Tellier, her chamberlain, followed by six of her women, and the mass was mumbled over her. Whilst they were at mass, the king gave orders that no Englishman or woman should come near the place. The priests have been very importunate to have the chapel finished at St. James's, but they find the king slow in doing that. His answer was, that if the queen's closet, where they now say mass, was not large enough, let them have it in the great chamber, and if the great chamber be not wide enough, they may use the garden, and if the garden were not spacious enough to serve their turn, then was the park the fittest place. With all their stratagems, they cannot bring him to be the least in love with their fopperies. They say there came some English papists to hear the Queen's Mass on Sunday, but that she rebuked them and caused them to be driven out. The Queen of Charles I is known to all readers of history by the name of Henrietta Maria, but she was not called so by her husband or at her own court. The king chose to call her Mary, and when those in his household remonstrated with him that this name, owing to the Marian persecutions, had become very unpopular to English ears, he still persisted in calling his bride Mary, declaring that the land should find blessings connected with her name, which would counteract all previous evils. Most persons will agree with Charles in his tasteful appreciation of the name of Mary, 
but his feelings as lover and poet ought to have yielded to the good policy of the above suggestion for popular prejudice is governed by a mere breath and the slightest association of ideas will raise the fury of the multitude yes history will prove shakespeare's aphorism that there is magic in a name especially for the working of evil the political agitators who give nicknames are guided by this aphorism how many martyrs have not fallen victims to the ridiculous or ill-sounding epithets of Lollard, Papist, or Quaker. The influence of the French household over the mind of the queen became daily more intolerable to Charles, for she lived among them, and thought and spoke according to their direction. He considered that they interfered between her heart and his, and that she never would become attached to him while they remained in England. Those feelings influenced his determination of dismissing the French household, which he had taken very early after his marriage, he notified this intention to the Duke of Buckingham, who was then at Paris as ambassador extraordinary, requiring him to break this matter to the Queen Mother, Marie de Medicis. King Charles to the Duke of Buckingham, Private, November 20th, 1625. Steeny, I write to you, by Ned Clark, that I thought I should have cause enough, in a short time, to put away the messieurs, either by their attempting to steal away my wife, or by making plots with my own subjects. For the first I cannot say certainly whether it was intended, but I am sure it is hindered. For the other, though I have good grounds to believe it, and am still hunting after it, yet seeing daily the maliciousness of the messieurs, by making and fomenting discontents in my wife, I could tarry no longer from advertising you that I mean to seek for no other grounds to cashier my messieurs, that you may, if you think good, advertise the queen mother, that is Marie de Medicis, of my intention. For this being an action which may have a show of harshness, I thought it was fit to take this way, that she, the queen mother, to whom I have had many obligations, may not take it unkindly. And likewise, I think I have done you no wrong in my letter, though in some place of it I may seem to chide you. I pray you, send me word, with what speed you may, whether ye like this course or not, for I shall put nothing of this in execution, while, or till, I hear from you. In the meantime, I shall think of the convenient means to do this business, with the best mean, but I am resolved it must be done, and that shortly. So longing to see thee, I rest, your loving faithful constant friend, Charles R. Hampton Court. This letter was accompanied with one meant to be shown to the mother of the young queen, commencing like the former with, Steeny, but written in a very sensible and reasonable style, which is not exactly the case with the first. For the idea that his wife would be stolen from him is more like a boy, jealous of the possession of a new plaything, than a king of the personal dignity of Charles. However, he was a young husband, passionately in love with his own wife, and he must be allowed his share in the excuses made for the irrationality of lovers in general. Buckingham assuredly communicated to the Queen Mother of France the King's last letter, and by that means broke to her the intention of dismissing the French household, since Henrietta afterwards gave him all the credit of that measure, and hated him as if he had been the author of it. Yet Charles found no excuse for cashiering his messieurs, as he calls them, till full six months after. Another letter to Steeny occurs soon after the foregoing, in which the king makes the following rather ungracious comment on the queen's conduct. As for news, my wife begins to mend her manners. I know not how long it will continue. They say she does so by advice. He was meantime seriously annoyed by the proceedings of Madame St. George, who, by virtue of her office as first lady of the bedchamber, insisted on a place in the queen's coach, even when the king was there. One day his majesty put her back with his own hand, as she was following the queen into the royal carriage. Likewise he prevented her from taking precedence of the English ladies of his queen's household, and this produced strife between the queen and himself, and sometimes between her and Madame St. George. It was, we may suppose, after one of these wrangles, that Henrietta Maria wrote the following familiar note to her friend. The Queen to Madame St. George. No date of any kind. Mom and Gott, 
I pray you, excuse me if you have seen my little vertigo, which held me this morning. I cannot be right all of a sudden, but I will do all I can to content you meanwhile. I beg you will no longer be in wrath against me, who am and will be all my life, Mom and Gott, your affectionate friend, Henriette. The most serious cause of displeasure that Charles I had against the French domestics of his young wife was that they infused or strengthened her refusal to share his coronation. This piece of bigotry was at once most injurious to the king, and of mischievous consequences to the queen herself, since it gave occasion for her enemies afterwards to affirm that she had never been recognized as the consort of Charles I. So dangerous is it to neglect or scorn the ancient institutions of a country, while they continue to be reverenced by the great body of the people. Charles I was crowned in Westminster Abbey, Solus, for no representations of his, nor the temptation of being admired of all beholders, and the belle de belles in so splendid a scene, could induce his young and lovely partner to share in it. She refused to conquer her religious prejudices sufficiently, to be consecrated by the prelates of the Church of England. Henrietta presents the first instance of a Queen of England, who refused to be crowned. This foolish obstinacy gave the death blow to her popularity in England, for her people never forgave the contempt she had manifested for their crown. She stood at the bay window over the portal of the gatehouse at Whitehall, where she had the view of the procession going and coming, and it was observed that her French ladies were all the time dancing and frisking in the room before her. The Queen's absence from the coronation caused likewise the absence of the Count de Blainville, the French ambassador. He declared that he would have risked a small strain to his conscience, which forbade him to be present at the prayers of the English church, but it would be incongruous that he should be a spectator where the queen, his master's sister, not only refused her participation, but even her presence at the solemnity of crowning. Thus, in consequence of Henrietta's perverse bigotry, an affront both personal and national was offered to her husband by the representative of her brother, who ought to have been wiser than to have followed the lead of a spoiled, willful child. King Charles had endeavored to persuade his queen to be present in the abbey during his coronation, were it only in a lattice box, but she positively refused even that small concession. The coronation of Charles took place on February 2nd, being Candlemas Day, a high festival of the Roman Catholic Church, and it was kept as such by Henrietta and her French household, and this circumstance, doubtless, strengthened her aversion to be present at a ceremony with which the liturgy of the English church was connected. Had she attended her husband's coronation and listened to the oath imposed on him, she would have found that this ceremonial, which she loathed as Huguenot, obligated him to keep the Church of England in the same state as Edward the Confessor. The most liberal manner of construing this oath must have been that the English people required that whatsoever monarch they invested with the power of king and head of the church should use that power to keep the Church of England as near to the model of the Anglo-Saxon church as possible. The marriage of Charles with a Catholic queen naturally aggravated his difficulties, nor was Henrietta of an age and temper likely to afford him aid in steering dexterously between the adverse currents which beset his course. The Parliament believed the king spared twenty priests condemned to death through his wife's influence. Henrietta was assuredly unable to influence him in much smaller matters, and if the most thorough annoyance and vexation could have led a good man to have immolated every priest in England, in hopes of including his wife's domestic establishment of chaplains among them, Charles was angry enough at this crisis to have done so. Henrietta was so far from meeting with any extraordinary indulgence from her husband at this juncture that his mind was wholly bent upon a step which he knew would overwhelm her with grief. He resolved to break that part of her marriage articles, which stipulated that her household and ecclesiastic establishment should be composed of people of her own country. The commencement of this contest is detailed by Charles himself in a letter to his brother-in-law, Louis the Thirteenth, in justification of his proceedings. Henrietta had determined to grant the principal places of profit connected with her revenue lands to the Frenchmen attached to her household, a proceeding which her husband very properly opposed in the following dialogue, which took place after the royal pair had retired to rest. 
One night, wrote King Charles, after I was abed, my wife put a paper in my hand, telling me it was a list of those that she desired to be officers of her revenue. I took it and said that I would read it next morning. But withal, I told her that by agreement in France, I had the naming of them. She said there were both English and French in the note. I replied that those English which I thought fit to serve her, I would confirm, but for the French, it was impossible for them to serve her in that capacity. She said, all those in that paper had breviates from her mother and herself, that she would admit no other. Then I said, it was neither in her mother's power nor hers to admit any without my leave, and if she relied on that, whomsoever she recommended should not come in. Then she plainly bade me, take my lands to myself, for if she had no power to put in whom she would, into those places, she would have neither lands nor houses of me, but bade me, give her what I thought fit by way of pension. I bade her, remember to whom she spoke, and told her she ought not to use me so. Then she fell into a passionate discourse, how she is miserable, in having no power to place servants, and that business succeeded the worse for her recommendation. When I offered to answer, she would not so much as hear me, but went on lamenting, saying, that she was not of such base quality as to be used so. But, continues Charles, I both made her hear me and end that discourse. A stormy scene at court occurred soon after this royal curtain lecture. The Bishop of Monte, a young ecclesiastic at the head of Henrietta's Catholic establishment, actually contested publicly with the Earl of Holland, late Lord Kensington, which of them was to act as steward of her dowry. The bishop showed the queen's warrant, and the earl that of the king. Marie de Medicis, with her usual want of judgment, has appointed as her daughter's almoner, a youth of twenty years, who had been advanced to a bishopric on account of his family connection with Richelieu. It is certain that all the suavity and experience in human nature, ever possessed by the wisest bishop of the ancient church, were required to guide an ecclesiastic in the difficult position in which the head of the queen's band of unwillingly tolerated priests must have found himself. Lord Holland is the same person as Lord Kensington, who negotiated the queen's marriage. There is no very great manifestation of her partiality to him, although her name has been linked with his in the malicious histories of the times. The origin of these reports seems to have been the praises he bestowed on her in his letters to the court at the time of her marriage, but after she was queen, this nobleman showed all the indications of a disappointed courtier. The king's discontent at the conduct of the French colony established within his gates reached its climax in June 1626, before he had been married a twelve-month. As his wrath ever vest on a very small provocation or none at all. It is natural to suppose that the quarrel was rather a forced one on his part. Monday last, about three in the afternoon, the king passing into the queen's side, that is the queen's suite of apartments at Whitehall, and finding some Frenchmen, her servants, unreverently curvetting and dancing in her presence, took her by the hand and led her into his lodgings or apartments, locking the door after him and shutting out all save the queen, Presently Lord Conway signified to Her Majesty's French servants that young and old, they must all depart thence to Somerset House and remain there till they knew His Majesty's pleasure. The women howled and lamented as if they were going to execution, but all in vain. For the guard, according to Lord Conway's orders, thrust them all out of the Queen's apartments and locked the doors after them. While this scene was transacting in her own apartments, the queen, who was detained by the king in his chamber, became very angry, and when she understood that her French train were being expelled from Whitehall, she flew into an access of rage. She endeavored to bid them a passionate farewell from the window, whence the king drew her away, telling her, to be satisfied, for it must be so. However, the queen continued to break the windows with her fist, as she was prevented from opening them. Charles was obligated to use all his masculine strength to control his incensed partner by grasping her wrists in each hand. But since, adds the newsletter, I hear her rage is appeased, and that the king and she went to none such, and have been very jocund together. The French servants of Henrietta were kept at Somerset House, while the king detained their royal mistress at his country palaces, 
a few days after he had separated them from the queen he came in person to somerset house attended by buckingham holland and carlisle and addressed the french household in a set speech informing them of the necessity of dismissing them to their own country the young bishop requested to know his fault and madame de st george passionately appealed to the queen i name none replied charles and then peremptorily ordering their return to france and promising that they should receive their wages with gratuities to the amount of twenty two thousand pounds he withdrew with his attendants the french retinue by various pretenses delayed their departure from day to day throughout the whole of the month of july they retained possession of the queen's clothes and jewels as perquisites and actually left her without a change of linen and with difficulty were prevailed on to surrender an old satin gown for her immediate use they brought her in immensely in debt to them for purchases which she notwithstanding her partiality in their favour allowed to the king were wholly fictitious at last charles exasperated by their struggles to remain in england wrote to buckingham the following letter to expedite their expulsion steenie i have received your letter by dick grime this is my answer i command you to send all the french away to-morrow out of the town if you can by fair means but stick not long in disputing otherwise force them away driving them away like so many wild beasts until you have shipped them and so the devil go with them let me hear of no answer but of the performance of my command so i rest your faithful constant loving friend c r oaking on the seventh of august sixteen twenty six although a numerous collection of coaches carts and barges were waiting the next day at somerset house the french retinue unanimously resolved not to depart saying they had not been discharged with the proper punctilios on which the king sent a large posse of heralds trumpeters and a strong body of yeomen the heralds and trumpeters having formally proclaimed his majesty's pleasure at the gates of somerset house the yeomen then stepped forward to execute his majesty's orders which were no other than that if the french still continued refractory to thrust them out head and shoulders this extremity was not resorted to for the french departed the same tide a great mob had been gathered in the strand by these proceedings and withal most riotously disposed as the beautiful madame de st george was departing gesticulating with the utmost vivacity and pouring forth a torrent of eloquence on the atrocity of tearing her from her queen one of the leaders of the mob threw a large stone at her head which knocked off her cap an english noble of the court who was leading the aggrieved fair one to the barge drew his sword and ran the man through the body on the spot certainly a person who could assault a woman thus murderously deserved little sympathy but surely the people of all classes in the last century but one had little reason to consider themselves as civilized beings the only french attendants left with the queen were her nurse her dresser and madame de la tremouille the king sent his orders to the housekeeper at st james's to prepare suitable apartments for the residence of the latter lady the official returned answer that her majesty's french retinue has so defiled that palace that it would be long before it could be purified the metropolis was in an infected state with the plague and the royal family made a progress that autumn in search of salubrious springs perhaps in imitation of the fashion of the continent where it had become the custom to frequent watering places and spas the king and queen came to wellingborough this year for the benefit of drinking at the red well there and actually resided some days in tents that they might drink the waters at the fountain head the whole summer the young queen was restless and unhappy she attributed her troubles perhaps unjustly to the malign influence of buckingham she wrote perpetually home stating how wretched she was deprived of her french household and talked of visiting her native country the resident ambassadors tillerier and blainville who appear to have been the most formal fools ever sent on missions of delicate diplomacy fomented her griefs at last the queen mother of france appointed a man of sense and spirit to mediate this matrimonial difference the duc de bassam pierre one of the old friends and fellow soldiers of henry the fourth was sent to england to inquire into the wrongs of henrietta and hear from her own lips a recapitulation of her injuries which her banished household had represented to her mother as most flagrant 
one outrage was offered to king charles which was no doubt to be attributed to the incorrigible folly of marie de medicis father sansi whose fanaticism had caused him to be dismissed from henrietta's train on her first arrival in england was now thrust back to this country as the chaplain to the embassy as if no one could be found to perform such an office but a person who had made himself personally odious to charles and his people before bassompierre entered into any other discussion there was a lengthy controversy regarding this obnoxious person charles insisted that he should be sent out of his dominions before he would discuss any point with the french ambassador nevertheless sansi remained and did his best to embroil the king and queen irreconcilably bassompierre was certainly the most sensible and honorable person that france had sent to england since the embassy of the great duke de sully his notation of his interviews with the young queen proved that he neither flattered nor spoiled her he found her at open hostility with her husband's favorite and prime minister buckingham of whom she made the most bitter complaints they had quarrelled violently and perhaps their enmity was aggravated by the fact that the queen knew no english and buckingham very little french no doubt their angry dialogues were amusing enough buckingham nevertheless made the queen understand a speech which she never forgave she quoted it long years after his death in confidence to madame de montville he insolently told her to beware how she behaved for in england queens had their heads cut off before now henrietta averred that buckingham jealous lest she should possess influence with the king made mischief perpetually between them and was the cause of all the unhappiness of the early days of her married life bassompierre found this feud between the young queen and the favorite of charles i at its very height although four months had passed since her separation from her french retinue the mind of the queen was in so great a state of excitement regarding it that charles i just before he gave the audience of reception to bassompierre at hampton court sent buckingham to him to direct that nothing relative to this subject might be mentioned or alluded to at the public interview for i cannot said king charles help putting myself in a passion when discussing these matters which would not be decent in the chair of state in sight of the chief persons of the realm likewise the queen my wife seated close to me grieved at the remembrance of the dismissal of her servants might commit some extravagance and would at least cry in the sight of every one bassompierre when he found this representation was no diplomatic ruse of buckingham concerted with him a plan to defer the discussions of the grievance till he had a private audience with the queen in london the duke of buckingham pursues bassompierre then introduced me to the audience i found the king and queen seated on two chairs raised on a stage of two steps they rose at the first bow i made the company was magnificent and the order exquisite after answering inquiries regarding the health of the queen's brother and mother bassompierre as had been concerted previously was told by the king that her majesty was impatient to inquire after them more particularly and to receive their remembrances and greetings in a private interview with him therefore in consideration of her feelings he would delay the communication of his state mission till after that conference had taken place the queen then added a few words saying that the king had given her leave to go to london where she would see him and speak to him at leisure but these words overcame her spirits she rose and was obliged to retire with madame de la tremouille or the tears which filled her eyes would have been seen to overflow her cheeks subsequently the queen the king and buckingham discussed their grievances severally in long private interviews with bassompierre a quotation or two from his journal gives a pretty clear view as to which side found most favor in his eyes october twenty fourth i was with the queen when the king came in with whom she picked a quarrel the king took me to his chamber and talked a great deal to me making me complaints of the queen his wife the next day sunday was the time on which bassompierre resolved to bring about the reconciliation he had prepared between the king and queen and the queen and buckingham then i went for the duke whom i took to the queen who made his peace with her which i had brought about with infinite trouble the king came in afterwards and he also was reconciled to her on account it may be supposed of the quarrel the fair tyrant had picked with his majesty the day before then resumes the ambassador 
The king caressed her very much. He thanked me, as he said, for reconciling the duke and his wife, then took me to his chamber and showed me his jewels, which are very fine. Her majesty, nevertheless, considered that her father's old friend had not evinced sufficient partiality to her cause, for the very next day, after dinner, he went to see the queen at Somerset House, and she fell out with him. The reconciliation which poor Bassompierre had effected, with such waste of time and eloquence, and so many journeys between Whitehall, Somerset House, and Hampton Court, was all null and void in a fortnight, and the parties were more angry with each other than ever. The cause of wrath was, that the king found that the temper of the times would not permit him to fulfill his engagement of granting his wife the indulgence of her domestic worship, so openly as the marriage contract specified. He had left her three chaplains when he expelled her French ecclesiastics, and he was reluctant to permit more. At sixteen, Henrietta was no judge of the state of her husband's affairs. It is not an age when the faculties which produce foresight are much developed in any class of human beings. Those who placed a petulant child in a situation that required all the calm temper and clear judgment of which a woman of twenty-five is capable, were responsible for the whole of the mistakes she committed as queen. Unfortunately, the effects of her childish errors in judgment weighed heavily against her in after life. Yet there was no moral wrong in the conduct of the young queen. Her errors merely proceeded from a fervent attachment to her religion, manifested without wise calculation on the prejudices of her new country. Alas, in political history, crimes committed with tact are often viewed with complacency, but small mercy is shown to blunders, even if they may be traced to virtuous affections. It may be noticed, too, that false chronology has occasioned a very great deal of calumny on Henrietta. For instance, the crime more particularly charged against her was the fanatic penance she is said to have performed at Tyburn. This, if ever done, was limited within the first few weeks after her arrival. If it were, as she averred, a fabrication, it must have originated with her husband's most intimate friends and trusted counsellors, perhaps with Buckingham himself, for a most notable quarrel broke out between the queen and him, while this matter was discussed in council before Bissampierre. This nobleman acted throughout with impartiality, unawed by the title of queen, born by the petulant little beauty, who was the youngest child of his old friend, Henry the Fourth. He sharply reproved her for picking quarrels with her husband, and threatened to tell her friends in France of her perversity. With the same spirit of independence, he pointed out to his own government their errors in judgment in his letters to her ball, the French minister. You know, wrote he, the extraordinary manner in which the domestics of the Queen of Great Britain were sent back to France. It was said that she lived very ill with her husband, and that there seemed no way but open war to enforce the terms of the marriage treaty. At first I proved what I had expected, that the company of Father Sansi would do little good, and a very great deal of harm to my design. You have seen how much I have suffered, and been impeded on this head. You know the principal objects which my king had in sending me hither, were to render the queen his sister, content, the state of her conscience easy, her personal attendance agreeable to her, her health and convenience, and the union and intelligence between her majesty and her royal husband, perfectly cemented, likewise to obtain better treatment for the English Catholic priests. End of section 3 Section 4 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 8, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Henrietta Maria, Chapter 1, Part 4. In the course of this negotiation, Bassompierre was, in a cabinet council, given a memorial of the causes of complaint that King Charles had to bring against the Queen's French domestics, against the Bishop of Monte, Henrietta's almoner, who was a duplice, a near relative of the wily and inimical Richelieu, then rising into power, was brought in this document an accusation of fomenting plots in England. Moreover, the Queen's French domestics discovered all that passed between the King and Her Majesty, and labored to create in the gentle mind of Her Majesty a repugnance to all that the King desired or ordered, and they fomented discords between their Majesties, 
as a thing essential to the welfare of their church they endeavored to inspire her with a contempt for england a dislike of its habits and made her neglect the english language as if she neither had nor wished to have any common interest in that country they subjected the person of a queen to a monastic obedience in order to oblige her to do many base and servile acts beneath the majesty of a queen and very dangerous to her own health witness what has befallen a person of distinction among her attendants who died thereof and complained at her death that that was the cause of it that is the queen's french lady died of the severities of the penances inflicted on herself not on her royal mistress the narrative is not very luminous on this point as to the penances imposed on the young queen they are reported in a letter of court news with which we must interpolate the grave state paper which says the same but in duller language and if we may credit the affirmation of bassompierre and the queen herself one narrative is as inventive as the other no longer agone than on st james's day these hypocritical dogs made the poor queen walk afoot from her house to st james's that is the palace to the gallows at tyburn thereby to honor the saint of the day in visiting that holy place where forsooth so many martyrs had shed their blood in defense of the catholic cause had they not also made her dabble in the dirt in a foul morning from somerset house to st james's her luciferian confessor riding by her in his coach yea they had made her spin to eat her meat out of treen dishes to wait at table and serve her servants and if these rogues dared thus insult over the daughter sister and wife of great kings what slavery would they not make us the people undergo bassompierre spent the beginning of november in conferences respecting the above statements between the queen the king and buckingham and in each conference they had a separate quarrel he inquired of the queen how he was to answer the various particulars which had been offensive to the king as to the wooden trenchers and other trifling matters she either disdained to reply to them or admitted them by silence but in regard to the pilgrimage to the gallows at tyburn she most earnestly denied it bassompierre made so animated a harangue before the privy council when he defended henrietta from having committed this absurdity that he lost his voice for several days a very serious loss for this vivacious foreigner who however in his journal expresses himself dubiously as to whether his affliction was owing to his exertions in behalf of the queen or to a london fog in november to which poor man he was not accustomed in his speech he declared that the queen had instructed him to say that the king her husband had permitted her to gain her jubilee in the chapel of the fathers of the oratory at st james that is st james within a month of her arrival in england which devotion had terminated with vespers and as that time the heat of the day was past she had walked in the park of st james's and in the hip park which joins it a walk she had often taken in company with the king her husband but that she made it in procession or that she ever approached within fifty paces of the gallows or that she made there any prayers public or private or that she went on her knees there holding the hours or chaplets in her hands is what those who impose these matters on others do not believe themselves this oration lasted an hour and when i came out says bassompierre in his journal i showed the queen the fine statement they had made to me and what i had replied and protested with which she was much obliged it is proper here to observe that out of the numerous witnesses who must have beheld henrietta performing such extraordinary genuflections at the gallows tree not one was examined before the privy council therefore the statement is utterly without evidence indeed every person who reads this well-known accusation against the queen of charles must have wondered how her majesty could have arrived on a summer's evening at the gallows barefoot without being followed in such a public place by a vast mob of gazers but it seems the gibbet with all its foul and ghastly garniture was a perennial ornament abutting on hyde park and there it stood near where the fashionable throng now turned into the ring at cumberland gate a horrid terminus to the vista assuredly always within the view of their britannic majesties when they chose to enjoy the cool of the evening by taking their accustomed walk from st james's park to hyde park the national gibbet fed as it was from the era of henry the eighth with almost daily food 
was marvelously convenient for Henriette's pilgrimage, had she ever taken it, but she indignantly repelled the idea. She acknowledged she had often walked that way with her husband, but denied that she ever approached the gibbet nearer than fifty paces. What times, what manners, what an admission! To us it appears still more abhorrent that a fair royal bride in her honeymoon, leaning on the arm of her loving lord, should take a summer stroll for pleasure within fifty paces of a gibbet, than that she should approach it in sorrow and humiliation, to meditate on the agony, sin, and grief that had throbbed at the hearts of the miserable fellow creatures who had perished on the horrid spot. The circumstance that such an appendage abutted to the royal parks, more than ever, marks the brutality of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries, which had receded in common decency from the era of the early Plantagenets. Probably the young queen, when she first beheld the grim object so near her courtly promenade, crossed herself in a fright, and repeated some Latin prayer or abjuration, and from thence the whole story grew. Perhaps she did so whenever she saw it. Who can wonder? This circumstance occasioned the removal of the gibbet, with general approbation, to the vicinity of Paddington. The gallant Bassompierre remained for some time an unwilling mute, having, by his own account, lost his voice in Her Majesty's vindication. But the vindication only set the belligerent parties quarreling again, with greater vivacity than ever. The painstaking ambassador had to commence anew his series of separate visits, and his course of suitable exhortations, to the Queen, the King, and Buckingham. I came, continues Bassompierre, in the morning to Somerset House, to meet the Queen, who had arrived there to see the Lord Mayor go on the Thames, on his way to Westminster, to be sworn in, with a magnificent display of boats. There the Queen dined, and afterwards got into her coach, and placed me at the same door with her. The royal coaches were huge fabrics, gaudily ornamented. They had no glass yet, but were sheltered with leather curtains. They were capable of holding eight inside passengers, two of whom were perched in niches, called boots, at each door, places usually reserved for some favored guest or friend of the king or queen. The Duke of Buckingham, by the queen's commands, likewise got into her coach, observes Bassompierre and we went into the street called Shipside, or Cheapside, to see the ceremony, which is the greatest made for the reception of any officer in the world. While waiting for the Lord Mayor to pass, the Queen played at Primero with the Duke, the Earl of Dorset, and me. Afterwards, the Duke of Buckingham took me to dine with the Lord Mayor, and after the Lord Mayor's dinner, I went to walk in Moorfields. The early hour of the Lord Mayor's dinner may be judged by Bassompierre, finishing this festival day, November 9th, with an evening walk in Moorfields, then a sort of garden or park of recreation for the citizens. In the course of a few days, Bassompierre considered that he had arranged all the disputed points, and made a fair agreement for the future comfort of the Queen, the particulars of which he details thus in his letter to the French government, addressed to Monsieur de Herbault. You will now find, Monsieur, that the satisfaction is complete, and that the queen, his majesty's sister, rests infinitely obliged with what I have done for her, and deeming herself content and happy, she lives now with the king in perfect amity. First, she has re-established, and this is for her conscience, a bishop and ten priests, a confessor and his coadjutor, and ten musicians for her chapel. That at St. James's is to be finished with its cemetery, and another is to be built for her at Somerset House, at the expense of the king, her husband. In attendance on her person, she will have, of her own nation, two ladies of the bedchamber, three bedchamber women, one lingerie, and a clear starcher. In regard to her health, two physicians, an apothecary, and a surgeon. For her house, a grand chamberlain, a squire, a secretary, a gentleman usher of the privy chamber, one of the chamber of presence, a valet of the privy chamber, a baxter groom, that is, a baker. All the officers of the mouth and the goblet are to be French. Here were foreign domestics, sufficiently numerous to cause Henrietta to be the most unpopular queen consort that ever shared an English throne in the best of times. 
The establishment was, however, scanty, in comparison with the army of impracticable people located at the English court on the strength of the first treaty, when they amounted to more than four hundred. The queen was not really in quite so complacent a state of mind as her father's old friend hoped. A more stormy scene took place than had yet occurred. But Saint Pierre, out of all patience at seeing Henrietta continue to play the vixen, after all her grievances had been redressed, told her his mind without caring for her rank. In his brief journal he notes, November 12th, came to the queen's, where the king came, who fell out with one another, and I afterwards with the queen on this account. I told her plainly that I should next day take leave of King Charles and return to France, leaving the business unfinished, and should tell his majesty, that is Louis the Thirteenth, her brother, and the queen her mother, that it was all her fault. This was the best way of settling Henrietta's mind and affairs. She had been told by her flattering retinue that all her little tyrannies and lovers' quarrels with Charles were entirely becoming to a queen, and what, as Napoleon truly said, was far better a pretty woman. But the few plain words of her father's comrade informed her that she behaved unlike a wife, and that he should so report her to her own family. And this honest dealing secured the lovely queen nearly eighteen years of conjugal happiness, with undisputed possession of a true heart that adored her, till it ceased to beat, a rich reward for listening to a few words of truth from a real friend. The acute mind of Bassompierre had fathomed the real cause of Henrietta's perverse conduct. He has left an observation, showing the imprudence of her confidences. When I had returned home, Father Sansi, to whom the queen had written about our falling out, came to make it up with me that is, to bring an apology for the queen's conduct, but with such impertinences that I got very angry with him. But whether the impertinences originated with the queen or her messenger, the Saint Pierre disposeth not. Henrietta had, however, a most imprudent habit of giving confidence without due consideration. She herself told Madame de Montville, that her hastiness to tell her mind to all about her had been of infinite injury to herself and to the political affairs of her husband. But Saint-Pierre returned to France, carrying with him this father Sancy, who certainly always kept the queen's mind in a most mischievous state of agitation while he was near her. One would have thought that Saint-Pierre's exertions would have been repaid, with the utmost approbation, by his own country. Far from it, he had behaved too honestly, and told every one the truth too plainly, and had avoided extremes in his mediatorial capacity too decidedly, to give satisfaction to his weak and bigoted master. The learned and dignified king of England could admire the calm majesty of this ambassador's reply, when he asked him, in the course of the recent dispute, whether he had come to declare war on him. I am not a herald to declare war, was the noble retort of Bassompierre, but a marshal of France, to make it when declared. Even the spoiled royal beauty, Henrietta, listened to the blunt reproofs of her old friend, and was grateful when her anger was over. But the foolish queen mother of France and her weak son were enraged because every article of the original marriage treaty was not carried into effect. Bassompierre was frowned upon at his own court. Louis the Thirteenth animated with the desire of nullifying the wise toleration his great father had given to the French Protestants, pressed on the siege of Rochelle, and the war between England and France was the result. It is very doubtful whether the modified arrangement of Henrietta's French household was carried into effect till after the peace with France, since it is certain that the ten Capuchin friars were not appointed to her chapel till the year 1630. Charlotte de la Tremouille, Lady Strange, who, having married the heir of Derby, had become naturalized as an English subject, indubitably filled the place of one of the two ladies of the bedchamber mentioned in the French list. The relationship of this lady to the heroic deliverer of Holland, William, Prince of Orange, rendered her less offensive to the English people than any other foreign attendant of the queen. Her mother, the Duchess de la Tremouille, had returned to France a few days before the ambassador departed. A war with France soon after broke out, notwithstanding which, the queen enjoyed more tranquility than when her French household was about her. 
the king wrote on occasion of the capture of the isle of ray to buckingham who commanded on that expedition the following remarkable postscript at the end of a familiar letter i cannot omit to tell you that my wife and i were never on better terms she upon this action of yours showing herself so loving to me by her discretion on all occasions that it makes us all wonder at and esteem her meantime great enmity against king charles prevailed in france originating in the dismissal of henrietta's french retinue and the most sinister reports were circulated among the populace which was fostered by the servants of the cashiered officials all classes of the french people thought that their beautiful young princess was the victim and martyr of the heretic king this state of the public mind caused belief to be given to a very strange impostor a girl who was without doubt a monomaniac took into her head that she was the persecuted queen of england and while louis the thirteenth was carrying on the siege of rochelle presented herself at a convent at limoges and claimed the hospitality of the nuns as such she declared that she had fled from king charles and from england because she was persecuted on account of the true faith she spoke and carried herself with remarkable dignity when she was questioned she gave a very plausible description of the english court and of the great lords and ladies who composed the household of henrietta maria her statements were correct at least as far as the good people of limoges were aware for the whole of that city and neighborhood flocked to see the distressed queen who were thoroughly persuaded of her identity louis the thirteenth was exceedingly enraged at what he considered the impudence of this imposition being attempted at a time when his sister was in peace and prosperity surrounded by her own court he sent orders to the lieutenant general of limoges to bring the girl to public trial during the whole of this process the representative of queen henrietta abated not a jot of her assumed majesty answered all questions with great presence of mind and cleverness and very coolly signed her legal examination henriette de bourbon she was condemned to make the amende honorable that is to confess her delinquency at the end of a public religious procession with a lighted taper in her hand and to be imprisoned during the pleasure of the king of france what further became of her is not known while this self-constituted double was assuming the character of henrietta in her native land the queen herself was experiencing the sweet hopes of maternity but unfortunately she could not rest contented without endeavouring to read the future destiny both of her unborn infant and herself the prophetess to whom she had recourse on this occasion was no juggling gypsy or sordid witch but a high-born lady of her court one of the most extraordinary characters of her day this was lady eleanor the daughter of the earl of castlehaven and wife to the king's attorney-general sir john davies the study of the original scripture languages and a mystical and fanatical belief of her own devising had turned this noble dame's brain so as to cause her to believe that a prophetic mantle of no little power had descended upon her under its influence she had foretold the death of her first husband to the infinite indignation of charles i how she ever obtained a second a curious autobiography does not explain regarding her inspirations she was more communicative the idea that she was a prophetess arose from finding that the letters of her name twisted into an anagram might be read in this line reveal o daniel her prophetic pride was however somewhat rebuked by one of the king's privy council who having occasion to reprove her for venting some mischievous political predictions by a suitable exordium in the star chamber very wittily attacked her with her own weapons by assuring her that the letters which composed her name she had not rightly construed for the real anagram should read thus dame eleanor davies never so mad a lady such was the prophetess to whom queen henrietta applied to read the destiny which was in mercy withheld from her the odd dialogue that passed between her majesty and the prophetess is best given in lady eleanor's own words about two years after the marriage of king charles i i was waiting on the queen as she came from mass or evening service to know what service she was pleased to require from me her question was whether she should ever have a son i answered in a short time 
the queen was next desirous to know what would be the destiny of the duke of buckingham and the english fleet which had sailed to oppose her brother and relieve the siege of rochelle i answered lady eleanor continues that the duke of buckingham would bring home little honor but his person would return safely and that speedily this reply gave little satisfaction to the duke's enemies who would have been best pleased to have heard of his death the queen then returned to her hopes of a son and i showed that she should have one and that for a long time she should be happy but for how long asked the queen for sixteen years was my reply king charles coming in at that instant our discourse was interrupted by him how now lady eleanor said the king are not you the person who foretold your husband's death three days before it happened to which his majesty thought fit to add that it was the next to breaking his heart and probably most husbands will be of the opinion of charles i although the king had thus successfully cut short the conference with lady eleanor he could not prevent the maids of honor from crowding round that prophetess and assailing her with the questions which their royal mistress had intended to ask lady eleanor informed these ladies it was indeed true that the queen would shortly have a son but it was no less true that it would be born christened and buried all in one day perhaps this vexatious prophecy was made on purpose to plague the king for his interruption and sharp reproof probably the evil prediction of this mad gentlewoman dwelt on the mind of the young queen others say she was hurried and alarmed by some trifling accident she was however taken very ill and rather unexpectedly gave birth to a son may thirteenth sixteen twenty eight a contest took place between charles i and the queen's confessor whether the heir of england should be baptized according to the church of england or the church of rome but the king carried his point and the boy was named charles james by dr webb the chaplain in attendance as the royal babe had been born a little before its time it was in a languid state and died the day of its birth an hour after its baptism and was buried just before midnight by dr laud the king forbade the queen to consult dame eleanor any more on the destiny of their offspring but if we may believe the testimony of the sibyl herself and the reports of the day this prohibition only made her majesty more eager for the forbidden conference when in a short time after she again had hopes of maternity lady eleanor plumed herself very much on the fulfilment of her divination regarding the death of the queen's first-born and forthwith vented such a tirade of impertinent prophecies on politics religion and affairs in general which did not concern her that king charles much annoyed at her proceedings sent mr kirk one of the gentlemen of his bedchamber to complain to her husband and desire him to make her hold her tongue but this was a piece of discretion seemingly beyond her own power neither could her husband ever succeed in controlling that unruly member nevertheless the king's dutiful law officer sir john davies did all he could to impede the promulgation of his lady's prophecies by throwing a large bundle of them in manuscript behind the fire the king's messenger proved a very unfaithful one for after delivering his royal master's message he added a request on his own account to know if the queen's second child would be a son and i says lady eleanor unwilling to send him empty away assured him of a prince and a strong child which he not sparing to impart the news was solemnized with bonfires this last is a piece of perversity almost too ridiculous for belief how thoroughly tormented must the king have been with the absurdity of his messenger who when sent to reprove lady eleanor's conjuring spirit took the opportunity of exciting her to exercise it anew by the request of his queen the sudden death of buckingham by the stroke of a fanatic's dagger august sixteen twenty eight removed one to whose influence the queen attributed all the differences which had occurred between herself and her husband it is certain that the matrimonial happiness of the royal pair improved after the decease of this powerful minister the queen was little more than eighteen her reason had not been cultivated and her tastes were as yet childish among other frivolities she had a great fancy for dwarfs and was a noted patroness of those mannequins one of them proved something like a historical character and about this time stepped out of a cold pie into her majesty's service 
This incident occurred in one of the royal progresses, when Charles and Henrietta were entertained by the Duchess of Buckingham. The queen was induced to partake of a noble venison pasty in the center of the table. When some of the crust was removed, the little man Geoffrey Hudson rose out of the pie and hastened to prostrate himself before her majesty's plate, entreating to be taken into her service. She was greatly diverted with this odd addition to her retinue, especially at the mode of his appearance. He was then but eighteen inches high, a gulliver among the Brodigagians, and almost as accomplished a character. The queen entertained him as her dwarf par excellence, although, according to the taste of her era, she was already provided with a pair of these little monsters, whose marriage was celebrated by the courtly strains of Waller. Master Geoffrey proved a very valiant and sensible modicum of humanity, fit to be employed in state messages of small import. In 1630, for instance, he was dispatched to France by the queen to escort over the channel the French sage femme, her royal mother deemed the best to preside over her approaching accouchement. The homeward voyage was disastrous. A Dunkirk privateer, being no respecter of persons, captured both the sage femme and Master Geoffrey, and plundered them of all the rich presents they were bringing to the queen from her mother, Marie de Medicis, and, what was worse, the sage femme was detained in captivity till her office was no longer needed by the royal patient. Matters of more import at this time gave no little pain to Henrietta. The prospect of the royal line being continued by a Roman Catholic queen excited party rage in a violent degree, and political pamphlets were published full of reviling epithets against her. In these she was termed a daughter of Heath, a Canaanite, and an idolatress, whose hopes of progeny could give no general joy, God having provided much better for England, in the hopeful issue of the Queen of Bohemia. This idea had thus taken possession of the Calvinistic party in England, previously to the birth of Charles the Second. This prince was born on the morning of May 29, 1630, at the Palace of St. James. He was a strong, fine babe, but by no means remarkable for his infantine beauty. The king rode in great state that very morning, to return thanks for the birth of his heir, and the safety of his queen, at St. Paul's Cathedral. During the royal procession, a bright star appeared at noonday, to the great astonishment and admiration of the populace. An accident so poetical was immediately seized by one of the learned gentlemen in the king's retinue. A Latin epigram, with the following elegant translation, was presented to him as a congratulation on the birth of the prince. When to Paul's cross the grateful king drew near, a shining star did in the heavens appear. Thou that consultest with bright mysteries, tell me what this bright wanderer signifies. Now there is born a valiant prince in the west, that shall eclipse the kingdoms of the east. Prince Charles was baptized the Sunday before the 2nd of July, the same year. In the chapel at St. James's, but not the Queen's Chapel, as one of the newsletter informants especially notes, and not without reason, for Henrietta Maria's chapel was a retired apartment in the palace, fitted up as a Roman Catholic place of worship. The ceremony of the royal baptism was the first time performed in this country for an heir to the throne, after the form prescribed in our Book of Common Prayer. Laud, Bishop of London, Dean of the Royal Chapel, officiated, assisted by the Bishop of Norwich, Royal Almoner. The sponsors were the zealous Roman Catholic, Louis the Thirteenth, his bigoted mother, Marie de Medicis, and that Protestant champion, the unfortunate Palgrave, who joined in answering that the heir of Great Britain should be brought up in the tenets of the Church of England, which neither of them professed. The Duke of Lennox, the old ostentatious Duchess of Richmond, and the Marquis of Hamilton were the proxies for these incongruous sponsors. The Duchess's gift on the occasion outwent her usual boastful profusion, for she presented the prince with a jewel worth seven thousand pounds. A wet nurse from Wales was provided for the infant, probably to keep up the old custom and promise to the principality, that the first words of every prince of Wales should be uttered in Welsh. To this nurse, the ostentatious Duchess presented a gold chain worth two hundred pounds to the midwife and dry nurse, a quantity of massy plate, and even the rockers received from her a silver cup, salt, and a dozen spoons. The queen had very politically sent her own state carriage, 
attended by two lords, many knights and gentlemen, preceded by six running footmen, and drawn by six horses, with plumes on their heads and backs, to fetch this bountiful dowager to the christening, from her house in the strand. The old lady paid dear for her ride in the queen's carriage that short distance, for she gave to the knights fifty pounds each, to the coachman twenty pounds, and to each of the footmen ten pounds. The state dresses at this baptism were white satin, trimmed with crimson, and crimson silk stockings. The lady to whom the personal charge of the prince was committed was Mrs. Wyndham, who throughout his life had extraordinary influence over him. The queen possessed, in a high degree, that talent of writing charming little letters, for which French women have always been admired. One of the earliest letters from her pen, which is extant, is replete with the fascination of playful naivete. It is addressed to her old friend, Madame St. George, with whom she constantly corresponded, notwithstanding her unceremonious dismissal by King Charles. This letter proves that Henrietta, despite of the proverb which affirms that even the crows think their own nestlings fair, was not blind to the fact that her boy was a fright. The likeness of some tawny Provencal ancestor of Henri Cotte must have revived in the person of the Prince of Wales, for the elegant Charles I and the beautiful Henrietta had no right to expect so plain a little creature as their firstborn. It is amusing enough to read the Queen's description of the solemn ugliness of her fat baby. No date, but written in the first year of the life of Charles II. Mame St. George, the husband of the nurse of my son, going to France, about some business of his wife, I write you this letter by him, believing that you will be very glad to ask him news of my son, of whom I think you have seen the portrait that I sent to the queen my mother. He is so ugly that I am ashamed of him, but his size and fatness supply the want of beauty. I wish you could see the gentleman, for he has no ordinary mien. He is so serious in all that he does, that I cannot help deeming him far wiser than myself." Send me a dozen pairs of sweet chamois gloves, and also, I beg you, send me one of doeskin, a game of Jean Chéri, one of pool, and the rules of any species of games now in vogue. I assure you that if I do not write to you so often as I might, it is not because I have left off loving you, but because, I must confess it, I am very idle. Also, I am ashamed to avow that I think I am on the increase again. Nevertheless, I am not quite certain." Adieu, the man must have my letter. Henrietta wrote another letter to her friend as follows, some time before November, 1631. Queen Henrietta Maria to Madame St. George. No date, probably just before the birth of the Queen's eldest daughter. Mame St. George. Barbaroux having asked leave to go to France for his particular affairs, I would not let him depart without assuring you of the continuation of my friendship and also to complain a little that I have been so long without hearing news of you. I know well you may retort the same thing, but at this time I am out of London and have no opportunities. Also, I am not a little incommoded with my size, which renders me indolent, but assure yourself that I fail not to remember you on all occasions and that I hope you will always find me your affectionate friend, Henriette Marie R. Make my commendations to my niece. I am having the portraits of my children and of myself done, which I shall send to you very soon. The queen gave birth to her eldest daughter at St. James's Palace, November 4th, 1631. This infant was baptized Mary by Dr. Laud in St. James's Chapel. The queen committed the little princess to the care of Catherine, Lady Stanhope, who served her with the most attached fidelity through life. When Charles could no longer delay his Scottish coronation, the queen was invited to share this northern inauguration, which she as firmly refused as she did the ceremony of the English consecration, and she suffered her husband to depart on his northern progress alone. It is here necessary to mention that the attachment of Charles I to domestic life had caused him to neglect the royal duty of occasional progress towards the distant portions of his dominions. Queen Elizabeth had carried this usage to abuse, yet if we closely trace the causes of her popularity, it will be found that it owed much to her progresses. King Charles probably considered that the difference of the Queen's religion excited unpleasant remarks, 
if she visited the Protestant magnates of the land, and the furious jealousy of the whole community, if she visited any of the old Catholic families. Scotland had been suffering all the pains and penalties of absenteeism since the union of the kingdoms, and these were never alleviated by the circulation of a portion of the royal revenue in that direction. Assuredly, the Stuarts had little reason, since the Gowrie conspiracy, to be forward in paying a visit unarmed to one of their northern lords. The extreme poverty of the crown, owing to the refusal of the Parliament of Charles to grant him the usual tonnage and poundage, unless he put in force the penal laws against the condemned Catholic priests, limited his expenses to the most rigid economy, and royal progresses cannot be made without a certain degree of royal expenditure. The following occurrence, which took place in September 1632, increased the unpopularity of the Queen to an alarming degree. On Friday, at eleven in the forenoon, Her Majesty, with her own hands, helped to lay the first two square corner stones, with a silver plate of equal dimensions between them, in the foundation of her Capuchin's church, intended to be built in the tennis courtyard of Somerset House, which stones, in the presence of upwards of two thousand persons, were consecrated with great ceremony, having engraven upon the upper part of that plate the portraits of their majesties as founders, and of the Capuchins as consecrators. Another chapel for the Queen was commenced at St. James's, but the approaching revolution ripened and strengthened, as these establishments for the Roman Catholic Church approached completion, and the personal libels on the Queen became frequent and furious. The service of the Roman Catholic Church was, in the course of about two years, celebrated at these chapels with a splendor and publicity most injurious to the prosperity of Charles I. The desire of Charles I to show his preference for the Church of England perhaps occasioned his attempts to establish it in his northern kingdom. This fatal step appears to be connected with his Scottish coronation. Probably the oath which the constitution of the country required him to take was not consistent with the popular religion. Henrietta remained at Greenwich Palace during the king's absence in Scotland. It was the first separation which had occurred between the royal pair. Charles showed no little impatience at its duration. He hurried the latter part of his journey of return, and to avoid entering the metropolis, lest he should be delayed by tedious greetings. He rode across the country almost alone, from Waltham to Blackwall, where he was ferried over the river and gave his queen a loving surprise. The queen's delicate situation probably occasioned the homeward haste of the king. Within a few weeks of his return was born, at St. James's Palace, her second son, October 14th, 1633. The child was baptized in St. James's Chapel by the name of James, in memory of his grandfather, James I. The new Archbishop Laud officiated on this occasion. Charles I, according to a custom prevalent in the royal family of England, since the extension of the line of York, created the child Duke of York. The Queen committed him to the care of Lady Dorset. His infantine beauty, fair and blooming complexion, somewhat atoned to his mother for the ugliness of his elder brother. He was her best beloved son. King Charles destined him for the marine service of his country, and caused his education to tend to everything naval. He was named Lord High Admiral in his infancy, and the fleets of England sailed under his flag. No one could at that time tell that he was to be one of the greatest naval warriors the English island ever produced. The Queen's name was involved about this time in a desperate quarrel, which took place between Lord Holland and the resident ambassador at Paris, Lord Weston. The dispute merely related to some letters which the Queen had written to her mother and relatives in France. Lord Holland had undertaken to convey them, but they fell into the hands of the English ambassador, who sent them to the King. Great jealousy existed regarding the Queen's correspondence with France, especially on the subject of religion. The King justified the proceedings of Lord Weston, and placed Lord Holland under arrest, for offering to fight the ambassador to the death. The vague scandals regarding the Queen and Lord Holland have misrepresented this circumstance. This was almost the last difference that ruffled the wedded happiness of the royal pair, and during their future years, the fondest attachment succeeded to the gusty passion which prompted them to a series of lovers' quarrels in the first days of their marriage. An increasing and lovely family cemented their conjugal union. 
Henrietta was a fond mother, and devoted much of her time to her nursery. Occasionally, her divine voice was heard singing to her infant, as she lulled it in her arms, filling the magnificent galleries of Whitehall with its enchanting cadences. Queenly etiquette prevented her from charming her listeners with its strains at other times. Sometimes little flaws of anger overclouded the serenity of her temper, which all her countrywomen mention as being usually a very happy one. Dean Swift, in his history of his own times, makes a malicious use of the following anecdote, which he only has preserved, but it was no great crime, either on the side of Charles or Henrietta. Charles I, in gallantry to his queen, thought one day to surprise her with the present of a diamond brooch, and, fastening it to her bosom with his own hand, he awkwardly wounded her with the prong so deeply that she snatched the jewel from her bosom and flung it on the ground. The king looked alarmed and confounded, and turned pale, which he was never seen to do in his worst misfortunes. Then follows a long tirade against the uxoriousness of the king, which, to the cynical dean, was the deepest of crimes. Alas, Charles's enemies were woefully at a loss for personal faults when they placed this at the head of the list. End of section 4 Section 5 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 8, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Henrietta Maria, Chapter 2, Part 1. At the epoch, when Henrietta Maria was apostrophized by the most popular poet of her day as Great Gloriana, Bright Gloriana, Fair as High Heaven is, and Fertile as Earth. She had been heard to consider herself the happiest woman in the world, happy as wife, mother, and queen. All was peaceful at this juncture, the discontents of the English people, whilst Charles I, governed without a parliament, were hushed in grim repose. It was a repose like the lull of the winds before the burst of the electrical tornado, but she knew it not. Henrietta Maria was not only the queen, but the beauty of the British court, she had, about the year 1633, attained the perfection of her charms, in face and figure. She was the theme of every poet, the star of all beholders. The moral life of Charles I, his conjugal attachment to his queen, and the refined tastes of both, gave the court a degree of elegance till then unknown. Edmund Waller, a gentleman of senatorial rank, a kinsman of the Cromwell family, who were all save one, gentlemen of the most ardent loyalty, exercised his poetic talents as honorary poet laureate. His polished stanzas, descriptive of the beauty of the queen and of the noble ladies of her circle, are now more valuable for their historical allusions than for their poetic merit. On the Queen's Portrait by Van Dyke well fare the hand which to our humble sight presents that beauty which the dazzling light of royal splendor hides from weaker eyes and all access save by his art denies the gracious image seeming to give leave propitious stands vouchsafing to be seen and by our muse saluted mighty queen in whom the extremes of power and beauty move the queen of britain and the queen of love heaven hath preferred a sceptre to your hand favored our freedom more than your command. Beauty hath crowned you, and you must have been the whole world's mistress other than a queen. In the Van Dyke Room at Windsor Castle are four portraits of Henrietta, one of which probably inspired the foregoing verses. Three of these paintings are full lengths. In the first, the queen is evidently a girl in her teens, the features are very delicate and pretty, with a pale, clear complexion, beautiful dark eyes, and chestnut hair. Her form is slight and exquisitely graceful. She is dressed in white satin. The bodice of her dress is nearly high, with a large falling collar trimmed with points. The bodice is made tight to her form, closed in front with bows of cherry-colored ribbon, and is finished from the waist with several large tabs, richly embroidered. The sleeves are very full and descend to the elbows, where they are confined by ruffles. One arm is encircled with a narrow black bracelet, the other one with costly gems. She wears a string of pear-shaped pearls about her neck, 
a red ribbon twisted with pearls is carelessly placed about her hair at the back of her head she stands by a table and her hand rests on two red roses which are placed near the crown one of van dyck's most magnificent paintings represents queen henrietta in the same piece with the king her husband and her two eldest sons charles the second and james the second henrietta and charles the first are seated in chairs of state she has her infant in her arms whom she holds with peculiar grace but bestows her attention on the prince of wales who is standing by the king with his little hand caressingly placed on the royal father's knee two little dogs are in the foreground between the king and queen one sits at the king's foot the other stands on its hind legs with its paws on the queen's dress looking up at the baby in her arms whose attention it has attracted the infant is about six months old in long white draperies black-eyed and intelligent but has no border to its droll little cap the appearance of the queen is maternal but she has an air of care and sadness her hair is confined with a string of large round pearls a cross adorns her bosom her dress is rich brown brocade with very full lace ruffles and the graceful little cape called in the modern vocabulary of costume a bertha falls over the bodice which is finished round the bosom and at the waist with a purple band king charles is very handsome graceful and chivalric he wears the collar and star of the garter with a regal dress of purple velvet slashed with white satin a van dyke collar and white satin shoes with enormous rosettes the crowns both of the king and queen are placed on a small round table the palace of whitehall appears in the background to turn from the characteristics of henrietta perpetuated by the pencil to those effected by the pen we must quote the lines of waller inscribed to the lady who could do anything but sleep when she chose in this elegant little poem she has personified sleep who in the first person is supposed thus to address the insomnolent queen my charge it is those languors to repair which nature feels from sorrow toil and care rest to the limbs and quiet i confer on troubled minds but not can add to her whom heaven and her transcendent charms have placed above those ills which wretched mortals taste yet as her earnest wish invokes my power i shall no more decline that sacred bower where gloriana the great mistress lies but gently fanning those victorious eyes charm all the senses till the joyful sun without a rival half his course has run who while my hand that fairer light confines may boast himself the fairest thing that shines if the queen could be deceived out of a sense of her mortality by such adulatory stanzas as these the time was fast approaching which would show that she was in no wise distinguished above other sojourners in this world of trouble save by the pressure of a double load of sorrow that insomnolency which was adroitly turned into compliment by the poetical adulator was probably induced by the prognostics of the approaching political storm another sketch of henrietta in waller's poetical portraiture is still more elegant could nature there no other lady grace whom we might dare to love with such a face such a complexion and so radiant eyes such lovely motion and such sharp replies beyond our reach and yet within our sight what envious power has placed this glorious light all her affections are to one inclined her bounty and compassion to mankind to whom while she so far extends her grace she makes but good the promise of her face for mercy has could mercy's self be seen no sweeter look than this propitious queen queen henrietta had made such slow progress in the english language in the first years of her marriage that her deficiencies in sixteen thirty two became a matter of serious consideration previously charles i among other reasons for dismissing her french household had sent to her mother that his queen obstinately refused to learn the english tongue this fault was so sedulously mended in subsequent years that her sons could not express themselves in french when they were resident in paris madame de motteville likewise complains that queen henrietta had in her constant practice of english forgot the delicate idioms of her mother tongue mr wingate a learned barrister of gray's inn was in sixteen thirty two appointed to her majesty's tutor and to facilitate her acquisition of english a grand mask called the queen's pastoral was acted at whitehall the part destined for the queen to learn by rote was so unmercifully long 
that her majesty complained piteously to her ladies of the labor of learning it and said that it was as long as a whole play the parts of her ladies were equally lengthy and heavy so that the queen's pastoral took eight hours in the performance the piece was written by a young aspirant and possessed no literary merit it was from the pen of walter montague the second son of the earl of manchester who finished life as an ascetic priest and the queen's grand almoner of whom we shall have much to say hereafter he was in youth a gay gallant of the court little anticipating his own transmutation ben jonson was usually the poet of the courtly masks unfortunately for the queen he and inigo jones had had a furious quarrel regarding their merits as poet and designer of masks and on this account the queen's pastoral had been furnished with words by the unskilled amateur montague it was the part that the queen took in this luckless pastoral which called forth the furious vituperations of master prynne in his histromastrix yet it was only for her majesty's private exercise in her own courtly circles in honor of the birth of the second english prince and to show how little they participated in the illiberal attacks of the fanatic agitator prynne which occurred about the same period the queen was invited by the gentlemen of lincoln's inn and of the temple to a splendid mask and ballet given at their charge the lincoln's inn and temple mass lasted three days they put the majority of the people into an ecstasy of good humor and for a while contributed to soften the sour and acrid temper of the times these outward glories were notwithstanding checkered with dark indications of approaching troubles a concealed volcano was glowing beneath the feet of those who gaily trod the courtly measures in the elegant and really harmless ballets which rendered still more furious the fanaticism of prynne and his coadjutors the brutal attack of prynne on the queen in his histromastrix drew down on him the vengeance of charles in a manner inconsistent with his former character though perfectly consistent with the law at that time in force no one commented on the conduct of prynne with more terse severity than that honest but mistaken fanatic himself it is well to conclude the subject with his own words which he wrote when he was keeper of the record of the tower after the accession of charles the second king charles ought to have taken my head when he took my ears it is to henrietta's great credit that she did all in her power to save prynne from the infliction of the pillatory and the consequent loss of his ears which was part of that barbarous and disgusting punishment the queen's favorite residences were somerset house st james's palace and the palace of woodstock her partiality to these palaces was principally induced by the facilities they presented for the roman catholic worship somerset house was settled on her as her dower palace in case of widowhood and this was peculiarly her private residence st james's was her family abode and the habitation of her children when they were in london in each of these residences she had chapels and lodgings for her twelve capuchin almoners woodstock was her favorite country palace and here she likewise had a regular chapel for her worship while waller's lyrics were doing their best to him the queen into immortality van dyke's glorious pencil was illustrating her personal graces and in nego jones's devising the scenery of the masks and ballets which formed the amusements of her picturesque and stately court ben jonson beaumont and fletcher wrote dramatic poems for the purpose of perfecting the queen in our language her majesty often took part in these diversions but much less publicly than her predecessors the royal taste for these elegant amusements caused the great nobility to dispense the superfluity of their incomes in encouragement of the fine arts when their majesties paid visits in their progresses it was the fashion of their noble hosts to engage some poets distinguished by their approbation to compose a dramatic entertainment for their amusement such was the case when the earl of newcastle received the royal pair at his castle of bolsover in derbyshire on this occasion he obtained the assistance of ben jonson to write the verses which form part of their majesty's entertainment so much pleased were the royal pair with the literary taste of the earl and his loyal hospitalities at bolsover that they agreed in the appointment of newcastle as governor to charles prince of wales the queen brought into the world at st james's january twenty eighth sixteen thirty five the princess elizabeth 
the states of holland sent an especial embassy to congratulate her majesty on the birth of this little one and propitiated her with rich presents which are described as a massy piece of ambergris two fair and almost transparent china basins a curious clock and of far greater value than these two beautiful originals of titian and two of tintoret to add to the galleries of paintings with which the king was enriching whitehall and hampton court it has been said that the queen brought up her children in the exercise of the catholic ritual till they were thirteen there exists a great mass of evidence to prove that this assertion was false for whatever she might wish to do it is certain that they had governors and tutors devoted to the church of england the first letter the queen wrote to her young son is preserved in the british museum the prince was then but eight years old he had been obstinate in his refusals to swallow some physical potion with which his royal mother wished to regale him the queen to her son charles prince of wales charles i am sorry that i must begin my first letter with chiding you because i hear that you will not take your physics i hope it was only for this day and that to-morrow you will do it for if you will not i must come to you and make you take it for it is for your health i have given order to my lord of newcastle to send me word to-night whether you will or not therefore i hope you will not give me the pains to go and so i rest your affectionate mother henriette marie to my dear son the prince sixteen thirty eight the prince in answer to his governor who made suitable remonstrances according to the queen's directions wrote him the following original note which though penned between double ruled lines in a round text hand gives some indication of the sprightly wit that afterwards distinguished him many who dislike pills and potions will sympathize with the prince charles prince of wales to his governor lord newcastle my lord i would not have you take too much physic for it doth always make me worse and i think it will do the like with you i ride every day and am ready to follow any other directions from you make haste back to him that loves you charles p it is possible that charles i might have successfully contended with the inimical party if at the critical juncture of the year sixteen thirty eight he had not incurred the uncompromising hatred of cardinal richelieu by granting an asylum in england to the object of that minister's persecution the queen mother of france marie de medicis the affectionate reception given by charles to the mother of his queen was a fresh instance of his conjugal attachment the king travelled in state to meet marie de medicis at harwich where she landed and escorted her with the greatest respect to london her entry was made there with as much solemnity as if she had been at the pinnacle of royal prosperity in reality she was a distressed fugitive impoverished and hunted from kingdom to kingdom through the ingratitude of richelieu the creature who originally owed his grandeur to her favour the filial care of henrietta was active in providing all that could contribute to soothe the wounded mind of her mother especially in proving that fallen as she was from her high estate she was in the eyes of a dutiful daughter more a queen than ever the words of one of the servants of the fugitive queen will prove how warmly she was welcomed to england by her loving child you shall only know that sieur sabat who officiated at the superintendent of her household had permission to mark with his chalks fifty chambers at st james's as her apartments the whole furnished by the peculiar care of the queen of great britain who seemed to convert all her ordinary occupations into attention to give satisfaction to the queen her mother but there was a personal trait of affection in henrietta which spoke more to the heart than any cost or splendor of reception could have done when the royal carriage in which were seated marie de medicis and her son-in-law charles i entered the great quadrangle of the palace of st james queen henrietta at the first flourish of trumpets left her chamber and descended the great staircase to receive her august mother she was accompanied by her children the little prince of wales the duke of york and the two princesses mary and the infant elizabeth the queen being then near her time and in critical health a chair was placed for her majesty at the foot of the stairs but when she perceived her royal parent such was her anxiety to show her duty and tenderness that she arose and hurrying to her carriage endeavoured with her trembling hands to open the door which she was too weak to accomplish 
The moment her mother alighted, she fell on her knees before her, to receive her blessing, and the royal children knelt around them. Every one who saw it was affected to tears at the meeting. The restless spirit of Marie de Medicis and the selfish turbulence of her numerous and hungry train made but an ill return to Charles and Henrietta for their disinterested and loving kindness to her in her distress. Henrietta related with tears to the sympathizing historian, Madame de Motteville, how dreadfully the king was embarrassed by the extravagance of her mother's attendance, and when he could not find means to satisfy their rapacity, they had the folly and malignity to carry their complaints to Parliament and petition for larger allowances. That Parliament, which had viewed the visit of the Queen Mother with inimical feeling, and had considered the circumstance of a second establishment for the Catholic worship at court, with angry disgust. The Queen, in the winter of 1640, lost her youngest daughter, the Princess Anne, who died, December 8, 1640, at the age of four years. Just before the royal child expired, the necessity of prayer being mentioned to her, she said that she did not think she could say her long prayer, meaning the Lord's Prayer, but she would say her short one and repeated, Lighten mine eyes, O Lord, that I sleep not the sleep of death. There is an important section in Madame de Motteville's work, being neither more nor less than a historical memoir, of which the Queen of Charles I is the authoress, quite as much as the celebrated memoirs of Sully were written by that great man. The tract is headed, Abrégé des Révolutions d'Angleterre, and is thus introduced by the editress. Recital made by the Queen of England, Henriette Marie, daughter of Henri Cotte and Marie de Medici, in the Monastery of the Virgins of St. Mary de Chalot, of which she was foundress, written by Madame de Motteville, to whom this princess dictated. The regnal history of Charles I is too wide a field for the biographer of his wife to enter, unless forced upon the portion in which the queen was personally involved. Yet the view taken by Henrietta herself of some parts of that history justly demands a place in her life. The queen relates affairs without troubling her head, whether by her admissions, her much-loved lord, is convicted of invading the English constitution or not, for she evidently comes to the point in ignorance, that such was a crime. Henrietta declares that when a vast number of books of common prayer were prepared to be sent to the Scotch, at the time of the liturgy being forced on that unwilling people, her husband, glad to take the opportunity of her attention being then forcefully drawn to the subject, brought her one of the common prayer books, and sat down by her for a whole evening, and prevailed on her to examine it with him. He pressed on her notice the fact, which no living creature can deny, that though there is much in the mass book not to be found in the common prayer book, yet there are very few pages in the common prayer which are not supplied from the mass book and breviary. Henrietta's prejudices were scarcely neutralized by this conviction, for she adds directly, It was this fatal book which occasioned the first revolt in Scotland. The rage of the people, the queen observed, had been excited against Strafford, because he had obtained funds of the Irish Parliament, sufficient to enable the king to raise an army. He had likewise proposed to his royal master the plan to gain a greater degree of power by means of this army. The Parliament pursued him with vengeance. Strafford boldly requested the king to let them take their course and do their worst. The king, she says, too yielding, did as this generous minister advised, and suffered him to be immured in the tower, when there his enemies loaded him with calumnies and crimes. For a long time he was brought every day before the commons to be interrogated. He replied to every impeachment, with dauntless spirit and irrepressible wit. Many who had been indifferent towards him at first, became his warmest partisans. The queen, observes Madame de Motteville, while telling me these things, interrupted her narrative by this description of Strafford. He was ugly, but agreeable enough in person, and had the finest hands in the world. Notwithstanding the spirited defense of the fascinating and brilliant Strafford, the queen acknowledged that she was dreadfully alarmed for him, and labored with all the energy of female diplomacy to save this faithful friend. We suspect that her exertions did Strafford no good, but a prodigious deal of harm. However, she satisfied herself that she was doing wonders in his cause. 
Every evening, says her narrative, was a rendezvous given, and the most meachant of his enemies admitted to a conference with her, by the way of the back stairs of the palace, leading into the apartments of one or other of her ladies of honor, who happened to be off duty and away in the country. At the foot of the back stairs, the queen often met the leaders of the parliamentary faction alone, lighted only by a flambeau which she held in her hand. She offered them all things to turn them from their purpose, yet gained no one but Lord Denby, that is Digby. It is to be feared that in these interviews, which resemble the conferences between the beautiful Marie Antoinette and the demagogue Mirabeau, that the wily Republicans contrived to elicit intelligence from the vivacious and loquacious Henrietta, which were fearfully injurious to her own party. Only prevailed upon a lady to talk on what is nearest to her heart, says the diplomatist. You have ought to do but listen, and all her intentions are revealed. The observation is true, and ought to be sufficient to keep woman out of the thorny paths of political intrigue. The next great mistake made by the queen was her choice of agents in negotiating with the army, which had become disgusted with the parliament, and were inclined to declare for the king. Two gentlemen belonging to the queen's household held commands in this army, and were entrusted by her majesty as agents to bring it over to the king. These were George Goring, her chamberlain, and Arthur Wilmot. The king determined to send the queen's equerry, Harry German, to negotiate a dispute which had occurred between them. The queen had reason to believe that it would prove a most dangerous office for German to mediate this quarrel. She called him into her cabinet, and after communicating the king's intention, told him that her fear was that in case the parliament got an inkling of the business, they would drive him and every other confidential servant from her household. At that instant, the king entered into the cabinet and said playfully, if to be done, it is he that must do it. He must not do it, replied the queen, and when you learn why, you will be of my mind. Speak then, madam, replied the king, still smiling, that I may know what it is that I have commanded, and that you forbid. The queen then explained seriously, how fearfully inconvenienced they should be if one of their principal servants was discovered in this negotiation and driven from them. The king allowed she was right, but said, there was no one to whom Goring and Wilmot would listen but German, who was esteemed by both, and was mild and conciliatory, Besides, all ought to be risked, for Stafford's sake. The queen yielded to these reasons, and German departed on his errand. He represented to his two friends, Goring and Wilmot, the message of the king, with which he was charged. The flawy temper of Goring was aggravated by finding that he was not destined to command the army. But being exceedingly deceitful, he dissimulated his wrath. That very evening, he stole forth secretly, and betrayed the whole scheme to the parliament, there can be no doubt that the real object of his envy was Strafford. He was determined that he should die without aid. The event took place directly, which the queen had anticipated. The parliament sent humbly to request that the king would please to command that no person of the queen's household should quit Whitehall. The king and queen were then morally certain that some person had betrayed their design, and that German's mission had been discovered but neither of them suspected the frank, rattling, gallant George Goring as the informer. On the contrary, they were peculiarly anxious for his safety, lest the ebullitions of his zealous loyalty should compromise it. The whole intrigue ended with German and several other gentlemen in the royal household flying to France. It is certain that these courtiers, though descended from the heroes of Cressy and Agincourt, were troubled with very little of their superfluous valor, and evidently deemed discretion the better part of it. But the only man who could have guided valor by the soul of genius, and righted the car of state, whirled out of its place, now bereft of all aid, by the envy of the little great men of the court, was nearly hunted to the last gasp. Yet day by day, Strafford defended himself at the bar of the house, with undaunted eloquence that agitated all hearts, the king and queen witnessed the scene with painful interest from lattice boxes, and every evening they met each other with aching hearts and tearful eyes, as the queen told Madame de Motteville. 
To the surprise of their majesties, Goring declared himself vociferously against Strafford and the royal party. And when afterwards, he was reproached by message from the queen for his ingratitude, when he had been her officer so many years, he affirmed that, his conduct arose from his aversion to having any coadjutor in the service he meant to render their majesties. Thus this man's egotism effected the first fatal blow to the cause of King Charles. Strafford, when he found he had lost his friend German, gave himself up for lost. It was not, continues the queen, that the viceroy of Ireland feared to die. He could easily have saved himself by flight more than once, but he would not do it. All his ambition was bent on confounding the malice of his enemies by the proofs of his innocence. He ought to have been forced to take more sure means. The queen's frequent expression, that the king and herself were left without servants, arises from a political movement of the parliament by which the whole royal household were changed at a blow. Some of the leaders of the opposition were placed in immediate domestication with the royal family, as, for instance, the discontented peer, Lord Essex, was made Lord Chamberlain, and his brother-in-law, the Marquis of Hertford, was appointed governor of the Prince of Wales, in hopes that he would act as a rival claimant of the crown. Being the representative of the Greys, the hereditary leaders of the Calvinistic party, or Edward the Sixth Church. End of section five. Section six of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume Eight, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Henrietta Maria, Chapter Two, Part Two. English history usually affirms that the queen, terrified at the mobs which surrounded Whitehall, yelling for Strafford's head, implored Charles to give him up and save her and her children, and that he signed Strafford's death warrant in consequence of her feminine fears. The queen ought, however, to be heard in her own defense, and she declares it was a procession of the bishops which shook the king's resolution, as these prelates represented that it was better one man should die than the whole realm perish. Henrietta so frankly acknowledges in general her erroneous conduct that there is nothing to hinder her from doing so here. If she had felt herself betrayed by her feminine fears, for terror at the sight of a howling mob is no disgrace to a woman. The truth is, Henrietta's faults arose not from want of courage, but from loquacious communication. The assertion of the queen's pusillanimity being entirely founded on palace gossip, we believe that Henrietta has been confounded with the queen of France, her mother, Marie de Medicis, who was domesticated with her at that period and was exceedingly frightened at the violence of the revolutionary mob. Strafford, continues the queen, himself sent to entreat his royal master to sign his death warrant to appease the insurgents, expecting, doubtless, that he should be pardoned when their first rage was over. But as soon as his enemies had the king's signature, without heeding the royal commandment to the contrary, they hurried the victim to death. The more public was his death, the more was seen of the grandeur of his mind and his admirable firmness. He spoke uncompromisingly to his enemies, and in spite of their barbarity, he forced them to regret him, and tacitly to avow that they had done him injustice. It has been asserted that the royal friends, for whom Strafford sacrificed himself, were indifferent to his fate, but these are the actual words of the queen. The king suffered extreme sorrow, the queen wept incessantly, they both anticipated, too truly, that this death would, sooner or later, deprive the one of life and the other of all happiness in this world. Let no one, after this, say that the high-minded Strafford fell unpitied, a victim to the selfish fears of the queen. In the midst of these awful scenes, the princess royal, a girl of ten years of age, was espoused in person at Whitehall Chapel by the son of the Prince of Orange, a boy of the age of eleven, a truly Protestant alliance, which ought to have given the country great satisfaction. This marriage took place May 2nd, 1641. The day after, the mob broke into Westminster Abbey, pillaged it, and did all the mischief with which revolutionary mobs generally amuse themselves, yelling all the time for Strafford's death, who was executed May 12, 1641. 
the queen's mother marie de medicis was so infinitely terrified at the violence of the insurgent mobs at this crisis that she insisted on departing forthwith to holland this queen was a marked person by the insurgents they excited the popular wrath against her by every invention within the range of possibility the means by which they effected this purpose may be guessed by the following proceedings of the house of lords august twenty sixth sixteen forty one the house have committed to prison the man that printed the scandalous ballet concerning the queen's mother going away and will consider a further punishment they have ordered that these ballets or ballads be burnt by the hand of the common hangman lord arundel the earl marshal escorted the queen's mother to dover by the orders of the king nearly at the same time when she bade farewell to her mother the queen was obliged to part from the king who commenced his journey to scotland august ninth sixteen forty one when he abolished that episcopacy which he had recently shaken his throne to enforce he travelled so rapidly that by the fifteenth the queen received a letter from him announcing his safe arrival in edinburgh her majesty instantly sent the tidings to the royal secretary sir edward nicholas her letter in broken english is a curiosity queen henrietta maria to sir edward nicholas maister nicholas i have received your letter and that or which you sent me from the king which or who writes me word that he has or has been very well received in scotland and that both the army and the people have showed a great joy to the king and such that they say was never seen before pray god it may be continued for the letter that i writ to you count surring the commissioners it is them that are to dispatch business in the king's absence i thank you for you care of giving me advices of what passes at london and so i rest your friend henriette marie r oatlands the nineteenth of august endorsed for mr nicholas the manor and mansion of oatlands had been a favorite dower residence of the queens of england for several centuries the ancient building was originally built in the lowest part of the domain for the vicinity of a plentiful supply of fish for fast days and a stagnant water for replenishing the moats and fosses which defended such habitations were the chief recommendations of the site of a castellated dwelling in the middle ages the old palace of oatlands was levelled with the dust in the civil wars in common with every other dwelling to which queen henrietta was particularly attached here the queen was residing with all her children excepting charles prince of wales who often visited her from richmond or ham the parliament which either could not or would not be prorogued till the end of october busied itself exceedingly regarding the queen's residence with her children and testified the utmost jealousy of her confessor father phillips who underwent several examinations and many portentous hints were dropped by the roundhead orators in the house of commons respecting the queen's establishment of capuchins at somerset house the storm of civil war meantime was growling and muttering around its first symptoms among the middle classes were indicated by large bands of people of eighty or a hundred in company mustering together and hunting down the king's deer in the daytime in windsor forest and even attempting the same incursions in the demesnes of oatlands sir edward nicholas came to reside at his house within three miles of oatlands park for the convenience of the royal correspondence the king's plan of signifying his approbation as to the events going on in england and in his family was to send back the letters of his secretary with his opinion written on the margin the queen is often mentioned in these notations the king usually mentions her by the appellation of my wife as for instance he writes to nicholas your dispatch i received this morning but tell my wife that i have found fault with you because none of hers was within it many measures are discussed in this correspondence which were likely to incur the displeasure of the queen among others the faithful secretary advises the king to obviate the discussion of the capuchins at somerset house in the ensuing sessions of parliament by sending them all away before the attack commenced perhaps the secretary thought this measure was as well to take place when his royal master was out of hearing of the queen's lamentations and remonstrations the king was dubious on this head i know not what to say he wrote in this letter 
if it be not to advertise my wife of the parliament's intention concerning her capuchins and so first to hear what she will say it was by no means likely that the queen would say anything reasonable that elegantly worded but mischievous letter of her mother already quoted was the code on which she always acted in regard to her religion the utter downfall of her husband's dignity and the reign of her family according to the principles she imbibed from it were to take place before she would give up the least particle of the roman catholic observances that her obstinacy could preserve the consequence was that the establishment of capuchins remained till about a year afterwards when the infuriated mob destroyed every vestige of the chapel the queen at this period fancied that she obtained very valuable information from her first lady of the bedchamber lady carlisle regarding the proceedings of lord kimbolton and mr pym two leaders of the roundheads who governed those committees of the lords and commons which exercise extraordinary power during the recess of parliament lady carlisle was on terms of extraordinary intimacy with both these agitators but instead of communicating useful intelligence of their proceedings she betrayed to them every incident that occurred in the royal household which the queen soon after found to her cost being yesterday at oatlands to attend the queen's command wrote sir edward nicholas to the absent king her majesty gave me this paper enclosed with command to send it this day to your majesty it was brought to the queen by lady carlisle who saith she had it from lord manville i confess it were not amiss to have it published the nature of this paper is not mentioned it was probably some attack on the queen or measure regarding the royal children's residence with her the treacherous spy in order to obtain more credit with her royal mistress had given this small piece of information on a subject which was to be public in a few days both houses of parliament met before the king's return and discussed the fact of the frequent visits of the prince of wales to the queen and though wrote sir edward nicholas the commons assert that they did not doubt the motherly affection and care of her majesty towards him yet there were some dangerous persons at oatlands jesuits and others and therefore it was desired that the marquis of hertford should be enjoined to take the prince into his custody and charge attending on him in person this resolution was delivered yesterday at oatlands by my lord of holland to the queen who i hear gave a very wise and discreet answer to the same as i believe her own pen will speedily acquaint your majesty the answer that the queen made to holland was that the prince of wales merely visited oatlands to celebrate his sister's birthday this is not the only instance in which the earl of holland appears in the reality of documentary history in a displeasing light to queen henrietta he is in fact usually found acting in direct opposition to her will despite the assertions of horace walpole who having clinked a coarse rhyme that he thought peculiarly wounding to the reputation of queen henrietta deemed himself bound to prove his idle words by twisting every possibility of scandal into a serious charge against her about the same time the queen's confessor phillips was brought before the house of commons as an evidence to enable them to convict benson a member of parliament of selling protections to the miserable catholics in england be it observed that every species of persecution besides its other more apparent evils formed opportunities for bribery and robbery father phillips would not be sworn on our translation of the bible and the house instead of allowing him to take an oath which he considered binding to him commenced a theological wrangle and eventually committed him to prison for contempt of the scriptures authorized in england in this exigence the queen sent a sensible and conciliatory message to the houses of parliament saying that if her confessor did not appear to have done any wrong against the state maliciously she hoped for her sake they would forgive and liberate him the house of lords complied but the house of commons refused him bail the queen says in her own narrative that the parliament sent to her that she must surrender her young family into their hands during the absence of the king lest she should take the opportunity of making papists of them and here it is proper to observe that from the best authority it is certain that the queen had at an early period tampered with the religion of the princess mary her eldest daughter 
having secretly given her a crucifix and a rosary, taught the use of them, and made her keep them in her pocket. Probably ambition had a share in this furtive proceeding, because as a Protestant, the princess royal could only match with a petty prince. The matrimonial destiny of the child was now decided as the spouse of the Prince of Orange, therefore less occasion existed for religious jealousy on the part of the Parliament. Most likely, Lady Carlisle had given information of the Queen's conduct to Kim Bolton and Pym. The Queen, unconscious of the spy that was about her, replied to the Parliament that her sons were under the tuition of their separate governors, who were not papists, and above all, she knew that it was the will of her husband that they should not be brought up in her religion. To remove all cause of complaint, she left Oatlands and withdrew to Hampton Court, from whence she came occasionally to see her little ones, and thus gave up her constant sojourn with them. Then her enemies raised reports that she meant to leave the kingdom and carry off her children. They sent orders to a gentleman, who was in the commission of the peace at Oatlands, to hold himself ready with a certain portion of militia, called by the queen, Paisons Armes, to serve the king according to their orders. For, among the other anomalies of this revolution, almost to the last, all measures in opposition to the king were enforced in his own name, to the infinite mystification of the mass of the people, who were mostly well-meaning, though unlearned. The parliamentary order to the Oatlands magistrate commanded him and his posse to wait till midnight in the park at Oatlands, where they would be joined by cavalry, whose officers would direct what they were to do. The magistrate immediately sought the queen, showed her his order, and declared his intentions to obey her commands. She thanked him warmly, but told him that she wished him to do exactly what Parliament dictated, and then to remain tranquil. Meanwhile, without raising any alarm, she sent promptly to the principal officers, on whom she could rely in London, who were absent from the army on furlough, and she entreated them to be with her before midnight, with all the friends they could muster. Then she summoned all her household capable of bearing arms, not even excepting the scullions in her kitchen. Without showing any inquietude, she proposed to spend the evening in Oatlands Park, where her muster arrived and joined her party. The night, however, wore away, without the threatened attack from the adverse powers, save that about twenty horsemen, on the road near the park, were seen prowling around, and watching till daybreak. But these, perhaps, had only hostile intentions against the deer. There is no doubt but that the queen would have done battle in defense of her little ones, if need had been for such exertion. The family, which the royal mother was thus personally guarding, somewhat in lioness fashion, by nocturnal patrol round Oatlands Park, was numerous and of tender ages. They were soon after separated, never again to meet on earth in their original number. Charles, Prince of Wales, was then just eleven years of age. Mary, the young bride of Orange, was ten. James, Duke of York, between seven and eight. Elizabeth, about six. And the little infant Henry, but a few months old, who had been born at Oatlands the preceding year. The Queen continued her precautions against the abduction of her infants. She had regained the cooperation of Goring. A somewhat doubtful policy, considering the instability of his conduct, and the falsehood of his word. She told him to hold himself ready at Portsmouth, and that perhaps he would see her very soon at that place, for the purpose of embarkation, to which, nevertheless, she would not have recourse but at the last extremity. The queen likewise sent to her new ally, Lord Digby, and entreated him to send her all the friends he could muster, and on whom he could rely, to remain in the neighborhood of the seats where she and her children were abiding. This was immediately done, to the amount of one hundred cavaliers. Then she took the opportunity, when at Hampton Court, of paying a visit to a loyal gentleman who lived in the vicinity, who was noted for the number of fine horses he kept. He put them all at Her Majesty's disposal. After the Queen had made all these preparations, no enemy appeared to attack her or her infants. On the contrary, the Parliament offered the most elaborate excuses for calling out the militia at Oatlands without the King's sanction, and every member of the House of Commons thought fit separately to deny that he was concerned in it. The two following letters, from the Queen to the King's secretary, were written at this crisis. They are composed in broken English, which she then spoke. 
the queen to sir edward nicholas mr nicholas i am very sorry that my letter did not come time enough to go i have received yours and i have writ to the king to hasten his coming i send you the letter and if little vil murray is vel enough i would have him to go back again to scotland without coming year for a vood that is without coming here for i would have him go to-morrow morning tell him from me but if he were not well then you must provide some body that will be sure for my letter must not be lost and i would not trusted or trust it to an ordinaire post i am so ill provided with persons that is with persons that i dare trust that at this instant i have no living creature that i dare send pray do what you can to help me if little vil murray cannot go to send this letter and so i rest your assured friend henriette marie r for yourself tenth of november sixteen forty one the irish rebellion broke out the same autumn with one of those atrocious massacres which are the usual consequence of a long series of civil strife and religious persecution on both sides the roundhead party founding their accusations on similarity of religion accused the queen of having fostered the rebellion and encouraged the massacre not one particle of real evidence has ever appeared to support these calumnies in fact it was a deadly calamity to the royal cause and the queen ever deemed it as such it was a celtic rising in the hopes of breaking the chains of their enemies while those enemies were quarrelling among themselves there was scarcely a name among the homicides but what began with a mac or an o the king after a long stay in scotland began in his homeward dispatches to give preparatory orders for his return to his southern metropolis the earl of essex who at that time filled the office of lord chamberlain received orders to prepare the palaces for his royal master's reception which orders were rather pettishly communicated by her majesty through the faithful secretary in this little billet queen henrietta to sir edward nicholas maister nicholas i did desire you not to acquaint me lord of essex of what the king commanded you touching his coming now you may do it and tell him that the king will be at tibbles that is theobald's wednesday and shall sleep there and upon thursday he shall dine at Malor major's that is the lord mayor's and be at whithall only for one night and upon friday will go to hampton court where he mains or means to stay that winter the king commanded me to tell this to my lord essex but you may do it for their lordships are two great princes now to receive or receive any direction from me being all that i have to say i shall rest your assured friend henriette marie r for maister nicholas twentieth of november sixteen forty one endorsed the queen to me to signify to the lord chamberlain the king actually did return five days after the date of this letter november twenty fifth he was received with extreme loyalty in england and was greeted everywhere with cries of god save the king the queen flattered herself that she had done wonders towards effecting this reaction by her gracious conferences with the lord mayor and other well-disposed magnates of the city she accompanied the king with all their children at his solemn entry of the metropolis the prince her son rode by the side of his father and she followed in an open carriage surrounded by her infants they were all received with the most fervent benedictions from the populace and with every mark of good will that could be testified the king who had in scotland obtained full proof that five of the most factious of the members of the house of commons were in treasonable correspondence with his rebels there resolved to take advantage of this gleam of popularity to go to the house and arrest them his predecessor elizabeth had often sent and taken obnoxious members into custody while actually in the house of commons for very trifling offences in comparison history insists that henrietta had by taunts and reproaches urged the king to the arrest of the five members as she most piteously blames herself for the error she really committed to which she with deep humiliation attributed all his future misfortunes even his death we cannot help thinking she would have been equally candid if such a charge were true it has been shown that the queen bestowed a great share of her favor and affection on lady carlisle this person had as bad and treacherous a heart as ever deceived a parent or betrayed a friend 
the queen would have had better companionship with the French ladies, whose friskings had so much offended the dignity of King Charles. It was in company with this lady that Queen Henrietta sat in her cabinet at Whitehall, with her watch in her hand, counting the weary minutes of the king's absence, when he went to arrest the obnoxious members of the House of Commons. No one knew his intentions but the queen. He had parted with her on that fatal morning, with these words, as he embraced her. If you find one hour elapse without hearing ill news from me, you will see me, when I return, the master of my kingdom. The queen remained with her eyes fixed on her watch, till that tedious hour had passed away. Meantime, she heard nothing from the king, and she was prompted by her impatience to believe that no news was good news. Therefore, deeming the king was successful, she broke the silence that was pain and grief to her, with these words to the fair Carlyle. Rejoice with me, for at this hour the king is, as I have reason to hope, master of his realm, for Pym and his confederates are arrested before now. Unfortunately, Lady Carlyle was, at the same time, the relative and political spy of one of the members named. She had certain reasons for believing that the blow had not yet been struck, although the hour had elapsed. She promptly gave intelligence to one of her agents, and as the House of Commons was close to Whitehall Palace, the persons marked for arrest had intelligence just before Charles entered the house. They fled while their party rallied and organized a plan of resistance, under plea that it was against the privileges of the commons for any member to be arrested while on duty. The king had been accidentally prevented from entering the House of Commons to carry his intentions into effect by various poor, miserable persons who presented petitions to him as he was about to enter. The hour he had announced to the queen, as pregnant with their future fate, had passed away in reading and discussing the particulars of individual wrong and misfortune. An ancient duty of the English sovereign went on progress to his parliament, not then obsolete. This the king did not consider himself bound to waive, in preference to his somewhat illegal errand, for he knew that his intent of arresting his enemies was, when he left his palace, a profound secret between himself and his royal partner, and he suspected not that the secret had escaped her. The whole incident is a noted instance of the danger of opening the lips regarding diplomatic affairs, till there is indisputable conviction that a deed is done. It would have been well if Henrietta had heard and heeded the warning axiom of Countess Tursky in Wallenstein regarding the portentous nature of shouts before victory. When Henrietta found, as soon as she did, that her heedless prattling had done the mischief, she threw herself into the arms of her husband and avowed her fault, blaming herself with most passionate penitence. Not a reproach did he give her, and she paused in her narrative in an agony of regret to call the attention of Madame Motville to his admirable tenderness to her. For never, said she, did he treat me for a moment with less kindness than before it happened, though I had ruined him. Directly after the occurrence, which the queen termed her Malarus indiscretion, the people mutinied in London, from which the king retired with all the royal family. When they left Whitehall, they went through a multitude of several thousand roundheads. Every one held a staff in his hand, with a white paper placard, whereon was inscribed the word, Liberty. Henrietta herself, with her usual petulant vivacity, had previously given the name of Roundhead to these opponents. In opposition to the flowing lovelocks of the courtiers, the partisans of the parliament had their hair clipped so close and short, that their turbulent heads looked as round as bowls, excepting that their ears seemed to jut out in an extraordinary manner. Samuel Barnardston, a noted Republican of that century, was in his youth the leader of a deputation of London apprentices, for the purpose of communicating to Parliament their notions regarding civil and religious government. The Queen, who saw this posse arrive at Whitehall, then first noticed the extraordinary roundness of their closely clipped heads, and saw at the same time that Samuel was a personable apprentice, upon which she exclaimed, La, what a handsome young roundhead! The exactness of the descriptive appellation fixed it at once as a party name. Roundheads they were called from that moment, and roundheads they will remain, while history endures. Many a satirical ballad and chorus repeated the sobriquet, nor were the jutting ears forgotten. 
Captain Hyde, a cavalier of the Royal Guard, proposed cropping into reasonable dimensions the ears of the next deputation which arrived from the city on the same errand. Rather a dangerous experiment, that of cropping ears which stuck out by reason of the superfluous destructiveness of the owners, especially when those owners had the majority in numbers. Few of the Puritans, says a lady author of that day, wore their hair long enough to cover their ears, and the ministers and many others cut it close round their heads, with so many little peaks, as was ridiculous to behold, whereupon Cleveland, in his hue and cry, describes them, with hair in characters and lugs in texts. From this custom of wearing their hairs, continues the Republican lady, the name of Roundhead became the scornful term given to the whole Parliament party. The rest of the appurtenances of these stalwart agitators is described by another contemporary. In high-crowned hats, collar bands, great loose coats, and with long tucks, or swords, under them, and calves' leather boots, they used to sing a psalm and drub all before them. When, at the end of the struggle, the laws and liberties of England fell under military terror, the roundheads assumed a regular livery of war, and Cromwell, when he had need of their assistance to expel the commons with their speaker, or doom the king, used to coax his troopers by the endearing epithet of his red brethren. The king and queen went no further than Hampton Court. There they determined to watch the event of these insurrections, not having the slightest idea that the least restraint would be put on their personal freedom. They were deceived, for the Parliament sent a circular to all the nobility to arm and prevent the king from going further. In this extremity, the queen proposed to her royal husband that she should depart for Holland, on the ostensible errand of conducting the little princess royal to her young spouse, the Prince of Orange, but in reality, for the purpose of selling her jewels, to provide her consort with the means of defense. It was astonishing to her with what avidity the opposite party seized on the idea of her departure from England. Every facility was given her for putting the project in execution. Such was the Queen's own impression. But Lord Clarendon declares that it was intimated to Her Majesty that, if she did not prevail on the King to permit the law, excluding the bishops from sitting as peers in the House of Lords, the Parliament would interfere to prevent her from going abroad. Consequently, by her influence, the King permitted this act to pass by commission while he was escorting Her Majesty to Dover. Such was the state of affairs when the king conducted his consort and daughter to the place of embarkation at Dover, February 23rd, 1641 to 42. He stood on the shore, watching their departing sails with tearful eyes, doubtful whether they should ever meet again. As the wind was favorable for coasting, the queen declares, her husband rode four leagues, following the vessel along the windings of the shore. Party malice may stain the name of this unfortunate prince with venomous invective, yet to every heart, capable of enshrining the domestic affections, the name of Charles must be dear. But not with his bereaved spirit and troublous career does our narrative at present dwell. We must embark with his adored Henrietta, merely observing that, at her departure, the king went to Theobald's, where the Parliament sent a petition, that he would be pleased to reside nearer to the metropolis and not take the prince away from them. The king went directly after to New Market, and from thence retired to York. During the queen's absence, the fatal adventure at Hull occurred, where Sir John Hotham first denied his majesty access to his own town and military magazines. The queen was well received in Holland by Henry, Prince of Orange, which indeed she well deserved, since she had warmly espoused the cause of his country against the tyranny of Richelieu. The burgomasters of Holland, nevertheless, showed no great veneration to her royal person. They entered her presence with their hats on, threw themselves on chairs close to her, stared at her from under the brims of their Dutch beavers, and flung out of the room without bowing or speaking to her. The result proved that Henrietta exerted, in the exigence of her affairs, the good sense and governing science of her great father. For, one by one, she fascinated all these boorish behaved republicans, and utterly and entirely obtained her own way, in proof of which, Walter Strickland, who had been deputed by the Parliament ambassador to the States of Holland, 
to forbid their granting any assistance to the queen, was dismissed without effecting his purpose. King Charles would not have succeeded so well. He could not have concealed his displeasure and disgust at the coarseness of ill-breeding, but the feminine tact of Henrietta revealed to her the well-known axiom in diplomacy, that after Republicans have gratified their self-esteem by showing their ill behavior to their heart's content, they become particularly amenable to the charm of graceful and courteous manners, generally pertaining to persons of exalted rank. The Dutchmen, notwithstanding their odd mode of showing their regard, behave bountifully to Queen Henrietta. Their high mightinesses at Rotterdam lent her 40,000 guilders, their bank 25,000, the bank at Amsterdam 845,000. Of merchants at The Hague, Fletcher and Fitcher, she borrowed 166,000. On her pendant pearls, she borrowed 213,200 guilders. She put six rubies in pawn for 40,000 guilders, and altogether raised upwards of two million pounds sterling. The queen was one year in effecting this great work. During this time, she sent valuable remittances of money, arms, and warlike stores to her royal husband, who had raised his standard at Nottingham soon after her departure, and commenced the warlike struggle with some success, at least wherever he commanded in person. End of section 6 Section 7 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 8, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Henrietta Maria, Chapter 2, Part 3. The Queen superintended the education of her daughter, the little Princess of Orange, whilst she was in Holland, retaining her always near her, while she pursued her studies under various masters. The young Prince of Orange, her spouse, was likewise still under tuition. The queen very wisely remained with her daughter till she was accustomed to the manners and customs of her new country. This alliance proved a most fortunate one for the royal family of Stuart, as the young princess became infinitely beloved by the people of Holland. It does not appear that any jealousy was manifested by them, lest Henrietta should imbue her young daughter with Catholic predilections. The unfortunate mother of Queen Henrietta died in misery at Cologne the same winter. It had been the intention of the Queen to continue her journey up the Rhine, to attend her parents' sickbed, but the Dutch burgomasters interfered and wholly prevented her, and she, fearful of compromising the advantages she had gained, dared not pursue her intentions, lest her husband's interest should suffer severely. When the queen had obtained all the stores possible in Holland, she bade farewell to her little daughter, and leaving her under the personal care of her mother-in-law, the Princess of Orange, re-embarked for England, almost on the anniversary of her departure the preceding year, February 2nd, 1642 to 43. She sailed from Shoveling in a first-rate English ship called the Princess Royal, and was accompanied by eleven transports, filled with ammunition and stores, for the assistance of the king. Her fleet was convoyed by the Dutch Admiral, Von Tromp. So tremendous a northeast gale began to blow, directly the queen and her ladies had embarked on board this fleet, that they were tossed on the stormy billows nine days, expecting death hourly. The ladies wept and screamed perpetually, but the queen never lost her high spirits. To all the lamentations around her, the daughter of Henry the Great replied gaily, Comfort yourselves, mon chers. Queens of England are never drowned. The ladies suspended their wailings to reflect, and recollected that such a case had never occurred, and were greatly consoled. This conversation is declared by a French writer, to have passed on deck, while the queen was leaning on the rudder, when she had persuaded her train to leave the discomforts of the cabin for a little fresh air. Indeed, the scene below, as related by the queen herself, was anything but inviting. When the tempest blew heavily, and the ship labored and pitched, they were tied in small beds, in all the horrors of seasickness. At the time the storm was at its worst, all the queen's attendants, even the officers, crowded into her cabin, and insisted on confessing themselves to the capuchins of her suite, believing death would ensue every moment. 
these poor priests were as ill as any one and were unable to be very attentive therefore the penitents shouted out their sins aloud in the hearing of every one in order to obtain absolution on the spur of the moment the queen having no terrors of her own to distract her amused herself with remarking this extraordinary scene and made a sly comment on what she heard saying that she supposed that the extremity of their fears took away the shame of confessing much misdeeds in public her gay spirits were not then broken and she declared that the absurdities she witnessed in that voyage at times made her laugh excessively although like the others she could not help expecting the ship to go to the bottom every moment when any eating or drinking was going forward the attempts to serve her in state and the odd disasters that occurred both to her and her servitors tumbling one over the other with screams and confusion were so ridiculous that no alarm could control her mirth after a fortnight's pitching and tossing the good ship was beaten back on the wild shoveling coast and the queen landed safely at the port close to the hague from whence they had set out after a few days rest and refreshment the undaunted henrietta again set sail minus two ships which she had lost in the storm this time she had a quick and prosperous voyage and anchored in burlington bay february twentieth sixteen forty two to forty three after an absence of a year all but two days she did not attempt to land till the twenty second when a gallant squadron of one thousand cavaliers appeared in sight on the hills under their protection by land and that of von tromp by sea the queen came on shore at burlington quay where on the same day the landing of her stores commenced with the utmost celerity at five in the morning the queen was roused by the thundering of cannon and the rattling of shot five ships of war commanded by the parliamentary admiral batten which had been previously cruising off newcastle had entered burlington bay in the night and by peep of dawn commenced an act of cannonade on the house where the queen was sleeping the parliament having voted her guilty of high treason for obtaining supplies of money and arms for her distressed husband their heroic admiral was doing his best to take her life one of their ships says the queen in a letter she wrote at this juncture to the king did me the favor of flanking upon the house where i slept and before i was out of bed the cannon-balls whistled so loud about me that my company pressed me earnestly to go out of that house the cannon having totally beaten down the neighbor's houses two cannon bullets falling from the top to the bottom of the house where i was so clothed as well as in haste i could be i went on foot to some little distance from the town of burlington and got into the shelter of a ditch like that at newmarket whither before i could get the cannon bullets fell thick about us and a servant was killed within seventy paces of me the queen does not venture here to mention to her husband her blameworthy temerity regarding her lapdog though she confessed this fine adventure to madame de motteville she had an ugly old dog named mitt whom she loved very much when she was in the middle of the burlington street she remembered that she had left mitt at the mercy of the parliamentary admiral she instantly turned on her steps rushed upstairs into her chamber and caught up the animal which was reposing on her bed and carried her off in safety after this adventure the queen and her ladies gained the ditch she described and crouched down in it while the cannon played furiously over their heads one dangerous ball says the queen grazed the edge of the ditch and covered us with earth and stones the firing lasted till the ebbing of the tide von tromp whose ships were too large to approach the quay to defend the queen attacked the valiant batten in his retreat and as this admiral had no support from the yorkshire land forces he sheered off to report his deeds to his masters the queen's transports then landed the rest of their stores and her majesty established herself in peace and quiet in the neighborhood of burlington where she remained at least ten days a yorkshire tradition alone mentions the abode of the queen during this delay which was unavoidable whilst her stores and cannon were put in order of march it is said that her majesty established her headquarters at boynton hall near burlington the seat of sir william strickland who although he had accepted the honor of a baronetcy from king charles so recently as the year sixteen forty was a staunch leader of the puritan party and had rendered himself very obnoxious to the court by his political conduct 
his brother walter had recently been ambassador from the parliament to the states of holland where he had fiercely argued against the queen being furnished there with the munitions of war notwithstanding the queen asked and received hospitality and shelter for herself and her train at the native hall of these inimical brethren during her majesty's entertainment a grand display was made of heavy family plate for the honour of the house this the queen observing took occasion at her departure when she returned thanks for her entertainment to say that she feared it would be thought that she was about to make an ungracious return for the courtesies she had received but unhappily the king's affairs had through the disaffection and want of duty on the part of some of those who ought to have been among his most loyal supporters come to that pass that he required pecuniary aid the parliament had refused to grant the supplies requisite for maintaining the honour of the crown and therefore money must be obtained by other means and she was sorry to be under the necessity of taking possession of the plate she had seen during her visit for his majesty's use she should she added consider it as a loan as she trusted the king would very soon compose the disorders in those parts when she would restore the plate or at any rate its value in money to sir william strickland and in the meantime she would leave at boynton hall her own portrait both as a pledge of her royal intentions and a memorial of her visit who it was that performed the part of host at boynton hall to the queen is uncertain as it appears that both sir william and his brother were absent it is possible that there were ladies of the family not so inimical to the royal party since the mother of sir william strickland and his brother was a wentworth and their grandmother a daughter of the catholic family of the stricklands in sizer castle in westmoreland the portrait left by the queen is regarded as a very fine work of art and was probably painted during her late visit to the court of orange it is the size of life and represents her as very pretty and delicate in features and complexion her hair is ornamented with flowers at the back of the head and is arranged in short thick frizzled curls according to the fashion called at the court of france tete de mouton her dress is very elegant simple white with open sleeves drawn up with broad green ribbons the bodice is like the present mode laced across the stomacher with gold chains and ornamented with rows of pendant pearls on each side the family plate was never restored neither was henrietta ever in a condition to redeem her promise of making a compensation for it in money but her portrait has in process of time become at least of equal value unfortunately boynton hall was soon afterwards completely pillaged by a marauding party who followed on the queen's track and sir william strickland and his brother became confirmed roundheads at this period henrietta had recourse to the painful expedient of soliciting personal loans for the service of her royal husband not only from the female nobility of england but from private families whom she had reason to believe well affected to the cause of loyalty to such as supplied her with these aids she was accustomed to testify her gratitude by the gift of a ring or some other trinket from her own cabinet but when the increasing exigencies of the king's affairs compelled her to sell or pawn in holland the whole of her plate and most of her jewels for his use she adopted an ingenious device by which she was enabled at a small expense to continue her gifts to her friends and in a form that rendered these more precious to the recipient parties because they had immediate reference to herself whilst in holland she had a great many rings lockets and bracelet clamps made with her cipher the letters h m r henrietta maria regina in very delicate filigree gold curiously entwined in a monogram laid on a ground of crimson velvet covered with thick crystal cut like a table diamond and set in gold these were called the queen's pledges and presented by her to any person who had lent her money or rendered her any particular service with an understanding that if presented to her majesty at any future time when fortune smiled on the royal cause it would command either repayment of the money advanced or some favor from the queen that would amount to an ample equivalent many of these interesting testimonials are in existence and in families where the tradition has been forgotten have been regarded as amulets which were to secure good fortune to the wearer one of these royal pledges a small bracelet clasp 
has been an heirloom in the family of the author of this life of Henrietta, and there is a ring with the same device, in the possession of Philip Darrell, Esquire, of Cales Hill in Kent, which was presented to his immediate ancestor by that queen. Whilst the queen waited in the neighborhood of Burlington, she did a great deal of business in distributing arms to those gentlemen of Yorkshire, who were loyally disposed, and in winning over many influential persons to the king's party. Sir Hugh Chamonley delivered Scarborough Castle to his majesty, and declared himself a cavalier, whilst her majesty sojourned at Burlington. Many other gentlemen, quite captivated by the adventurous valor of their queen, resolved on the same course, among others the Hothams, whose defection had so infinitely injured the king. A complete reaction seems to have taken place in the royal cause in Yorkshire. It arose, perhaps, from the following circumstance. While the queen yet remained in the vicinity of her landing place, one of the captains of the five parliamentary vessels, which bombarded the queen's house at Burlington, was seized on shore. He was tried by a military tribunal, and as it was proved that he was the man who directed the cannon, which had so nearly missed destroying her, he was condemned to be hanged. The queen happened to meet the procession when he was conducted to execution, and she insisted on knowing what it meant. She was told that King Charles's loyal subjects were about to punish the man who had taken aim at her chamber in Burlington. Ah, said the queen, but I have forgiven him all that, and he did not kill me. He shall not be put to death on my account. The captain was set at liberty by her commands, and she entreated him not to persecute one who would not harm him when she could. The captain, adds the narrative, was so deeply touched by her generosity that he came over to the royal cause, and, moreover, persuaded several of his shipmates to join him. At last, her gallant escort of two thousand cavaliers arrived from York, sent by the Earl of Newcastle, headed by the heroic Marquis of Montrose, and the Queen set out in triumph, crossing the Wolds to Malton, on her march to York, guarding six pieces of cannon, two large mortars, and 250 wagons loaded with money. Her army gathered as she advanced, and when she reached York, it had swelled into a formidable force. She herself gave an animated description of her military progress. She rode on horseback throughout the march as general. She ate her meals in sight of the army, without seeking shelter from sun or rain. She spoke frankly to her soldiers, who seemed infinitely delighted with her. She took a town, too, by the way, which truly, adds she, was not defended quite so obstinately as Antwerp, when besieged by the Duke of Parma, but it was a considerable one, and very useful to the royal cause. The Queen wrote from York as follows. Queen Henrietta Maria to Charles I. York, March 20th, 1643. My dear heart, I need not tell you from whence this bearer comes. I will only tell you that the propositions he brings are good. I believe there is not yet time to put them in execution. Therefore find some means to send them back, which may not discontent them, and do not tell who gave you this advice. Sir Hugh Chalmonley is come in with a troop of horse to kiss my hand. The rest of his people he left at Scarborough, with a ship laden with arms, which the ships of the Parliament had brought thither at Scarborough, so she is ours. The rebels have quitted Tadcaster upon our sending forces to Weatherby, but the rebels are returned with twelve hundred men. We send more forces to drive them out, though those we have already at Weatherby are sufficient, but we fear, as they have all their forces thereabout, lest they have some design, for they have quitted Selby and Kaywood, the last of which they have burnt. Between this and tomorrow, we shall know the issue of the business, and I will send you an express. I am the more careful to advertise you of what you do, that you and we may find means to have passports to send, and I wonder that, on the cessation, you have not demanded that you might send in safety. This shows my love. The cessation the Queen mentions was a treaty of peace which the Parliament was negotiating with the King. If they had no other terms to offer than those the Queen recapitulates here, no one can wonder at her indignation regarding them. Clarendon blames her exceedingly for her opposition to the treaty. She must speak for herself as follows. I understand today from London that they, the Parliament, 
will have no cessation of arms and that they treat in the beginning that is in the first two articles of surrender of forts ships and ammunition and afterwards of the disbanding of the king's army certainly i wish a peace more than any and that with greater reason than any one else i would desire the disbanding of the perpetual parliament first and certainly the rest will be easy afterwards this parliament it must be remembered had voted itself lifelong an encroachment at once on the constitution of england far more astounding than anything that king charles had done i do not say this resumes the queen of my own head alone for generally both those who are for you and against you in this country wish an end of it and i am certain that if you do not demand it at first it will not be granted hull is yours and all of yorkshire which is a thing to consider of and for my particular if you make a peace and disband your army before there is an end of this perpetual parliament i am absolutely resolved to go to france not being willing to fall again into the hands of those people being well assured that if the power remains with them it will not be well for me in england remember what i have written you in three precedent letters and be more careful of me than you have been or at least dissemble it that is affect to be more careful of me adieu the man hastens me so that i can say no more in a fragment of a letter from york the queen notices other naval forces taken from the parliamentary party you know now by elliot the issue of the business at tadcaster since that we almost lost scarborough while sir hugh cholmley was there brown bushel would have rendered that place up to parliament but sir hugh having noticed of it is gone with our forces and hath retaken it and hath desired a lieutenant and forces of ours to put within it and in exchange we should take his garrison sir hugh cholmley hath also taken two pinnacles from hotham which brought forty-four men to put within scarborough for the parliament with ten pieces of cannon four barrels of powder and four of bullets this is all our news our army marches to-morrow to put an end to fairfax's excellency and will make an end of this letter this third of april i must add that i have had no news of you since parsons april third sixteen forty three as of making an end of fairfax's excellency that was sooner said than done this was another instance of those shouts before victory into which the queen's sanguine and ardent temperament perpetually betrayed her the royal pair could not meet till fairfax and essex were cleared out of their path achievements which required some months time and several minor victories to effect and the queen was actually detained on the northeast coast of england nearly six months while the king and prince rupert were fighting and skirmishing round oxford and the mid counties at last the rebels were fairly beat out of the field and the queen and her army advanced to newark from whence she wrote the following letter in the most triumphant spirits queen henrietta maria to charles i newark june twenty seventh sixteen forty three my dear heart i received just now your letter by my lord seville who found me ready to go away staying but for one thing for which you may well pardon me two days stop it is to have hull and lincoln young hotham having been put in prison by the order of parliament is escaped and hath sent two hundred and sixty that he would cast himself into his arms and that hull and lincoln should be rendered young hotham hath gone to his father and two hundred and sixty newcastle waits for your answer i think i shall go hence on friday or saturday i shall sleep at Wharton, and from thence go on to ashby where we will resolve what way to take and i will stay there a day because the march of the day before will have been somewhat great and also to learn how the enemy marches all their forces of nottingham at present being gone towards leicester and derby which makes us believe that they intend to intercept our passage as soon as we have resolved i will send you word at this present i think it best to let you know the state in which we march and what force i leave behind me for the safety of nottinghamshire and lincolnshire i leave two thousand foot and wherewithal to arm five hundred more and twenty companies of horse and all this to be under charles cavendish whom the gentlemen of the country have desired me not to carry with me for he desired extremely not to go the enemy have left in nottingham one thousand garrison 
I carry with me three thousand foot, thirty companies of horse and dragoons, six pieces of cannon, and two mortars. Harry German commands the forces which go with me, as colonel of my guard. Sir Alexander Leslie, the foot under him, Sir John Gerard, the horse, and Robin Legg, the artillery, and her she majesty, generalissima over all, and extremely diligent am I, with one hundred and fifty wagons of baggage to govern in case of battle. With all this valor, her she majesty generalissima, as Henrietta calls herself, has an eye to dangers that might occur by the way, from the Earl of Essex, whom the king was doing his best to keep in check, for she adds, Have a care that no troop of Essex's army incommodate us. I hope that for the rest we shall be strong enough, for at Nottingham we have the experience that one of our troops have beaten six of theirs and made them fly. I have received your proclamation or declaration, which I wish had not been made, being extremely disadvantageous to you, for you show too much apprehension, and do not do what you have resolved upon. Farewell, my dear heart. Before the queen departed for Newark, the ladies of that town brought up a petition, entreating her majesty not to march from Newark till Nottingham was taken. The right of petitioning royalty was a perfect mania at that time. It had been a point of dispute between the king and the parliament, and all sorts and conditions of persons, of both sexes, thought proper to dictate by petition the public measures they thought best to be pursued. Women were especially active in petitioning at this era. Her Majesty gave the ladies of Newark, in her answer, a sly hint on feminine duties in these words. Ladies, affairs of this nature are not in our sphere. I am commanded by the king to make all haste to him that I can, you will receive this advantage at least by my answer though i cannot grant your petition you may learn by my example to obey your husbands as this fine petition had been got up without the knowledge of the husbands of the newark dames a more provoking answer could not have been devised not that queen henrietta could boast of being the most submissive wife under the sun as some phrases in her epistles above can testify at last all invidious obstacles were cleared from her majesty's path by the valor of the king his nephews and the oxford cavaliers the queen's name formed the battle cry of this desultory warfare the word of the cavalier charge was god for queen mary the name by which henrietta maria was then known in england the loyalists likewise mentioned their queen in the party songs popular in the mid counties which were founded on some recent successes god save the king the queen the prince also with all loyal subjects both high and both low the roundheads can pray for themselves ye know which nobody can deny plague take pym and all his peers huzza for prince rupert and his cavaliers when they come here those hounds will have fears which nobody can deny god save prince rupert and maurice withal for they gave the roundheads a great downfall and knock their noddles against Worcester Wall, which nobody can deny. It was in the Vale of Keenton, near his own victorious ground of Edge Hill, that Charles met with transport his adored Henrietta. Such a meeting was some atonement for their lives of ill fortune. The king praised the high courage and faithful affection of her, whom he proudly and emphatically called his wife. The mid-counties had been so thoroughly cleared of the insurgents, that the king was only accompanied by his own regiment and by prince rupert's horse when he marched to meet the queen just before the triumphant entry of the king and queen into the loyal city of oxford they received the news of one of prince rupert's dashing victorious skirmishes which added to the exhilaration of the festival with which the oxford cavaliers welcomed them a large silver medal was struck at oxford to commemorate this event and the queen was received in that beautiful and loyal city with the most enthusiastic admiration as the heroine of the royal party her triumphs however replete as they are with incident which develops her character are regretted by some of the king's friends clarendon declares that the queen was so much elated at the flush of success which her supplies had been the means of obtaining that she would not hear of any means of terminating the civil war excepting by conquest thus by her influence the opportunity of making peace was lost 
this was a great error a defect in moral judgment to which heroes and heroines are extremely prone it is doubtless one of the mistakes for which queen henrietta blamed herself with unsparing severity and is the reason why in her narrative she passes over the particulars of her sojourn at oxford with painful brevity End of section seven. Section eight of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume Eight by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Henrietta Maria, Chapter Two, Part Four. Those who, from the vantage ground of two centuries, survey the evil times in which the lot of charles i was cast will be dubious whether any peace could have been lasting all that was good and vital in the spirit of feudality was nearly extinct but at the same time the people were vexed and encumbered with what we may be permitted to call its lifeless husks among these the abuses appertaining to the court of wards were alone sufficient to impel the most enduring people to revolution but the puritan patriots so far from reforming these real wrongs were contending for the sinecures connected with them there were many individuals in those days as in these to whom all worship but that of mammon was indifferent who incited by the splendor of the new aristocracy which had been built on the spoils of the monasteries remembered that the church of england if they could induce the king to join in the robbery would afford goodly prey and these were the most impracticable of all agitators nevertheless it was the bounden duty of the queen to have promoted peace however hopeless of its continuance instead of opposing its establishment with the skill in portraying character which forms lord clarendon's principal claim to literary merit he has displayed the influence that henrietta possessed over the mind of her husband and thus analyzes it with its effects the king's affection to the queen was a composition of conscience love generosity and gratitude and all those noble affections which raise the passion to the greatest height insomuch that he saw with her eyes and determined by her judgment not only did he pay her this adoration but he desired that all men should know that he was swayed by her and this was not good for either of them the queen was a lady of great beauty excellent wit and humor and made him a just return of the noblest affections so that they were the true ideal of conjugal attachment in the age in which they lived when the queen was admitted to the knowledge and participation of the most secret affairs from which she had been carefully restrained by the duke of buckingham she took great delight in examining and discussing them and from thence forming judgment of them in which her passions or prejudices were always strong she had felt so much pain in knowing nothing and meddling with nothing during the time of the great favorite that now she took no pleasure but in knowing all things and disposing of all things as he had done not considering that the universal prejudice that great man had undergone was not in reference to his person but his power and that the same power would be equally obnoxious to complaint if it resided in any other person than the king himself nor did she more desire to possess this unlimited power longer than that all the world should notice that she was the entire mistress of it and it was her majesty's misfortune and that of the kingdom that she had no one about her to advise and inform her of the temper of the people and so thought the queen herself when it was too late for a few months the beautiful city of oxford was the seat of the english court over which the queen presided there all that was loyal refined and learned gathered round the royal family and for a while hope existed that the discontents of the people would be finally silenced by force of arms from such a result only evil could have ensued no reflective person to whom the good of their country was dear could have wished it while the spirits of the queen were yet sustained by martial enthusiasm she wrote from oxford the subjoined little french billet to the loyal defender of york in the spring of the year sixteen forty four queen henrietta maria to the marquis of newcastle my cousin i have received your letter by parsons with the account of all that has passed at newcastle and am very glad you have not yet eaten rats so that the scotch have not yet eaten yorkshire oat cakes all will go well i hope 
as you are there to order about it. Your faithful and very good friend, Henriette Marie R. Oxford, this March 15th. All the pride of the queen is laid aside while cheering her faithful partisan. In these few lines, she shows she had made herself mistress of the customs of the northern counties. She alludes to their provincial food, the oat cakes, with the certainty of giving delight to the garrison. The queen remained at Oxford during the change of fortune that befell the king's cause. It was at the commencement of the year 1644 that the royalist poet, Davenant, addressed to her majesty some lines which Pope imitated in his youth when they were forgotten, and founded his early fame upon them. Perhaps their harmony was never surpassed in English verse. To the Queen at Oxford. Fair as unshaded light, or as the day of the first year, when every month is May, sweet as the altar smoke, or as the new unfolded bud swelled by the morning's dew, kind as the willing saints, but calmer far than in their dreams, forgiven votaries are, but what sweet excellence, what dost thou hear? This last line conveyed a question prompted by the delicate situation of the queen. Oxford was likely to remain no secure harbor for her in her approaching hour of peril and weakness. The king delayed the agonizing separation from his adored consort, till the approach of the parliamentary forces made a battle near Oxford inevitable. Previously to the Battle of Newbury, so fatal to his cause, Charles I escorted his beloved wife to Abingdon, and there, on the 3rd of April, 1644, with streaming eyes and dark forebodings for the future, this attached pair parted, never to meet again on earth. The Queen's first destination was Bath, where she sought the cure of an agonizing, rheumatic fever, of that kind which is sharpened into intolerable acuteness by anxiety of mind. This complaint was called, in the phraseology of the day, a room, and thus the queen names it in the letter which announced her arrival at Bath. Queen Henrietta Maria to King Charles. My dear heart, Fred Cornwallis will have told you all our voyage, or journey, as far as Abbury, and the state of my health. Since my coming hither, I find myself ill, as well as in the ill rest I have, as in the increase of my room. I hope this day's rest will do me good. I go tomorrow to Bristol, to send you back the carts. Many of them are already returned. Farewell, my dear heart. I cannot write more than that I am absolutely yours. Bath, April 21st, 1644. Nothing could be more calamitous than the Queen's prospects in her approaching time of pain and weakness. Ill and sorrowful as she already was, she sought refuge in the loyal city of Exeter, where, amidst the horrors and consternation of an approaching siege, she was in want of everything. She took up her abode at Bedford House in Exeter. The king had written to summon to her assistance his faithful household physician, Theodore Mayern. His epistle was comprehended in one emphatic line in French. King Charles I, to Dr. Sir Theodore Mayern. Mayern, for the love of me, go to my wife, C.R. The Queen likewise wrote an urgent letter in French to Dr. Mayern, entreating him to come to her assistance, to the following effect. Queen Henrietta Maria, to Sir Theodore Mayern, Exeter, this 3rd of May. Monsieur de Mayern, my indisposition does not permit me to write much, to entreat you to come to me, if your health will suffer you, but my malady will, I trust, sooner bring you here than many lines. For this cause I say no more, but that retaining always in my memory the care you have ever taken of me, in my utmost need, it makes me believe that, if you can, you will come, and that I am, and shall be ever, your good mistress and friend, Henriette Marie R. There is great generosity of mind in this letter. The queen does not say, as many a one does, who requires impossibilities in this exacting age. Help me now, or all you have hitherto done will be of no use. But in a nobler spirit, if you cannot come to me in my extreme need, I shall still remain grateful for all your previous benefits. Such we deem offers a good instance of that ill-defined virtue, gratitude. The faithful physician did not abandon his royal patrons in the hour of their distress. 
he obeyed their summons though we have reason to believe that he looked not with affection on the queen deeming her religion one of the principal causes of the distracted state of england henrietta likewise wrote to her sister-in-law the queen regent of france anne of austria giving her an account of her distressed state that queen who was herself just set free by death from the tyranny of her husband's minister cardinal richelieu was enabled to obey the impulses of her generous nature she sent fifty thousand pistoles with every article needful for a lady in a delicate situation and her own sage femme madame perron to assist henrietta in her hour of trouble perhaps the best trait in the character of queen henrietta occurs at this juncture she reserves a very small portion of the donation of the queen of france for her own use and sent the bulk of it to the relief of her distressed husband boundless generosity a generosity occurring in the time of privation was a characteristic of henrietta meantime sir theodore mayern arrived at exeter may twenty eighth he travelled from london in the queen's chariot with sir martin lister although so faithful in his prompt attendance to the summons of his royal master in behalf of the queen he was rough and uncompromising enough in his professional consultations the queen feeling the agony of an overcharged brain said one day at exeter pressing her hand on her head mayern i am afraid that i shall go mad some day nay replied the caustic physician your majesty need not fear going mad you have been so some time the queen when she related this incident to madame de motteville mentioned the incident as mayern's serious opinion of her bodily health but his reply is couched more like a political sneer than a medical opinion the queen gave birth to a living daughter at exeter june sixteenth sixteen forty four at bedford house and in less than a fortnight afterwards the army of the earl of essex advanced to besiege her city of refuge on the approach of this hostile force the queen who was in a very precarious state of health sent to the republican general requesting permission to retire to bath for the completion of her recovery essex made answer that it was his intention to escort her majesty to london where her presence was required to answer to parliament for having levied war in england this was tantamount to avowing an intention of leading her to the metropolis as a prisoner and the french writers aver that essex actually went so far as to set a price on her head the daughter of henry the great summoned all the energy of character which she had derived from that mighty sire to triumph over the pain and weakness that oppressed her feminine frame at this awful crisis she rose from her sick-bed and escaped from exeter in disguise with one gentleman and one lady and her confessor she was constrained to hide herself in a hut three miles from exeter gate where she passed two days without anything to nourish her couched under a heap of litter she heard the parliamentary soldiers defile on each side of her shelter she overheard their imprecations and oaths that they would carry the head of henrietta to london as they should receive from the parliament a reward for it of fifty thousand crowns when this peril was passed she issued out of her hiding place and accompanied by the three persons who shared her dangers traversed the same road on which the soldiers had lately marched though they had made it nearly impassable she travelled in extreme pain and her anxious attendants were astonished that she did not utterly fail on the way the rest of her ladies and faithful attendants stole out of exeter in various disguises to meet her their rendezvous was at night in a miserable cabin in a wood near exeter and plymouth the valiant dwarf geoffrey hudson was of this party he had grown up to the respectable stature of three feet and a half and showed both courage and sagacity in this escape the queen whose original destination was plymouth found pendennis castle a safer place of refuge she arrived with her company in doleful plight at this royal fortress on the twenty ninth of june sixteen forty four as a friendly dutch vessel laid in the bay the queen resolved to embark at once and she sailed with her faithful attendants from the western coast early the following morning nevertheless the worst perils of this escape were not yet past meantime her royal husband made incredible efforts to succor his beloved henrietta 
and urged by despair, fought his way to Exeter by means of a series of minor victories, which were complete because he was entirely his own general. So near were this loving pair towards meeting once more, that Charles entered Exeter triumphantly, but ten days after the queen sailed from Pendennis. Lady Morton presented to the king the little princess, left to her care on the flight of the unfortunate queen. For the first and last time, the hapless monarch bestowed on his poor babe a paternal embrace. He caused one of his chaplains to baptize this little one, Henrietta Anne, after her kind aunt of France and her mother. He relieved Exeter, and left an order on the customs for the support of his infant, who remained there for some time, in the charge of her governess, Lady Morton. Queen Henrietta did not reach the shores of her native land without a fresh trial to her courage. The vessel in which she had embarked was chased by a cruiser in the service of the Parliament. Several cannon shots were fired at the vessel in which she was embarked, and the danger of being taken or sunk seemed to her imminent. In this exigence, the Queen took the command of the vessel. She forbade any return to be made of the cannonading, for fear of delay, but urged the pilot to continue his course, and every sail to be set for speed. And she charged the captain, if their escape were impossible, to fire the powder magazine and destroy her with the ship, rather than permit her to fall alive into the hands of her husband's enemies. At this order, her ladies and domestics, sent forth the most piercing cries, she meantime maintaining a courageous silence, her high spirit being wound up to brave death rather than the disgrace to herself and the trouble to her husband, which would have ensued if she had been dragged a captive to London. The cannonading continued till they were nearly in sight of Jersey, when a shot hit the queen's little bark and made it stagger under the blow. Everyone on board gave themselves over for lost, as the mischief done to the rigging made the vessel slacken sail. At that moment, a little fleet of Dieppe vessels hove in sight and hastened to the scene of action. This friendly squadron took the queen's battered bark under their protection, and the enemy sheared off. A furious storm sprung up before a landing could be effected, and Henrietta's vessel was driven far from the shelter offered by the harbor of Dieppe. In a few hours, the coast of Bretagne, the refuge of many an exile from England, rose in sight. The queen ordered the longboat out and was rowed on shore. She landed in a wild rocky cove at Castel, not far from Brest. Here she had to climb over rocks and traverse on foot a most dangerous path. At last she descended into a little rude hamlet of fishermen's huts, where she thankfully laid herself down to rest in a peasant's cabin covered with stubble. The Baz Bretons took her people at first for pirates and rose in arms against them, and the queen, exhausted as she was, was forced to explain to them who she really was. Next morning, the neighboring Breton gentlemen, being apprised of her landing, thronged to her retreat in their coaches, offering her all the service in their power. In all eyes, as she afterwards observed, she must have appeared more like a distressed wandering princess of romance than a real queen. She was very ill and very much changed, but the memory of Henri Cotte was still dear to the French people. His daughter was followed by their benedictions and was supplied from private goodwill with all she needed. She used the equipages so generously offered to convey her to the baths of Bourbon, where she sought health for her body and repose for her overwrought mind. Her first feeling, she declared, was that of penitence for her intended self-destruction, the indomitable determination of purpose, which all ancient writers, and too many modern ones, would have lauded as an instance of high resolve, worthy of a Roman matron, Queen Henrietta very properly condemned as sinful desperation, unworthy of a Christian woman. I did not, she said to Madame de Motteville, when she related to her this adventure, feel any extraordinary effort when I gave the order to blow up the vessel, I was perfectly calm and self-possessed. I can now accuse myself of want of moral courage to master my pride, and I give thanks to God for having preserved me, at the same time, from my enemies and from myself. The feelings of Charles I on his queen's departure, left desolate as he was to accomplish his sad destiny, are best known by his lonely meditations in his icon basilicon. He says of her, 
although I have much cause to be troubled at my wife's departure from me, yet her absence grieves me not so much as the scandal of that necessity which drives her away doth afflict me, namely, that she should be compelled by my own subjects to withdraw for her safety. I fear such conduct, so little adorning the Protestant profession, may occasion a farther alienation of her mind, and divorce of affections in her from that religion which is the only thing in which my wife and I differ. I am sorry that my relation and connection with so deserving a lady should be any occasion of her danger and affliction. Her personal merits would have served her as a protection among savage Indians, since their rudeness and uncivilized state knows not to hate all virtue as some men's cruelty doth among whom i yet think there be few so malicious as to hate her for herself the fault is she is my wife here we think the conjugal affection of king charles misleads him the fact is that his chief fault in the eyes of his people was that he was her husband he continues this observation with pathetic earnestness i ought then to study her security who is in danger only for my sake I am content to be tossed, weather-beaten, and shipwrecked, so that she be safe in harbor. I enjoy this comfort by her safety in the midst of my personal dangers. I can perish but half, if she be preserved. In her memory and in her children, I may yet survive the malice of my enemies, although they should at last be satiate with my blood. Thus Charles, at a comparatively early part of his calamities, 1644, always looked forward to a violent death, but he was greatly mistaken if he supposed that the malice of party would be satiated with his blood. I must leave her then to the love and loyalty of my good subjects. Neither of us can easily forgive, since we blame not the unkindness of the generality and vulgar, for we see that God is pleased to try the patience of us both by ingratitude of those who, having eaten of our bread and being enriched by our bounty, have scornfully lifted up themselves against us, and those of our own household are become our enemies. I pray God lay not their sin to their charge, who think to satisfy all obligations to duty by their corbin of religion, and can less endure to see than to sin against their benefactors as well as their sovereigns. But this policy of my enemies is necessary to their designs. They sought to drive her out of my kingdom, lest by the influence of her example, eminent as she is for love as a wife, and loyalty as a subject, she should have converted or retained in love and loyalty, all those whom they had a purpose to pervert. Pity it is that so noble and peaceful a soul should see, much more suffer, from the wrongs of those who must make up their want of justice, by violence and inhumanity. Her sympathy with my afflictions makes her virtue shine with great luster, as stars in the darkest night. Thus may the envious world be assured that she loves me, not my fortunes. The less I may be blessed with her company, the more I will retire to God and to my own heart, whence no malice can banish her. My enemies may envy me. They can never deprive me of the enjoyment of her virtues while I am myself. Surely, surely every woman must feel that it was a brighter lot to have been loved and mourned for by a man whose mind was capable of these feelings, than to have shared the empire of a world with a common character in commonplace prosperity. End of section 8 Section 9 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 8, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Henrietta Maria, Chapter 3, Part 1 Queen Henrietta trusted that the air and waters of her native land would restore her to convalescence and repair the constitution shattered by the severe trials, mental and bodily, which she had sustained. The springs of bourbon, indeed, somewhat ameliorated her health, but her firmness of mind was greatly shaken. She wept perpetually for her husband's misfortunes. She was wasted almost to maceration, and her beauty was forever departed. This loss she bore with great philosophy. She did not even suppose that it was caused by her troubles. She used to affirm, 
that beauty was but a morning's bloom, and that she had plainly perceived the departure of hers at twenty-two, and that she did not believe that the charms of other ladies continued longer. It mattered little to her, since her husband loved her with increased affection, and proved to her, by a thousand tender expressions and kind deeds, how much the wife was dearer than the bride. The following graphic portrait, drawn by her friend Madame de Motteville, gives a faithful description of Queen Henrietta, both in person and mind, and it must be remembered that the study was from life and the result of familiar acquaintance. I found this once lovely queen very ill and much changed, being meager and shrunk to a shadow. Her mouth, which naturally was the worst feature of her face, had become too large. Even her form seemed marred. She still had beautiful eyes, a lovely complexion, a nose finely formed, and something in her expression, so spirituelle and agreeable, that it commanded the love of every one. She had withal great wit and a brilliant mind, which delighted all her auditors. She was not above being agreeable in society, and was at the same time sweet, sincere, easy, and accessible, living with those who had the honor of her intimacy without form or ceremony. Her temper was by nature gay and cheerful. Often when her tears were streaming, while she narrated her troubles, the reminiscences of some ridiculous adventure would occur, and she would make all the company laugh by her wit and lively description, before her own eyes were dry. To me her conversation usually took a solid tone. Her grief and deep feeling made her look on this life and the pride of it in a true light, which rendered her far more estimable than she would have been had sorrow never touched her. She was naturally a most generous character. Those who knew her in her prosperity assured me that her hand was most bounteous, as long as she had aught to give. Such is the sketch drawn by Henrietta's most intimate friend, who was at the same time one of the most virtuous, the most accomplished, and the best of her country women. Candor demands that we should place this portrait of Henrietta, drawn at a time when she utterly vanishes from the historic page of England, in contradistinction to the prejudiced caricatures which our native authors furnish. The French people, not yet agitated by the insurgency of the civil war of the Fronde, paid the most affectionate attention to Henrietta, regarding her as the daughter, sister, and aunt of their kings, as she had, when in power, done sufficient to provoke the political vengeance of her sister-in-law, Anne of Austria, in whose hands the sovereignty of France rested as queen regent. Her thoughts became a little uneasy on that subject. Henrietta had most warmly taken the part of her mother, Marie de Medicis, with whom Anne of Austria had always been on bad terms, and as her biographer expresses it, she had inflicted on the latter some petite malices, which are great evils at a time when an exalted person is undergoing a series of persecutions. Fortunately, however, the manly character of Henrietta's consort had interposed in the behalf of Anne of Austria, and he had been able to perform some important services for her during the sway of her tyrant, Richelieu, especially by the protection he had afforded to her persecuted favorite, the Duchess of Chevreuse, which that queen now remembered with gratitude and repaid to his afflicted wife and children. Madame de Motteville enjoyed every possible opportunity of writing true history in all she has testified, since she was on the spot and domesticated with the exiled queen at this juncture. The queen regent, Anne of Austria, whose confidential lady of honor, Madame de Motteville was, sent her to the baths of Bourbon to offer Queen Henrietta all the assistance that was in the power of France to bestow. To this, Anne of Austria added many marks of beneficence, most liberally supplying her afflicted sister-in-law with money for her expenditure, of all which bounty Henrietta stripped herself, and sent every farthing she could command to the king her husband. Madame de Motteville continues to observe, after relating this good trait of Henrietta, that many persons have attributed the fall of King Charles to the bad advice of his queen, but that she was not inclined to believe it, since the faults and mistakes she actually committed, she candidly avowed, in the foregoing narrative which pursues our fair historian. She did me the honor to relate to me, exactly as I wrote it, when we were domesticated together in a solitary place, where peace and repose reigned around us, unbroken by worldly trouble. Here I penned, from first to last, 
the detail of her misfortunes which she related to me in the confidence of familiar friendship lord jermyn had retained his post in the household of henrietta through every reverse of fortune and was now the superintendent of her expenditure the steward of her finances and the person who provided her with everything she either wore or consumed he had enriched himself as her treasurer in the days of her prosperity and he had contrived by foreseeing the disastrous tendency of the royalist cause in england to invest his large capital on the continent the english authors suppose that lord jermyn maintained the queen when she was in exile a great mistake which the french archives prove that she had a noble income settled upon her as a daughter of france in distress she might even have saved money if her hand had not been over bounteous toward her distressed husband the assistance therefore given her by jermyn must be limited to the failure of her french supplies during the extreme crisis of the war of the fronde which did not occur till several years after her return to france however the devoted fidelity of this servant of her household his adherence to his office in times of the utmost danger when he occasionally felt himself obliged to disperse the queen's expenses instead of reaping wealth from the income of his appointment naturally raised gratitude in her mind he was called her minister and by some her favorite as such madame de motteville draws the following portrait of him at this period he seemed an honorable man remarkably mild in his manners but to me he appeared of bounded capacity and better fitted to deal with matters of petty detail than great events he had for the queen that species of fidelity usual to long trusted officials he insisted that all her money must be deposited with him before any other person in the world that he might apply it to her expenses which at all times were great the queen reposed much confidence in him but it is not true that he governed her entirely she often manifested a will contrary to his and maintained it as absolute mistress she always showed proper feeling in regard to all who depended on her but she was naturally inclined to be positive and to support her own opinions with vivacity her arguments while maintaining her own will were urged with no little talent and were mingled with a graceful playfulness of raillery which tempered the high spirit and commanding courage of which she had given so many proofs in the principal actions of her life queen henrietta unfortunately for herself had not acquired in early life the experience given by an intimate knowledge of history her misfortunes had repaired this defect and painful experience had improved her capacity but we saw her in france lose the tottering crown which she at this time that is sixteen forty four could scarcely be considered to retain our fair historian who was literally behind the scenes and saw all the springs of movement which influenced the conduct of the royal family of england as well as that of france proceeds to make the following observation which is not merely a brilliant antithesis of french genius but a sober and simple truth which may be corroborated by every examiner into documentary history the cabinets of kings are theatres where are continually played pieces which occupy the attention of the whole world some of these are entirely comic there are also tragedies whose greatest events are almost always caused by trifles and such is ever the result when power falls into the hands of those who ignorant of the events of the past have never studied history or drawn rational deductions by reasoning on the causes of those events chance governs the conduct of such royal personages great tragedies spring from trifling caprices if of good capacity and virtuous inclinations experience may be learned by a royal tyro but generally too late for mistakes in government cannot be rectified by the work being taken out and a better put in as a craftsman's apprentice gains his skill by rectifying mistakes the irrevocable past assumes the awful mien of destiny and too often governs the future the queen of england my aunt says mademoiselle de montpensier in the autumn of sixteen thirty four was afflicted with a malady for which her physicians had already prescribed for her the warm baths of bourbon and she was forced to make some stay there before she was well enough to come to the french court when she was convalescent her arrival was formally announced 
and I was sent in the king's coach, in the name of their majesties. That is, the infant Louis the Fourteenth and his mother, the queen regent. To invite her to court, for such is the usual etiquette. Gaston, Duke of Orléans, the favorite brother of Henrietta, had not, however, waited for the formality of such an approach, and he had flown to visit and comfort her, and was with her at the Baths of Bourbon, when his daughter, the Grand Mademoiselle, arrived in the Queen's coach. I found Monsieur, my father, continues that lady, with the Queen of England. He had been with her some time before I arrived. We both brought her in state on the road to Paris. The precise time of this progress is noted in the journal of the celebrated Evelyn, who, as a philosopher, and therefore, we suppose, a non-combatant, had very wisely asked the king leave to spend his youth in travel, while broadswords were clashing and the war cry of, Ho for cavaliers! Hey for cavaliers! was resounding throughout his native island. He encountered Queen Henrietta on this journey at Tours. He saw her make her entry in great state, the archbishop went to meet her, and received her with a harangue at the head of the clergy and authorities of that city, on the 18th of August, Old Style, 1644. Her Majesty rested at Tours in the archbishop's palace, where she gave Evelyn an audience. She recommenced her journey to Paris on the 20th of August, in the state coach, with her brother Gaston, and La Grande Mademoiselle, who observes, at the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, the Queen Regent came to meet the Queen of England, my aunt, and she brought the little king and the child, his brother, to receive her. They all kissed her and invited her into the king's coach, and thus she made her entry into Paris. Mademoiselle de Montpensier was as much struck by the wretched appearance of the poor queen as Madame de Motteville had been. She says, Although Queen Henrietta had taken the utmost care to recover her good looks, her strength and her health, she still appeared in a state so deplorable that no one could look at her without any motion of compassion. She was escorted to the Louvre and given possession of her apartments by the Queen Regent and her son in person. They led her by the hand and kissed her with great tenderness. They treated her not only with the consideration due to a queen, but to a queen who was, at the same time, a daughter of France." Anne of Austria gave her distressed sister-in-law the noble income of 12,000 crowns per month. Much has been said relative to the pecuniary distress suffered by Queen Henrietta during her exile in France, but justice obliges the remark that her generous relatives supplied her most liberally with funds till the civil war of the Fronde reduced them all to similar destitution. The pecuniary deprivations of the exiled queen lasted only a few months, although it is usually affirmed that such was the case during the rest of her life. The truth was, she stripped herself of whatever was given her, and gradually sold all her jewels, to send every penny she could command to her suffering husband. Her boundless generosity, and her utter self-denial, in regard to all indulgences that she could not share with him, is the best point of her character." the kindest of her friends, the most credible of witnesses, Madame de Motteville, and those two bright examples of old English honor and fidelity, Sir Richard and Lady Fanshawe, bear testimony in many passages to this disposition of Henrietta's income. Mademoiselle, her niece, observes, with some contempt. The Queen of England appeared, during a little while, with the splendor of royal equipage, she had a full number of ladies, of maids of honor, of running footmen, coaches, and guards. All vanished, however, by little and little, and at last nothing could be more mean than her train and appearance. We have seen the unfortunate queen of Charles I, inducted into the Louvre by the generous regent of France. That palace was not, during the minority of Louis the Fourteenth, occupied by the court, and its royal apartments were vacant for the reception of their desolate guest. Anne of Austria likewise appointed for her country residence the old chateau of Saint-Germain, whither she retired that autumn, within three or four days after she had taken possession of her apartments in the Louvre. One of Henrietta's first occupations, when settled in her residence at Saint-Germain-en-Laye, was to indict the following letter to the Bishop of Léon. It affords a specimen of childish devotion, better befitting the semi-barbarians of the Middle Ages, 
than a woman of brilliant intellect of the seventeenth century. Queen Henrietta Maria to the Bishop of Leon. Monsieur Leves de Leon. I am apprised of the pains you have taken at the reception of a little offering which the Father Capuchins have brought, on my part, to Our Lady of Lies, to mark my gratitude to her for having preserved me from shipwreck through the goodness of our Lord, and for the intervention of this Holy Mother in the tempest which I encountered at sea the preceding years, which has induced me to propose founding a mass to be said for me every Saturday in the year in the said chapel for perpetuity, and I have at the same time empowered those who deliver this to enter into the contract for this effect, as I send a capuchin of my almoners, with power to do all that is needful in this affair, who promises that you, who have already given your cares to this good work, will continue them, and employ your authority to establish it, to the glory of God and the honor of the Holy Virgin, and to mark my perpetual reliance on the one and on the other. Meantime, I myself will, in person, render my vows at the same chapel to testify the good will I shall ever bear in you, praying God, Monsieur Levesque, ever to hold you in his keeping. From Saint-Germain-en-Laye, this 7th of September, 1644, your good friend, Henriette Marie R. The contribution the queen sent to the chapel by her capuchin almoner was 1,500 levers for a low mass to be said every week in perpetuity. This sum she doubtless devoted as a thank offering for the bounteous supply which had been accorded by her munificent sister-in-law, the Queen of France. Although so generously soothed and succored, Queen Henrietta remained for many months deeply depressed in spirit, mourning her utter bereavement of husband and children. Her time was principally spent in writing to King Charles, and her establishment at the Louvre proved the rallying point for loyalist English emigrants who sought shelter under her influence in France, when the various plots broke and fell to pieces, which were devised for the restoration of King Charles. Among these were found the illustrious literary names of Cowley, Denham, and Waller. Cowley followed the Queen to Paris after the surrender of Oxford, and became Latin secretary to Lord German, who had the whole care of her household. The office of the poet extended to the translation of all the letters that passed between the Queen and King Charles in cipher, and so indefatigable was their correspondence that it employed Cowley all the days of the week, and often encroached on his nights for several years." Brief must be the specimens of the letters which pass between this pair so tender and true. How deeply their correspondence was marked by heart feeling, the following will show. King Charles to Queen Henrietta, 1645. Since I love thee above all earthly things, and that my contentment is inseparable conjoined with thine, must not all my actions tend to serve and please thee? If you knew what a life I lead, I speak not of the common distractions, even in point of conversation, which in my mind is the chief joy or vexation of one's life. I dare say thou wouldst pity me, for some are too wise, others are too foolish, some are too busy, others are too reserved and fantastic. Here the king gives in cipher the names of the persons whose conversation in domestic life suits his taste so little, owing at the same time, in matters of business, they were estimable. After enumerating names, to which the cipher is now lost, the king adds, Now mayest thou easily judge how such conversation pleaseth me. I confess thy company hath perhaps made me hard to be pleased, but no less to be pitied by thee, who art the only cure for this unease. Comfort me with thy letters, and dost now not think that to know particulars of thy health, and how thou spendest thy time, are pleasing subjects to me, though thou hast no other business to write of? Believe me, sweetheart, thy kindness is as necessary to comfort my heart as thy assistance is to my affairs. In this series occurs a letter from Henrietta, in which she alludes to a passage in one from her husband, where he seemed to doubt that she had shown his correspondence to some other than Lord German, who with his assistant secretary, the young cavalier poet Cowley, were the only persons entrusted with the deciphering of the royal letters. Queen Henrietta to King Charles There is one thing in your letter which troubles me much, 
where you would have me keep to myself your dispatches, as if you believe that I should be capable to show them to any only to Lord Jur, that is German, to uncipher them, my head not suffering me to do it myself, but if it please you, I will do it, and none in the world shall see them. Be kind to me, or you kill me. I already have affliction enough to bear, which without your love I could not do, but your service surmounts all. Farewell, dear heart, behold the mark which you desire to have, to know when I desire anything in earnest. X. This letter proves that Lord German was the king's trusted friend, and that his majesty expressed displeasure if the confidence of the queen was not entirely limited to him. It is another instance which fully proves the fact that the person to whom the world gave the epithet of royal favorite was in reality private secretary and decipherer of the letters of the king or queen. Envy and scandal perpetually pursued such confidants of royalty, and the malicious stories circulated by their enemies always take a vague place in general history, without any definition being afforded of the close attendance the office required, especially when the economy, induced by the king's misfortunes, obliged Lord German to unite the duties of the queen's chamberlain, steward, and secretary in one. On these reports, Horace Walpole has founded one of his malicious tales on no better authority than oral tradition. One evening, he says, before the queen quitted England, the king had nearly surprised Lord German alone with her, one of the gentlemen in waiting, who were walking backwards before the king, with lights down the gallery, stumbled and fell on purpose, which gave German time to escape. As Lord German had been the queen's domestic ever since she was seventeen, being appointed as such by the king, to her great displeasure, on the dismissal of her French servants, the astonishment of his majesty would have been caused by his absence from the queen's apartment when he arrived, and not by his presence. Fortunately for the memory of Henrietta, her self-sacrifices in behalf of King Charles are sufficient to refute such slanders. It is not usual for women, whose affections wander from their husbands, to deprive themselves of every splendor, every luxury, and even of the necessaries of life, for their sakes. Horace Walpole knew best if such was the way of his world. The following letter, quoted from the cabinet captured at Naseby, alludes to the sum sent by the queen to the assistance of her husband. Queen Henrietta to King Charles, Paris, January 27th, 1644-45. My dear heart, Tom Elliot, two days since, hath brought me much joy and sorrow, the first, to know the estate you are in, the other, the fear I have that you go to London. I cannot conceive where the wit was of those that gave you this counsel, unless it be to hazard your person to save others. But thanks be to God, today I received one of yours by the ambassador of Portugal, dated in January, which comforted me much, to see that the treaty shall be at Uxbridge. For the honor of God, trust not yourself in the hands of those people. If ever you go to London, before the Parliament be ended, or without a good army, you are lost. I understand that the propositions for peace must begin by disbanding your army. If you consent to this, you are lost. They having the whole power of the militia, they have and will do whatsoever they will. I received yesterday letters from the Duke of Lorraine, who sends me word that, if his services be agreeable, he will bring you ten thousand men. Dr. Goff, whom I have sent into Holland, shall treat with him in his passage upon this business, and I hope very speedily to send you good news of this, as also of the money. Assure yourself I shall be wanting in nothing you can desire, and that I will hazard my life, that is, I will die with famine, rather than not send it to you." Send me word always, by whom you receive my letters, for I write both by the ambassador of Portugal and the resident of France. Above all, have a care not to abandon those who serve you, as well the bishops as the poor Catholics. Adieu. Charles I very truly anticipated that the publication of the letters and papers which his rebels captured at Naseby, in his private cabinet, would raise his character in the estimation of the world. He thus mentions the subject in a letter to his secretary, Sir Edward Nicholas. My rebels, I thank them, have published my private letters in print, 
and though I could have wished their pains had been spared, yet I will neither deny that those things were mine, which they have set out in my name. Only some words here and there are mistaken, and some commas misplaced, but not much material. Nor will I, as a good Protestant or honest man, blush for any of those papers. Indeed, as a discreet man, I will not justify myself, yet would I fain know him who would be willing that all his private letters should be seen, as mine have now been. However, so that but one clause be rightly understood, I care not so much that the others take their fortune. It is concerning the mongrel parliament. The truth is, that Sussex's facetiousness at that time put me out of patience, which made me freely vent my displeasure against those of his party to my wife. In the course of her correspondence, the queen most earnestly strove to dissuade her husband from his fatal determination of trusting himself in the hands of the prevalent political party in Scotland. We say the prevalent party, for we scorn to re-echo the imputations cast on the gallant nation as a whole for the misdeed committed by the greedy leaders of a faction. Charles I, however, took the disastrous step against which his queen had vainly warned him. The Scotch Calvinists sold him to the Republican army, and to which the palm of infamy is to be awarded. His buyers or sellers, we think, would puzzle a casuist. After this event, the royalist cause was hopeless in England, and the queen, torn with anguish in regard to the personal safety of her husband, sent Sir John Denham from France, in order to obtain a personal conference with him, that she might know his real situation. Sir John either influenced or bribed that strange fanatic, Hugh Peters, to obtain for him this interview. The faithful and learned cavalier saw the king at Caversham and informed him of the exact situation of his queen in her native country, and of all her hopes and fears regarding foreign assistance. Denham relates a most pleasing anecdote relative to the interest the king took in his literary productions. All the troubles which oppressed his royal heart had not prevented Charles from reading and analyzing Denham's poem on Sir Richard Fanshawe's translation of the Pastor Fido. The pleasures arising from literature were the sole consolations of the unfortunate Charles during his utter bereavement and separation from all he loved in life. The first gleam of satisfaction in the mind of Queen Henrietta was the arrival of her eldest son in France. This boy, with his younger brother, the Duke of York, had early been inured to the sound of bullets and the crash of cannon. They had followed their royal father through many a field of various fortune. Sometimes exposed to the range of the murderous bullet, sometimes crouched from the pelting storm beneath a hedge, suffering in company with some much enduring divine of the persecuted church of England, their tutor, hunger, cold, and pitiless weather, while their royal sire was putting the fortunes of England on a field. Then, when the strife was over, springing to the arms of their father and comforting him by their passionate caresses. In after life, James, Duke of York, often narrated his early reminiscences of such adventures occurring when he was little more than nine years old, he recalled them with the feeling of love and admiration with which he always mentioned his father's name. This young prince was left in Oxford at its disastrous surrender and was committed by the Parliament to the custody of the Earl of Northumberland and afterwards lodged as a prisoner in the Palace of St. James. The young Prince of Wales was hurried to the loyal west of England, where on her own dower possessions as the Queen of England, and on the Stannery district belonging to the Prince, a more settled government had been established by Henrietta than in any other part of the country, and here she had promoted a trade with France for tin, which has been quoted as a proof of her practical abilities. When the fortunes of Charles I became still more and more disastrous, the young Prince of Wales was withdrawn to Skilly, afterwards to Jersey, Finally, he took shelter on the opposite coast, September 18, 1646, and joined his royal mother at Paris. From thence the mother and son were invited by the Queen Regent of France to visit her and the little king, Louis Fourteenth at Fontainebleau, and their reception is thus described by an eyewitness. The Queen Regent and the little king of France came to meet their royal guests and receive them into their coach. When they alighted, Louis the Fourteenth gave his hand to his aunt, the Queen of Great Britain, and the Prince of Wales led the Queen of France. 
the next day the prince of wales came to her drawing-room where she appointed him a fontille as concerted with his mother queen henrietta but when his mother afterwards entered the apartment it was etiquette for the prince only to occupy a joint stool in her presence as queen of great britain he therefore rose from the armchair and took his place in the circle where he remained standing during the audience very similar does it seem that these royal exiles were employing their thoughts and occupying their time with arrangements of precedence between joint stools and armchairs yet so it was till henrietta maria was a refugee in france it appears that she disliked such pompous trifles as much as did her mighty sire henri cotte and never exacted them in her private intercourse with her friends we see how utterly free her letters are from cold ceremony but when under the protection of her munificent spanish sister-in-law anne of austria she was forced to take the heavy chain of etiquette on her neck more than ever or run the risk of giving offence every moment by breaking those little incomprehensible laws by which an observer of ceremonies governs every movement of those domesticated with them it seems to have been anne of austria's favorite manner of testifying her hospitality and consideration for her guests and proteges to offer them precedence to herself and her sons on every occasion of course it was but good manners in the royal guest to protest against such precedence and distinction thus was time tediously spent in ceremonials idle and absurd and the worst was that an elaborate example was set for such follies to the bystanding courtiers from whom it spread all over europe a scene of this kind occurred soon after the arrival of the prince of wales at the french court madame de motteville says that at the betrothal of the mademoiselle de tamines with the marquis de Cuvet, queen henrietta who was among the guests at this festival was given by the royal family of france the precedence in signing the marriage articles which she did not do till after all the civilities and resistances required on such occasions had been carried to the utmost then the queen regent of france anne of austria signed and the minor king louis the fourteenth then charles prince of wales and then monsieur that is gaston duke of orleans because the veritable monsieur philippe duke of anjou was too little to sign not being able to write madame de motteville proceeds to declare that the young king of france seldom took precedence of charles prince of wales when they met at court or when they danced the branle or brawl without great apology the two queens had so arranged the ceremonial that these representatives of the two greatest kingdoms in the world were either accommodated with equal joint stools in their royal presences or stood in the courtly circle the following sketch of charles in his youth then about sixteen was drawn from the life this prince was very well shaped his brown complexion agreed well enough with his large bright black eyes though his mouth was exceedingly ugly but his figure was surpassingly fine he was very tall for his age and carried himself with grace and dignity his natural tendency to wit and repartee was not noticed for at that time of his life he hesitated and even stammered a defect observed in his father charles i and still more seriously in his uncle louis the thirteenth this defect was nevertheless no fault of the organs of utterance as madame de motteville supposes for the prince's tongue was glib enough in his own language but was owing to his great difficulty in pronouncing french a proof that his mother had not accustomed herself to talk to her children in her native language for a year or two after his arrival in france we shall find that the young prince was forced to remain nearly a mute for want of words end of section nine section ten of the lives of the queens of england volume eight by agnes and elizabeth strickland this librivox recording is in the public domain henrietta maria chapter three part two queen henrietta manifested at an early period of her sojourn in france an extreme desire to unite her niece mademoiselle de montpensier to her son the prince of wales mademoiselle de montpensier was not only of suitable rank being the first princess in france the daughter of the favorite brother of henrietta but likewise the greatest heiress in europe her portraits at versailles and you 
show that she had no little beauty, and her memoirs, that she had wit sufficient to encourage her in her vanity and presumption. Gaston of Orléans, father of this fantastic royal beauty, was poor, considering his high rank as the first prince of the blood. All his first wife's vast possessions, as heiress of Montpensier and Dombé, had passed to his daughter, and he was often dependent on her for funds, when she was a very young woman, and this position inflated her intolerable self-esteem. She took pleasure in mortifying her aunt, Queen Henrietta, whenever she opened the subject of her union with the Prince of Wales. It is evident that she suspected him of indifference to her charms and advantages, for she never mentions the matter without apparent pique. Although I had, she observes, been sufficiently informed of the wishes of my aunt, the Queen of England, when we were together at Fontainebleau, yet I seem not to give the slightest credence to a second declaration the Prince of Wales made me through Madame de Bernon, who was the friend of the English royal family. The first offer of the Prince of Wales, as I said, was made me by the Queen his mother. I really know not, if he had spoken himself, whether he might have succeeded, but I am sure I could not set great account on what I was told in behalf of a lover who had nothing to say for himself. Afterwards she consoles her pride by the reflection that young Charles had nothing to say for himself because he could not utter an intelligible sentence in French, yet she considered that he ought to have obtained proficiency on purpose. Thus La Grande Mademoiselle remained indignant that he only courted her through the agency of the tender and flattering speeches made by his royal mother. I noted nevertheless, says the literary princess, that whenever I went to see Queen Henrietta, her son always placed himself near me. He always led me to my coach. Nothing could induce him to put on his hat in my presence. He never put it on till I quitted him, and his regard for me manifested itself a hundred ways in little matters. One day, when I was going to a grand assembly, given by Madame de Quassy, the Queen of England would dress me and arrange my hair herself. She came to this purpose to my apartments, and took the utmost pains to set me off to the best advantage, and the Prince of Wales held the flambeau near me to light my toilette the whole time. What an extraordinary historical group here presents itself! The artists of the day could draw nothing but the fond subject of Venus, attired by the graces. Here, to the mind's eye, rises the elegant figure of the royal Henrietta, dressing her beautiful and spiritual niece then in the first splendor of her charms, and in contrast to their beauty was the dark Spanish-looking boy, standing by with the flambeau. First cousins, it is true, have privileges. Charles was not more than fifteen, but yet too old for an attendant Cupidon. I wore black, white, and carnation, pursues this literary princess. My paru of precious stones was fastened by ribbons of these colors, I wore also a plume of the same kind. All had been fancied and ordered by my aunt, the Queen of England, the Queen Regent, that is Anne of Austria, who knew by whose hands I was adorned, sent for me to come to her before I went to the ball. Therefore the Prince of Wales had an opportunity of arriving at the Hotel de Quasi before me, and I found him there at the Porte Cochers, ready to hand me from my coach. I stopped in a chamber to readjust my hair at a mirror, and the Prince of Wales again held the flambeau for me, and this time he brought his cousin, Prince Robert, or Rupert, as an interpreter between us, for believe it who will, though he could understand every word I said to him, he could not reply to me the least sentence in French. When the ball was finished, we retired. The Prince of Wales followed me to the porter's lodge of my hotel, and lingered till I entered, and then went his way. His gallantry was pushed so far, that it made a great noise in the world that winter, and was much manifested at a fete, celebrated at the Palais Royal, where there was played a magnificent Italian comedy, embellished with machinery and music, followed by a ball. And again my aunt, the Queen of England, would dress me with her own hands. It had taken three entire days to arrange my ornaments, my robe was all figured with diamonds, with carnation trimmings. I wore the jewels of the crown of France, and to add to them, the Queen of England lent me some very fine ones, which at that time she had not yet sold. She said not a little on the fine turn of my shape, my good mien, my fairness, the brightness of my light hair. 
She was placed on a throne in the middle of the ballroom, and the young King of France and the Prince of Wales seated themselves at her feet. I felt not the least embarrassment, as this modest damsel. But as I had an idea of marrying the Emperor, I regarded the Prince of Wales as an object of pity. In the course of this egotist memoirs, she marks with contempt the increasing poverty of her aunt, Queen Henrietta, the plainness of her attire, the humility of her equipage, as she gradually parted with every diamond and glittering thing, the remnants of her former splendor, which, together with the liberal allowance she derived from the French government, she sacrificed to her conjugal affection. As the fortunes of her royal lord grew darker and darker, Queen Henrietta was induced to persuade him to abandon the Episcopal Church in England in hopes of restoration and peace. The agents who undertook to inform the king of her wishes in this matter certainly gave him great pain and displeasure. These were Belvier, the French ambassador, who arrived at Newcastle in 1646 on this errand from his court, and Sir William Devenant, who was sent by the queen direct from Paris to tell the king that all his friends there advised his compliance. The king observed that he had no friends there who knew aught of the subject. There is Lord German, replied Devenant. German knows nothing of ecclesiastical affairs, said the king. Lord Culpepper is of the same opinion. Culpepper has no religion whatever, returned the king. What does Hyde think of it? We do not know, please your majesty, answered Devenant. The chancellor has forsaken the prince, having remained in Jersey instead of accompanying him to the queen, and her majesty is much offended with him. My wife is in the wrong. Hyde is an honest man, who will never forsake me or the church, rejoined the king. I wish he were with my son. Devenant proceeded to mention that the queen had resolved, if her opinion was not taken, to retire into a convent and never to see the king again. An intimation which gave the severest pangs to the heart of her husband, who drove the negotiator from his presence, which he never permitted him to enter again. The king remonstrated with the queen on her avowed intention of deserting him, which she passionately denied and it is supposed that Devenant had dared to threaten the king with some of the idle gossip he had gathered in Her Majesty's household in Paris. Notwithstanding this sharp trial of his dearest affections, Charles stood firm, and the church owes the preservation of the remainder of her property to his honesty and justice, and the grand object of the rebels of dividing her spoils among the strongest, and devouring them like the abbey lands, met with no legal sanction. The vast access of despotism attained by Henry the Eighth in a similar case seems to have offered no inducements to Charles I. Had he really been a tyrant, would he not have followed such an example with impunity, and taken the opportunity not only of relieving his pecuniary distress, but of throwing rich sops to the new set of upstarts greedy for prey? No part of the sad pilgrimage of the unfortunate monarch was more afflicting to him than his sojourn at Newcastle, yet the great body of the people always treated him with respect and affection. A little circumstance that occurred to him, when at church in that town, he often repeated with pleasure. In the course of the service, the clerk gave out a psalm, chosen with a facetious tendency. Why boastest thou, thou tyrant, thy wicked works abroad? The king arose and forbade it, and gave out the commencement of the 46th psalm. Have mercy, Lord, on me, for men would me devour. The whole congregation joined with the head of the church in his amendment, and sang the psalm, which is indeed the most applicable in his case. In the course of the year 1646, the queen had the pleasure of welcoming to her arms her little daughter, Henrietta, whom she had left an infant of but a fortnight old at Exeter. The escape of the babe from the power of the parliament was effected by Lady Morton, her governess. This young lady was one of the beautiful race of Villiers, a great favorite of the queen, whose favor she certainly deserved by her courageous fidelity, both in attending her to Exeter in the worst of her troubles, taking care of her infant, and ultimately bringing it safely to her. Lady Morton had been permitted by the parliamentary army to retire with the infant princess from Exeter to the nursery palace at Oatlands. 
the year after when all royal expenses were cashiered and the parliament meditated taking the child to transfer it with his brothers and sisters to the custody of the earl and countess of northumberland lady morton resolved only to surrender this little one to the queen from whom she had received her Pere cyprian gamache who was afterwards the tutor of the princess details the story of the escape and the simple man seems to believe in his enthusiasm that providence had ordained all the troubles of king charles in order that his youngest daughter might be brought up a roman catholic queen henrietta he says separated from her husband and children living in loneliness of heart at the louvre had thought intensely of this babe and earnestly desiring her restoration had vowed that if she was ever reunited to her that she would rear her in her own religion can a mother forget her child repeats pere gamache a hundred times each day did the thoughts of the bereaved queen recur to her little infant as many times did her prayers accompanied with maternal tears ask her of god nor did he refuse the just request in fact it was clearly his will that the infant should be restored to the mother and in bringing it to pass he caused feminine weakness to triumph over all the powers of the english parliament his goodness inspired the countess of morton to divest herself of her rich robes and noble ornaments to assume the garb of poverty and disguise herself as the wife of a poor french servant little better than a beggar she likewise dressed the infant princess in rags like a beggar boy and called her pierre that name being somewhat like the sound by which the little creature meant to call herself princess if she was asked her name lady morton was tall and elegantly formed and it was no easy matter to disguise the noble air and graceful port of the villiers beauty she however fitted herself a hump with a bundle of linen she walked with the little princess on her back in this disguise nearly to dover giving out that she was her little boy subsequently lady morton declared that she was at the same time alarmed and amused at the indignation of the royal infant at her rags and mean appearance and at the pertinacity with which she strove to inform every person she passed on the road that she was not a beggar boy and pierre but the little princess fortunately for the infant henrietta no one understood her babblings but her affectionate guardian lady morton had arranged all things so judiciously that she crossed the sea from dover to calais in the common packet boat without awakening the least suspicion when once on the french territory the royal child was no longer pierre but princess and lady morton made the best of her way to the queen at paris oh the joy of that meeting exclaims pere cyprian oh the consolation to the heart of the mother when her little one who was lost was found again how many times we saw her clasp her round the neck kiss her and kiss her over again the queen called this princess the child of benediction and resolved to rear her in the roman catholic faith in fact as soon as the first sparks of reason began to appear in the mind of this precious child her majesty honored me by the command of instructing her lady morton's successful adventure caused a great deal of conversation at paris and edmund waller who had previously celebrated her as a leading beauty at the court of england made her the heroine of another poem in which he lauded her fidelity to her royal mistress in one of his couplets which we do not quote as the best of his strains he alludes to lady morton's stratagem thus the faultless nymph changing her faultless shape becomes unhandsome handsomely to scape this poem was presented to queen henrietta maria at the louvre on new year's day sixteen forty seven the little princess who was born in so much peril and preserved amidst adventures more romantic than any invented by writers of fiction was received by her royal mother as a consolation sent by heaven for her troubles the mother and child thus wonderfully reunited were never separated for any length of time again the sad queen seems to have centered her warmest maternal affection in this youngest and fairest of her offspring the parliamentary war broke out in paris in the first days of the year sixteen forty eight it is well known in history as the war of the fronde it raged for about eighteen months henrietta maria enlightened by sad experience thus early in the struggle warned her sister-in-law how to avert the coming storm 
Few persons, however, take any warning, except by their own personal suffering, and the War of the Fronde, which broke out on the 7th of January, 1648, with a stormy meeting of the merchants of Paris, to resist a heavy illegal house tax, had assumed a very alarming character in the course of that spring. The people took advantage of the minority of the king, the discontents of the princes of the blood, and the successes of the English parliament, in a far worse cause, to demand rights which had been gradually extinguished since the death of their beloved Henri Cot. Henrietta Maria took a just and sensible view of the grievances of her native country, a view well becoming of her father's daughter. She subsequently employed her influence in negotiating a peace with the princes of the House of Condé, who were the leaders of the popular party. While this national convulsion was progressing towards its crisis, Henrietta Maria resided either at the Louvre or at Saint-Germain. She continued to be highly respected by the French court. She was invited to stand godmother to the petit monsieur of France, who was given the name of Philippe at his confirmation on the 11th of May, 1648. Two or three days afterwards, the news arrived that her second son, James, Duke of York, had made his escape from his imprisonment at St. James's Palace by one of those romantic series of adventures which seemed to pertain to every sovereign who bore the name of Stuart. The Queen had written to him from France, charging him to effect his escape, if possible. But this design was suspected by the authorities, paramount in the kingdom, and his governor was threatened with committal to the tower, if he were detected in any such design. In one of those interviews, with his royal father, which were sometimes permitted, the young prince obtained the consent and approbation of his majesty. He retained the secret closely in his own bosom for an entire year, without finding an opportunity of confiding it to anyone, but as he declared, the idea never left him night or day. The queen was in constant correspondence with agents in England to effect the escape of James. The chief difficulty was that he had given a promise to the Earl of Northumberland that he would not receive any letters whatsoever without his knowledge. So strictly did the young boy keep his promise that as he was going into the tennis court in St. James's Palace, a person, whom he knew to be perfectly faithful, offered to slip a letter into his hand, saying softly to him, It is from the queen. James answered, I must keep my promise, and for that reason I cannot receive it. As he spoke thus, he passed onward, so that no notice was taken of the colloquy. This incident was told to the queen at Paris, who was much displeased, and said angrily, What can James mean by refusing a letter from me? He afterwards explained to her in Paris that his boyish honor was pledged, and the queen declared that she was satisfied. For the present, the royal boy remained on board that portion of the English fleet, which had forsaken Cromwell, and taken refuge at Helvoetsluys. He hoisted his flag there as Lord Admiral, and as the English sailors were much encouraged by his presence, Queen Henrietta gave him leave to continue on board, and his brother, the Prince of Wales, prepared to leave France to join him there. In this year, observes Madame de Motteville, a terrible star reigned against kings. On the 14th of July, 1648, Mademoiselle de Beaumont and I went to see the Queen Henrietta, who had retired to the convent of the Carmelites in order to compose her mind after the anguish she had endured in parting with her son, the Prince of Wales, who had departed to take the command of the English ships, which were at the time lying at Helvoetsluys. We found the queen alone in a little chamber, writing and closing up dispatches, which she assured us, after she had finished them, were of the greatest importance. She then communicated to us the great apprehensions she felt regarding the success of her son's undertaking. She confided to us her present state of pecuniary distress, which originated in the destitution of the queen regent of France, the civil war of the Fronde, having disorganized all the resources of government. Queen Henrietta showed us a little gold cup, out of which she drank, and protested that she had not another piece of gold, coin or otherwise, in her possession. She told us with tears, that her misery in parting with her son was much aggravated by the fact that all his people came to her, demanding payment of their salaries, and had told her at his departure, that if she could not pay them, they must quit his service, but, she added, 
that she had the grief of finding it impossible to relieve their wants, knowing at the same time how real they were. Queen Henrietta then mentioned with anguish, how much worse the officers of her mother had behaved when that queen was resident at the beginning of the civil war in England, and thus did justice to the superior manliness and endurance of the English cavaliers, with whom, nevertheless, she was the most unpopular woman in the world. We could not but marvel, continued Madame de Motteville, at the evil influence which dominated at this juncture over the crowned heads who were then the victims of the parliaments of France and of England, though ours was, thanks to God, very different to the other in their intentions, and different also in their effects, yet to all appearances, the future lowered dark enough. During the dreadful days of the first battle of the barricades, and that of the gate of St. Antony, Henrietta came from her peaceful residence at Saint-Germain's, and sojourned with her royal sister-in-law at Paris, sharing her hopes and fears, and supporting her by her presence. As yet, she had not herself lost all hope of the restoration of the king, her husband. The time now drew near that was to show how dismally that hope was to be blighted. It was at the alarming juncture, when the royal family of France were finally driven from Paris by the Fronde, that Queen Henrietta courageously exchanged her residence at saint germains en Lay for the Louvre. Her niece, Mademoiselle de Montpensier, marks this fact, and observes, it was when the Prince of Wales went to Holland. This was in the summer of 1648. Public affairs assumed at this period so dangerous an aspect in Paris, that the regent queen, Anne of Austria, thought it best to strengthen herself in the chateau of saint germains Modern policy has been wholly regardless of the commanding station of that fortress, but it is formed by nature, and in ancient times was ever used as a bridle on Paris. Its bold range of cliffs, following the windings of the Seine in front, its flank guarded by a dense forest of thirty miles, might be forgotten by the Bourbons in the 18th and 19th centuries, but not by the warriors who could remember the wars of Henri Cotte. When at Saint-Germain's, observed Marie de Medici to Bazin Pierre. I seem to have one foot in Paris. In fact, Anne of Austria and her court retired to this fortified ridge, which those familiar with the scene are aware, commands a view of one long arm of Paris. The royal army occupied the plain below, between the metropolis and the Seine. Queen Henrietta, who was much beloved by the Condé family, and had a great influence with them, came to the Louvre for the real purpose of undertaking the office of mediatrix between the people and the regent queen, an office which, after many troubles and deprivations, she subsequently successfully accomplished. Much was, however, to be done and suffered before either party would listen to the suggestions of peace and reason, and to the representations of Henrietta's dearly bought experience. The siege of Paris and the war of the Fronde darkened the close of the year 1648. Henrietta was beleaguered in the Louvre by the Parisian faction of the Frondeurs, and Paris was at the same time besieged by the Queen Regent, her sister-in-law, from saint germains en laye Queen Henrietta passed the inclement and dismal Christmas of 1648 with a reduced household, shut up in the vast edifice of the Louvre, her thoughts divided between the civil war around her and the distant and darker prospect of affairs in England. The besieged state of Paris often obstructed the passage of the couriers who brought her dispatches from her unfortunate husband, and thus her misery was tantalized by suspense. Cardinal de Retz, the principal leader of the Fronde, paid a visit of inquiry on the 6th of January, to learn what had become of the desolate Queen of England, after a series of furious skirmishes and slaughters, which had convulsed Paris during the days immediately preceding the 6th of January. It was well that he had not forgotten her, for her last loaf was eaten, and her last faggot had been consumed, and she was destitute of the means of purchasing more. The cardinal, who was one of the leading spirits of his age, was a friend of the queen. He found her without any fire, though the snow was falling dismally. She was sitting by the bedside of her little daughter, the princess Henrietta. It was noon, but the child was still in bed. You find me, said the queen calmly, keeping company with my Henrietta. I would not let the poor child rise today, for we have no fire. 
The princess was but four years old when she was thus sharing with her mother the extremes of destitution. The cardinal sent Queen Henrietta assistance immediately from his own resources, which she accepted thankfully. The same day he flew to the Parliament of Paris, with which he was all-powerful, and represented, with a burst of passionate eloquence, the dire distress to which the daughter of their Henri caught was reduced. They instantly voted her a subsidy of 20,000 livres. What was the occupation of the sad queen in her desolate watch by her little child? The date of the following letter, long hid among the archives of Russia, most touchingly proves. What pathos in a date, exclaims one of our poets. We find it so, indeed, in many a historical coincidence. On this 6th of January, when the providential visit of de Retz possibly saved Queen Henrietta and her little one from perishing by destitution, she had received the heart-rending tidings that the military terrorists in London were about to institute a tribunal to sentence the king, her husband, and her occupation on that eventful day was writing the following letter to the French ambassador in London, Count de Grignan, entreating to be permitted to come to London and share her husband's destiny. Henrietta Maria to Monsieur de Grignan, ambassador from Louis the Thirteenth to England. Monsieur de Grignan, the state to which the king, my lord, finds himself reduced, will not let me expect to see him by the means he heretofore hoped. It is this that has brought me to the resolution of demanding of the two chambers, that is, both houses of parliament, and the general of their army, passports to go to see him in England. You will receive orders from Monsieur le Cardinal, that is, Mazarin, to do all that I entreat of you for this expedition, which will be to deliver the letters which I send you herewith, according to their address. I have specified nothing to the parliaments and to the general, but to give me the liberty to go see the king, my lord, and I refer them to you, to tell them all I would say more particularly. You must know, then, that you are to ask passports for me to go there, to stay as long as they will permit me, and to be at liberty all the time I may be there, and likewise all my people, in regard to whom it will be necessary to say that I will send a list of those that I wish shall attend me, in order that if there are any in the number of them that may be suspected or obnoxious, they may be left behind. There are letters for the speakers of both houses, and for the general Fairfax. You will see all these persons, and let me know in what manner they receive the matter, and how you will find them disposed to satisfy this wish. I dare not promise myself that they will accord me the liberty of going. I wish it too much to assure myself of it, at a time when so little of what I desire succeeds. But if by your negotiation these passports can be obtained, I shall deem myself obliged to you all my life, as I shall, whatever may happen, for all the care you have taken, of which make no doubt. I shall add no more, except to assure you that I am, Monsieur de Grignan, most truly, your very good friend, Henriette Maria R. From the Louvre, this 6th of January, 1649. About the same time, probably on the same day, she wrote to her husband, by one Wheeler, an agent of Major Boswell, expressing her deep sense of sorrow for his condition, adding, that with all his afflictions she bears an equal share, and that she wished to die for him, or at least with him, nor can she live without hopes of being restored to him, for whom she hath done, and will do her utmost in all possible ways, and still trusts to help him. She likewise wrote a letter endorsed, To your trusty and well-beloved Thomas, Lord Fairfax, General, desiring his assistance, that she might see the king, her husband, before he be proceeded against by any trial, and to have a pass for her secure coming and returning. Which letter was delivered by the French ambassador to General Fairfax, and being sent by him to the House of Commons, was thrown aside, with the mere remark that the House had, in 1643, voted Her Majesty guilty of high treason. Before Henrietta accepted the aid of the Parliament of Paris, she had sent an account of her extreme destitution to the Queen Regent of France, then at Saint-Germain, and craved some present relief, in order to procure food for herself and her servants. Anne of Austria answered, that the destitution was equal in her own household, for neither she nor the king had a sou, 
and that she had neither credit to obtain a dinner or a gown. Sometimes, when Paris was more than usually tumultuous, the household servants of Queen Henrietta, who had dispersed themselves in various directions in search of food, rallied round her, either to protect her or to be protected by the defenses of the Louvre, and sometimes the royalist nobility, left in the French metropolis, came thither for shelter. Madame de Motteville had frequent interviews with the queen on these occasions. Hither, exclaims this writer, with eloquence, which draws its grandeur from the power of truth. Hither should the great of the earth have come, they who deem themselves destined to a permanent puissance, they who imagine their magnificence, their pleasures, and their apparent glory will never cease. Here they should have come to meditate, and to be undeceived in their false opinions. The destitution of this royal lady was distressing, was afflicting enough, yet she told me it was light, in comparison with the apprehension that laid on her heart, of the calamity which was to come. But it was the will of God that she should feel the difference between the greatest prosperity and the greatest misery that can happen in this life. It may be truly said that she experienced these two states in their extremes. Yet the queen's ever sanguine temperament gave a certain buoyancy to her manners in the daytime. It was in the silent watches of the night that her full heart was relieved by tears. The English newspapers of the day contrived, notwithstanding the siege of Paris, to obtain accurate knowledge of the real state of her feelings. The queen, they said, is returned from her devotions in the house of the Carmelites, where she hath been for divers days. She seems not dejected at the state of her husband in England, yet her ladies declare that her knights are more sad than usual. A dead pause and cessation of intelligence had occurred since Queen Henrietta had dispatched to London the letters that had been recently quoted. No information whatsoever of all that was going on there had reached her during the principal part of January and February, 1649. The civil strife in and around Paris had stopped the access of all couriers and letters to the Louvre. In this agonizing state of suspense, we must leave our queen, and trace the consummation of that great tragedy in England, the dim forebodings of which, she said, so heavily oppressed her heart. End of section 10. Section 11 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 8, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Henrietta Maria, Chapter 3, Part 3. To give the personal history of Charles I, during the four years through which he suffered and struggled, after his sad separation from the partner of his heart, would far exceed our limits. The plan of this biography of his queen must be the exact reverse of the histories of his reign, which cleave to Charles, and scarcely condescend to note what became of Henrietta. On the contrary, we have but given glimpses, through the loopholes of her correspondence, of the long series of battles, lost or won, persecutions and imprisonments, which led her monarch to a violent death. Charles I had escaped more than once from his enemies, yet nothing could induce him to show to the French the piteous and degrading sight of a king of Great Britain as a suppliant in France. It has been noted that it was his conviction, from an early period in the struggle, that the rebels meant to shed his blood, yet he preferred enduring the worst cruelties that they could find in their hearts to inflict on him, rather than abandon his country. Charles was right. Yet his daily life in England presented few enviable moments. When all was done that man could do, and all was done in vain. He passed his time either as a fugitive or a prisoner. One of his old cavaliers has described him, after the Battle of Naseby, wandering without a place where to rest his head. Often he dined, at a very poor man's house, on the charity of one of his lowliest subjects, who perhaps needed money more than the Scotch Calvinists who sold him to his enemies. Again the observation is forced upon us that never was a Stuart betrayed by one of the lower classes. Sometimes the unfortunate monarch starved, sometimes the entry in the journal is, dinner in the field. No dinner is the entry for several successive days. Another, Sunday, no dinner, supper at Worcester, a cruel day. The king himself, writing to Nicholas, 
mentions receiving a letter from the queen when marching over broadway hills in worcestershire he mentions it as if he were too much harassed in mind and body to note well its contents this seems to have been the march mentioned in the Eiter Carolinum as the long march that lasted from six in the morning till midnight. Once it is noted that his majesty lay in the field all night at Bokenock Down. Again, his majesty had his meat and drink dressed at a very poor widow's. Sir Henry Slingsby declares that when the king and his tired attendants were wandering among the mountains of Wales, he was glad to sup on a pullet and some cheese. The good wife who ministered to his wants, having but one cheese, and the king's attendants being importunate in their hunger. She came in and carried it off from the royal table. Charles was too true a soldier to repine at this incident. He was glad that his faithful followers had withal to satisfy their famine, though with homely viands. For, said he, my rebel subjects have not left enough from my revenue to keep us from starving. One Rosewell, a dissenting minister, when a boy, by accident beheld the fugitive king, sitting with his attendants, resting under the shelter of a tree in a lonely field. The canopy was not very costly, but from the demeanor of the monarch, the beholder received the most reverential idea of his majesty. Rosewell had been bred an enemy, yet he did not find majesty a jest divested of its externals. He never forgot the personal elegance, the manly beauty of Charles, the grace reflected from a highly cultivated mind, which gave him as kingly an air under one of England's broad oaks as beneath a golden canopy at Whitehall. Often the king rode hard through the night and saw the break of day, which only recalled the wearied fugitive to the anxious cares of a retreat or a pursuit. Once, late in the evening, he dismissed some loyal gentlemen to their homes with these pathetic words. Gentlemen, go you and take your rest. You have houses and homes and beds to lodge in and families to love and live with, but I have none. My horse is waiting for me to travel all night. The king often compared himself, in the words of the psalmist, to a partridge hunted on the mountains. In the beautiful and touching memorial of his afflictions, he has noted himself not only as destitute of the common necessaries of life, but as bereaved of his wife, his children, and his friends. But, said he, as God has given me afflictions to exercise my patience, so hath he given me patience to bear my afflictions. Such was the life led by the much-tried monarch towards the conclusion of the war. Wearied of this life of homeless sufferings and perils, the king threw himself on the generosity of the Scotch covenanters. They sold him to the English commons. It was represented to him that he might yet escape further into Scotland. He replied with a mournful smile, I think it were more respectable to go with those who have bought me than stay with those who have sold me. He added, I am ashamed that my price was so much higher than my saviour's. If Charles had taken refuge among the Highlanders in the loyal districts, Scotland had never groaned under the bitter reproach of this transaction. There was little to choose between the honor of the Covenanters and the Roundheads. The Roundhead army dragged their king a prisoner in their marches until he finally rested at Hampton Court, where he had a short breathing time, while the army and commons manifested some jealousy which should possess him. Here Cromwell paid deceitful court to him, but it is evident from every word the king said to his real friends, or wrote in the Icon Basilicu, that he looked forward to nothing but a violent death. Such were his intimations in the last interview he had with Sir Richard and Lady Fanshawe. Oh, the beautiful, the touching memorials which that admirable woman has left of her conjugal love to the noblest of mankind, her own beloved cavalier, Sir Richard Fanshawe. Next to her husband, her suffering monarch and his queen were the objects of Lady Fanshawe's affection and veneration. She risked and suffered much to carry to the queen a message from King Charles. An interview occurred between him, Sir Richard, and Lady Fanshawe, which few can read in her words of sweet simplicity without being moved. It was during the king's melancholy sojourn at Hampton Court in the autumn of 1647. The reader must be reminded that the writer was the wife and daughter of the king's familiar friends with whom he had been intimate from his youth upwards. 
I went three times to pay my duty to his majesty, both as I was the daughter of his servant and the wife of his servant. The last time I ever saw him, I could not refrain from weeping. He kissed me when we took our leave of him, and I, with streaming eyes, prayed aloud to God to preserve his majesty with a long and happy life. The king patted me on the cheek and said impressively, child if god willeth it shall be so but you and i must submit to god's will and you know what hands i am in then turning to my husband sir richard fanshawe he said be sure dick to tell my son all i have said and deliver these letters to my wife i pray god to bless her and preserve her and all will be well then taking my husband in his arms he said thou hast ever been an honest man I hope God will bless thee and make thee a happy servant to my son. Thus did we part from that benign light, which was extinguished soon after, to the grief of all Christians, not forsaken of their God. During the detention of the king at Carisbrook Castle in the year 1648, a strong reaction had taken place in his behalf among all ranks and conditions of his people, who after six years of war, famine and enormous taxation, had woefully drawn comparisons between the economical expenditure of their king and that of the rapacious democrats the whole of charles i's annual expenditure reckoning even the disputed item of ship money was within one annual million of pounds the expenditure voted by parliament to oppose him could not have been less than ten millions annually the price of wheat during three years of the struggle amounted to the famine price of four pounds per quarter the intense sufferings of the poor may be imagined when the relative value of money is calculated. Moreover, the kings of Mary England in the olden time only required their dues from men who had something. The grand secret how to wring money from men who were worth nothing but the clothes they wore and the food they consumed, how to pinch a tax out of the poor man's candle, his modicum of salt, his brewing of malt, the leather that kept his feet from the cold, was first discovered by the political economists of the Roundhead Parliament. Neither the king, the nobles, the bishops of England, instituted the excise taxes. Revolutionists did this deed. And what was far worse than their abstraction of the enormous masses of money they gained, these vexatious exactions created numberless new crimes. It was a virtuous action in the reign of Charles I, for an industrious cottager to make her own candles, or for her husband, to malt and brew his own barley. Under the commonwealth, and still more in the protectorate, it subjected them to the inquisitorial inspections from a new race of petty placemen, and converted good into evil, household duties into crimes. The king, the ancient nobility, and the bishops were not the only victims of the roundheads, but the poor suffered with them in a manner never before experienced." It will scarcely excite wonder that towards the close of the year 1648, the whole population, excepting those who were sharing among themselves the produce of this taxation, should be extremely desirous of peace. But when a majority in the House of Commons was found in favor of pacification with the king, Cromwell sent Colonel Pride with a body of troopers who seized those members of Parliament as they came into the House, who voted for peace, and thrust them into a dungeon of the ancient palace of Westminster, called Hell. Thus were forty of them incarcerated, and one hundred and sixty expelled. Whenever a majority was found in favor of the king, the same violence was repeated. Two alarming revolts in favor of the king, one in London and the other in its vicinity, had just been crushed with unsparing bloodshed. Such was the state of the metropolis when Charles I was dragged to die in it. The first movement towards the accomplishment of this tragedy took place November 30th, 1648. The king was seated at dinner in the hall of Carisbrook Castle, where, according to the ancient customs of an English monarch, the public were permitted to see him at meals. On that fatal day, a cadaverous-looking gaunt man, whose military vocation was indicated by his spanner or belt, and scarf, entered, and placing himself opposite to his majesty, continued to regard him in grim funereal silence all dinner time. The king's few faithful servants, who were waiting on him, whispered together that he certainly was one of the ill spirits of the army. 
After the king rose from table, one of his attendants broke the ominous silence of the gaunt stranger by asking him to eat. After the wretch had fed, he vouchsafed to growl out, as if he had indeed been an evil spirit. I am come to fetch away Hammond tonight. Hammond was the governor, who considered himself responsible for the king's safety, to the House of Commons, and was therefore obnoxious to the army. The grim man was that Colonel Isaac Ewer, whose name appears on the king's death warrant. The king's faithful servants, among others a gallant cavalier, called Ned Cook, entreated him to fly, telling him a boat was ready on the beach. The king, who knew not the open warfare between the army and the House of Commons, said, I have passed my word to Hammond and the house. I will not be the first to break my promise. Escape, in fact, was scarcely possible. Two regiments were landing from Southampton, of which the grim colonel had been the precursor. A cordon of soldiers encircled Carisbrook Castle as night drew on. At daybreak, there was a loud knocking at the outer door of the royal chamber. The Duke of Richmond, the king's attached kinsman, who slept there, rose and asked who was there. Officers with a message from the army, was the answer. Several roundhead officers rushed in, and abruptly told the king they came to remove him. To what place? asked the king. To the castle, answered Colonel Cobbett. The castle is no castle, replied the king. I am prepared for any castle, but tell me the name. Hurst Castle, was the answer. Indeed, you could not have named a worse. Hearst Castle was a desolate blockhouse, projecting into the sea, at high tides, scarcely connected with the Isle of Wight. The king's coach was drawn out, he entered it. Major Rolfe, one of the garrison at Carisbrook, suspected of tampering with the king's life, endeavored to follow him. The king placed his foot to hinder his entrance, and pushed the armed ruffian back, saying very coolly, Go you out, we are not yet come to that. He called his grooms of the chamber, Harrington, the author of the Oceana, who had been placed about him by the Parliament, and his own faithful Herbert. The ruffian whom he had repulsed mounted the king's led horse, and rode by the side of the carriage, abusing him all the way. The king amused himself by making Herbert and Harrington guess to what place they were going. Nothing could be more dismal than Hearst Castle. This lonesome spot, jutting out into the ocean, and severed from all concern with human life, seemed a suitable scene for some murder, such as the king had received intelligence was meditating against him. The room, or rather den, in which he was immured, was so dark that candles were needed at noonday. Nevertheless, the king was not ill-treated by Cobbett, who reproved and displaced the original commander of the blockhouse for some blustering insolence at his majesty's first arrival. The deprivation felt most by Charles was the loss of the accomplished Harrington, in whose literary conversation he exceedingly delighted. The king's spirits had begun to droop with the monotony of this doleful, sea-girt fortress, when just three weeks after his arrival he was startled from his sleep by the rattling fall of the drawbridge. The faithful Herbert, now the solitary attendant of his royal master, stole forth to learn his fate. Whilst the king had been incarcerated at Hearst Castle, the last struggle between the Parliament and the army had taken place. The presence of the intended victim was needed, and Major Harrison was sent for him. The king had been warned against this man, who had talked in a wild way of assassinating him. Harrison seems to have been insane in the faculty of destructiveness. He had been bred a butcher by trade, and was remarkable for the homicides he had committed, since he had changed his vocation of killing beasts. His retribution had, however, already commenced, and he at times fancied that he was attended by a fearful specter, and dogged by following fiends. It was soon found that the errand of this homicide was to take the king to Windsor Castle. Charles, who could not imagine that any regicide was likely to be perpetrated in his ancient regal fortress, was glad to exchange the obscure den in which he was immured for such a dwelling. On the road thither at Winchester, and at every considerable town, his people of England came forth and invoked blessings on his royal head, and prayed aloud for his safety, despite of the terrors of his military escort. Tears, which his own misfortunes could not draw from his eyes, were seen on these occasions. Once he recognized a loyal gentleman, in deep mourning for Sir Charles Lucas, 
who with his gallant friend lyle had been executed by the command of Ayrton in defiance of the terms of capitulation at the recent surrender of colchester the king recognized the relative of his faithful friend he murmured to himself the names of lyle and lucas and then burst into a passion of tears the king passed one month at his royal castle in comparative serenity of mind he heard from time to time of the preparation of a court to try him but the absurdity of an attempt at legality after the violence offered to the freedom of the house of commons appeared preposterous to common sense murder the king expected but not the farce of judicature his heart yearned towards his wife and children he spoke of them incessantly and this was made a crime by the base hireling press cromwell's licenser or censor of the public press for he had provided himself with such a functionary whose office has been little known either before or since in great britain thus speaks of the captive monarch the king is cunningly merry though he hears of the parliament's proceedings against him he asked one who came from london how his young princess did he was answered that the princess elizabeth was very melancholy the king answered and well she may be when she hears the death of her old father is coming too we find his discourse very effeminate talking much of women thus were the domestic affections of the king discussed by a hireling who affected to cater news for the army while the king remained at windsor vast masses of military were drawn nearer and nearer to the metropolis and in and about it till as the venetian ambassador wrote london seemed as if it were besieged within and without the troopers with which it swarmed were quartered and stabled in westminster abbey and other desecrated places of worship where they duly exercised their destructiveness in their hours of recreation when the iron yoke of military control was firmly fitted on the necks of the people cromwell the chief terrorist thought the time was fit for the presence of the captive king on the scene he was sent for to london january fifteenth sixteen forty eight to forty nine old style as the king left windsor castle his kinsman the duke of hamilton who was imprisoned there had by bribes and tears prevailed on his jailers to let him see his king once more he was accordingly brought out by his guards and the party intercepted the king in his path hamilton flung himself on his knees before him with the passionate exclamation of my dear dear master these were the only words he could utter i have indeed been a dear master to you replied the king with pathetic emphasis while he embraced his kinsman for the last time the king was guarded to london by colonel harrison and a large squadron of troopers who carried loaded pistols pointed at his carriage he was brought to st james's palace where for the first time he was entirely deprived of the usages of royalty his attendants were dispersed and he was left alone with his faithful herbert who fortunately was sufficiently literary to be the historian of his master's progress to his untimely tomb meantime the counsels of his persecutors were full of dissension and uncertainty further violent expulsions took place from the intimidated remnant who called themselves the house of commons until only sixty-nine members remained who thought themselves fitted for the task of king killing these were chiefly officers in the army yet even of these many found themselves mistaken in regard to the hardness of their hearts when they saw their king face to face and heard him speak many of the persons summoned as judges were neither members of parliament nor even lawyers at last after several consultations in the painted chamber it was agreed that while the tribunal sat the king was to be imprisoned in sir robert cotton's house which was part of the ancient structure of edward the confessor's palace that the chamber next the study in cotton house be the king's bedroom and the chamber before it be his dining-room that a guard of thirty officers and choice men be placed above stairs and that two of them be always in his bedchamber and other guards at all the avenues that the king be brought to his trial the lower way into westminster hall guarded by the body of halberdiers guards to be placed not only in and about westminster hall but on the leads and at all windows of the adjoining houses that look towards the hall that there be troopers on horseback all without the hall and that all back doors from the place called hell be stopped up 
the regicide junta was supported by ten companies of foot and squadrons of horse and yet seemed to sit in terror they met privately in the painted chamber january twentieth where they consulted how they were to answer the king's certain objections to their authority at last cromwell's purple face was seen to turn very pale he ran to the window where he saw the king advancing between two ranks of soldiers from cotton house here he is here he is exclaimed he with great animation the hour of the great affair approaches decide speedily what answer you will give him for he will immediately ask by what authority you pretend to judge him a deep silence ensued which was broken by the jocose destructive harry martin who it is supposed as a sneer uttered in the name of the commons assembled in parliament and of all the good people of england the mere sight of the scanty numbers of the commons with the army at the door choking every avenue of westminster hall offered forcible answers to the illegality of this arraignment but brute force is not obliged to be logical the procession of the regicides then took their way to westminster hall with sword and mace bradshaw a sergeant at law of no practice was their president as he was in some terror of an inbreak of the people he had caused his high crowned puritan hat to be lined with iron a precaution which seems to have been taken by the rest of the lawyers busy on this iniquitous work when all was ready and a large body of armed men were stationed on each side of the mock tribunal the great gate of westminster hall was set open and the populace rushed into the vacant spaces as spectators whilst the king was on his progress to westminster hall his anxious people crowded as near to his person as possible crying god save your majesty the soldiers beat them back with their partisans and some of the men in colonel axtell's regiment raised the cry of justice justice but as their commander was actively exerting himself among them bestowing on them vigorous canings the cry was somewhat ambiguous this furious regicide by the application of his cudgel elicited subsequently a cry from a few individuals of execution execution the king was conducted under the guard of colonel hacker and thirty-two officers his eyes were bright and powerful his features calm and composed but bore the traces of care and sorrow which had scattered early snows on the curls which clustered beneath his hat as he advanced he regarded the tribunal with a searching and severe regard and without removing his hat seated himself with his usual majesty of demeanor soon after he rose and looked around him his eyes earnestly dwelt on the armed force which was but a continuation of the vast masses crowding the avenues of westminster hall and overpowering the people with a quick eye and gesture says a contemporary print he turned himself about noting not only those who were on each side of the court but even the spectators who were in the hall a poet who was present wrote on the spot the following lines descriptive of his mien at this awful crisis not so majestic on thy throne of state on that but men here god's own angels wait in expectation whether hope or fear of life can move thee from thy kingly sphere the arraignment was opened by one cook an obscure lawyer who when he read that the king was indicted in the name of the commons assembled and the people of england his majesty interrupted him the lawyer read on the king then stretched out his cane and tapped him on the shoulder cook glared angrily round at that instant the gold head of the cane fell off and rolled on the floor to such acute tension were the nerves of every one present wound up but this petty incident made a great impression on the whole assembly even on the august victim but in every pause in every interruption the words god save your majesty god save the king resounded from the spectators as if meant for a choral response in the great drama angry requisitions for silence proceeded from the persons in power some vigorous bastinados were distributed together with a due portion of kicks and cuffs on the people by the military ruffians at the door accompanied by threats of murderous treatment then the voice of the regicide advocate was heard recommencing the arraignment the ominous document under terror of firelocks pointed against protesting voices was at last read through with no other comment than a smile or two of contempt from the king bradshaw then demanded his answer in his plea of guilty or not guilty 
as cromwell had anticipated the king denied the authority of the court though not the power observing in illustration that there were many illegal powers as those of highwaymen and bandits likewise that the house of commons had agreed to a treaty of peace with him when he was at carisbrook since which he had been hurried violently from place to place there is colonel cobbett continued the king ask him whether it was not by force that he brought me from the isle of wight where are the just privileges of a house of commons where are the lords i see none present to constitute an assembly of parliament and where is the king call you this bringing him to his parliament a dialogue of argument took place between the royal prisoner and bradshaw on the point of whether the monarchy of england was elective or not and when the man of law was worsted in the dispute he hastily adjourned the court the king was taken from the hall amidst the irrepressible cries of god bless your majesty god save you from your enemies such was the only part that the people of england took in the trial the king was brought before his self-appointed judges again and again when similar dialogues took place between him and bradshaw each day however brought an alarming desertion from the ranks of those who were supposed staunch to their bloody task twelve members on the first day refused to vote or assist in bringing the trial to a conclusion seven agitated days had passed away during which the king had appeared thrice before his self-constituted judges when on january twenty seventh alarmed by the defection of more than half of their numbers the regicides resolved to doom their victim without further mockery of justice and without producing their evidence indeed this evidence chiefly consisted of the depositions of witnesses who saw the king perform acts of personal valor in the field of his rallying broken regiments and leading them up to the charge thereby oft times redeeming the fortunes of a desperate field his valor at croptory bridge was not forgotten though turned against him these details however only proved that when devoted loyalists had arrayed themselves in his cause the king had shared their perils to the utmost with the determination of pronouncing the sentence on which they had previously agreed the king for the fourth time was brought before the remnant of the regicide junta bradshaw was robed in red a circumstance from which the king drew an intimation of the conclusion of the scene when the list of the members was read over but forty-nine of them answered with that miserable remnant the trial proceeded as the clerk read over the list when the name of fairfax occurred a voice cried not such a fool as to come here to-day when the name of cromwell was called the voice exclaimed oliver cromwell is a rogue and a traitor when bradshaw uttered the words that the king was called to answer by the people before the commons of england assembled in parliament it is false answered the voice not one quarter of them general attention was now turned towards the gallery for the voice was a female one and issued from among a group of masked ladies there a great disturbance took place and many symptoms of resistance among the populace at last the oaths and execrations of the ruffian commander axtol were heard above the uproar mixed with gross epithets against women to which he added the following command to his soldiers present your pieces fire fire into the box where she sits a dead silence ensued and a lady rose and quitted the gallery she was lady fairfax her husband was still in power the ruffian axtel dared not harm her this lofty protest against a public falsehood will remain as a glorious instance of female courage moral and personal till history shall be no more the earnest letter the queen had written entreating the parliament and army to permit her to share her royal husband's prison may be remembered it is known that she wrote to fairfax on the same subject the conduct of the general's wife was probably the result of henrietta's tender appeal when this extraordinary interruption was suppressed by force of arms another soon after arose among the regicides themselves bradshaw was proceeding to pass sentence on the king who demanded the whole of the members of the house of commons and the lords who were in england to be assembled to hear it when one of the regicides colonel downs rose in tears and in great agitation exclaimed have we hearts of stone are we men you will ruin us and yourself too whispered mr cawley one of the members pulling him down on one side while his friend colonel walton held him down on the other 
if i were to die for it said colonel downs no matter colonel exclaimed cromwell who sat just beneath him turning suddenly round are you mad can't you sit still no answered downs i cannot and i will not sit still then rising he declared that his conscience would not permit him to refuse the king's request i move that we adjourn to deliberate bradshaw complied probably lest downs passionate remorse should become infectious and the whole conclave retired the adjournment only proved convenient for the torment of cromwell's fury to be poured forth on the head of downs whom he brutally browbeat he was to use downs own expression full of storm he wants to save his old master exclaimed he but make an end of it and return to your duty colonel harvey supported downs endeavors but all they obtained was one half hour added to the king's agony end of section eleven section twelve of the lives of the queens of england volume eight by agnes and elizabeth strickland this librivox recording is in the public domain henrietta maria chapter three part four at the end of that time the dark conclave returned colonel axtell who was literally the whipper in of the military assisted by a few roundhead officers had marvelously exerted himself during the recess and by the means of kicks, cuffs, and his cudgel, had prevailed on the troopers to raise yells of, Justice! Justice! Execution! Execution! Mingled with the tumult were plainly heard the piteous prayers of the people of, God save the king! God keep him from his enemies! In the midst of the confusion, the sentence was passed, and the king, who in vain endeavored to remonstrate, was dragged away by the soldiers who surrounded him, as he was forced down the stairs, the grossest personal insults were offered him. Some of the troopers blew their tobacco smoke in his face. Some spit on him. All yelled in his ears, Justice! Execution! The real bitterness of death to a man of Charles I's exquisite sensitiveness in regard to his personal dignity must have occurred in that transit. The block, the axe, the scaffold, and all their ghastly adjuncts, could be met and were met with calmness the spittings and buffetings of a brutal mob were harder to be borne the king recovered his serenity before he arrived at the place where his sedan stood how could it be otherwise the voices of his affectionate people in earnest prayers for his deliverance rose high above the brutal tumult one soldier close to him echoed the cry of the people god help and save your majesty his commander struck him to the earth poor fellow said the king it is a heavy blow for a small offence to the hired hootings of the military mob he replied coolly poor souls they would say the same to their generals for sixpence as the royal victim approached his chair his bearers pulled off their hats and stood in reverential attitudes to receive him this unbought homage again roused the wrath of axtel who, with blows of his indefatigable cudgel, vainly endeavored to prevail on the poor men to cover their heads. Whether his arm was tired with its patriotic exertions that day, or whether he found the combativeness of the laboring class of his countrymen indomitable, is not decided, but it is certain that the bearers persisted in their original determination. As Axtell followed the king's chair down King Street, the spectators called to him, do you have our king carried in a common hired chair, like one who hath the plague? God help him out of such hands as yours. As soon as the king arrived at Whitehall, Hark ye, said he to Herbert, my nephew, that is Charles Louis, Prince Palatine, and a few lords here, who are attached to me, will do all in their power to see me. I thank them, but my time is short and precious, and must be devoted to preparation. I hope my friends will not take offense because I refuse to see any one but my children. All that those who love me can do for me now is to pray for me. It appears that the fanatical buffoon, Hugh Peters, was very anxious to intrude his spiritual aid on his majesty, and would have thrust his abhorred person into his presence, but was expelled by Colonel Tomlinson, the humane and manly commander of the guard. 
several of the sentinels posted within the king's bedroom endeavored to smoke tobacco and practice other annoyances but were prevented by tomlinson for whose conduct charles was most grateful permission was to be obtained from the regicide conclave before the king could either see his children or receive religious aid according to his own belief the night of his condemnation he was deprived of rest by the knocking of the workmen who were commencing the scaffold for his execution in the restless watches of that perturbed night charles finished his verses found among the papers of his kinsman the duke of hamilton the last lines appear to have been written after his sentence there is in them the pathos of truth their ruggedness arises from being cast in the sapphic metre which is nearly impracticable in our language great monarch of the world from whose gift springs all the puissance and the might of kings record the royal woe this sad verse sings nature and law by thy divine decree the only root of righteous royalty with my dim diadem invested me the fiercest furies which do daily tread upon my grief my great discrowned head are those who to my bounty owe their bread churchmen are chained and schismatics are freed mechanics preach and holy fathers bleed the crown is crucified with the creed my royal consort from whose fruitful womb so many princes legally have come is forced in pilgrimage to seek a tomb great britain's heir is forced into france whilst o'er his father's head his foes advance poor child he weeps out his inheritance with mine own power my majesty they wound in the king's name the king himself's uncrowned so doth the dust destroy the diamond felons obtain more privilege than i they are allowed to answer ere they die tis death for me to ask the reason why yet sacred saviour with thy words i woo thee to forgive and not be bitter to such as thou knowest know not what they do augment my patience nullify my hate preserve my children and inspire my mate yet though we perish bless this church and state the king was removed from whitehall sunday january twenty eighth to st james's palace where he heard bishop juxton preach in the private chapel i wanted to preach to the poor wretch said the absurd fanatic hugh peters in great indignation but the poor wretch would not hear me when bishop juxton entered the presence of his captive sovereign he gave way to the most violent burst of sorrow compose thyself my lord said the king we have no time to waste on grief let us rather think of the great matter i must prepare to appear before god to whom in a few hours i have to render my account i hope to meet death with calmness and that you will have the goodness to render me your assistance do not let us speak of the men in whose hands i have fallen they thirst for my blood they shall have it god's will be done i give him thanks forgive them all sincerely but let us say no more about them it was with the greatest difficulty that the two sentinels appointed by the regicidal junta could be kept on the other side of the door while his majesty was performing his devotions they opened it every two or three minutes to see that he had not escaped at the dawn of the next day the king was up and ready to commence his devotions with the bishop who came to st james's soon after the royal children arrived from sion house to see their parent for the last time he had not been indulged with the sight of them since his captivity to the army and on the morrow he was to die the princess elizabeth burst into a passion of tears at the sight of her father and her brother the little duke of gloucester wept as fast for company the royal father consoled and soothed them and when he had solemnly blessed them he drew them to his bosom the young princess who was but twelve has left her reminiscences of this touching interview in manuscript it were pity that the king's words should be given in any other but her simple narrative which is endorsed what the king said to me on the twenty ninth of january sixteen forty eight the last time i had the happiness to see him he told me that he was glad i was come for though he had not time to say much yet somewhat he wished to say to me which he could not to another and he feared that the cruelty was too great to permit his writing but sweetheart he added thou wilt forget what i tell thee then shedding abundance of tears continues the princess i told him that i would write down all he said to me he wished me he said 
not to grieve and torment myself for him, for it was a glorious death he should die, it being for the laws and religion of the land. He told me what books to read against popery. He said that he had forgiven all his enemies, and he hoped God would forgive them also, and he commanded us and the rest of my brothers and sisters to forgive them also. Above all, he bade me tell my mother that his thoughts had never strayed from her, and that his love for her would be the same to the last. With all he commanded me, and my brother, to love her, and be obedient to her. He desired me not to grieve for him, for he should die a martyr, and that he doubted not, but God would restore the throne to his son, and that then we should be all happier than we could possibly have been, if he had lived. Then, taking my brother Gloucester on his knee, he said, sweetheart now will they cut off thy father's head upon which the child looked very steadfastly upon him heed my child what i say they will cut off my head and perhaps make thee a king but mark what i say you must not be a king as long as your brothers charles and james live therefore i charge you do not be made a king by them at which the child sighing deeply replied i will be torn in pieces first and these words, coming so unexpectedly from so young a child, rejoiced my father exceedingly. And his majesty spoke to him of the welfare of his soul, and to keep his religion, commanding him to fear God, and he would provide for him. All which the young child earnestly promised. The king fervently kissed and blessed his children, and called to Bishop Juxton to take them away. The children sobbed aloud. The king leant his head against the window, trying to repress his tears, when catching a view of them as they went through the door, he hastily came from the window, snatching them again to his breast, kissed and blessed them once more, then tearing himself from their tears and caresses, he fell on his knees and strove to calm, by prayer, the agony of that parting. While this tender interview took place between King Charles and his bereaved children, the regicides sat in secret conclave to determine on the hour and manner of their victim's death. It was with the greatest difficulty that the junta could be gathered together. When they were driven in by a small knot of thoroughgoing destructives, there was greater difficulty to induce them to sign. Cromwell, whose general demeanor always appeared as if stimulated by strong drink, seems that morning to have fortified his spirits beyond the restraints of caution. After he had written his name, he smeared the ink all over Henry Martin's face, who instantly returned the compliment ten or twelve of the persons, among whom was Colonel Downs, afterwards pleaded that their signatures were extorted by him under threats of death, and as they proved their assertions, when times changed, their lives were spared in consequence. Colonel Inglesby, who had positively refused to sit as judge, happened to come into the room on business, on which Cromwell, who was his cousin, sprung on him, and dragged him forward with bursts of laughter, saying, this time thou shalt not escape. And with much laughing and romping, assisted by several others, put the pen in his hand, and guided it while he affixed his name. On the night preceding the awful day, Charles I was blessed with calm and refreshing sleep. He awoke before daybreak, and hearing sighs and moans, he drew his curtain and saw, by the light of a great cake of wax, which burnt in a silver basin, that his faithful Herbert, who slept in his room on a pallet, was troubled by the unrest of a fearful dream. The king spoke to Herbert, and he awoke. Under the agitation of the direful matter impending, Herbert had dreamed that Laud, in his pontifical habit, had entered the apartment, had knelt to the king, that they conversed, the king looked pensive, the archbishop sighed, and on retiring, fell prostrate. Herbert related this vision, on which Charles observed, The dream is remarkable, but he is dead. Had we conferred together, it is possible, albeit I love him well, that I might have said somewhat which would have caused his sigh. I will now rise, added the king. I have a great work to do this day. Herbert's hands trembled while combing the king's hair. Charles, observing that it was not arranged so well as usual, said, Nay, though my head be not to stand long on my shoulders, take the same pains with it that you were wont to do. Herbert, this is my second marriage day. I would be as trim today as may be. The cold was intense that season, and the king desired to have a warm additional shirt. 
for continued he the weather is sharp and probably may make me shake i would have no imputation of fear for death is not terrible to me i bless my god i am prepared let the rogues come whenever they please he observed that he was glad that he had slept at st james's for the walk through the park would circulate his blood and counteract the numbness of the cold bishop juxton arrived by the dawn of day he prayed with the king and read to him the twenty-seventh chapter of the gospel of st matthew my lord asked the king did you choose this chapter as applicable to my situation i beg your majesty to observe said the bishop that it is the gospel of the day as the calendar indicates the king was deeply affected and continued his prayers with increased fervor at ten o'clock the summons came to conduct the king to whitehall and he went down into the park through which he was to pass ten companies of infantry formed a double line on each side of his path the detachment of halberdiers preceded him with banners flying and drums beating on the king's right hand was the bishop on the left with head uncovered walked colonel tomlinson the humanity and kindness of this gentleman were acknowledged by the king with the utmost gratitude he gave him a gold at tui as a token of remembrance and requested that he would not leave him till all was over the king discoursed with him on his funeral and said that he wished the duke of richmond and the earl of hertford to have the care of it the king walked through the park as was his wont at a quick lively pace he wondered at the slowness of his guard and called out pleasantly come my good fellows step on a pace one of the officers asked him if it was true that he had concurred with the duke of buckingham in causing his father's death my friend replied charles with gentle contempt if i had no other sin than that as god knows i should have little need to beg his forgiveness at this hour the question has been cited as an instance of premeditated cruelty and audacity on the part of the officer by the time and place and the mildness of the king's answer the questioner must have been tomlinson who evidently had become in the course of his guardship of a few days the king's ardent admirer he had been prejudiced like many others by the absurd scandal that charles had conspired with buckingham and had poisoned james the first this falsehood was probably invented by the enemies who accused james the first of poisoning his son henry absurd as these tales appear the systematic slanders of that day in the absence of all wholesome information from the public press had a direful effect on the prosperity of the royal family as the king drew near whitehall palace he pointed to a tree in the park and said to either juxton or tomlinson that tree was planted by my brother henry there was a broad flight of stairs from the park by which access was gained to the ancient palace of whitehall it is expressly said by herbert that the king entered the palace that way and that he ascended the stairs with a light step passed through the long gallery and gained his own bedroom where he was left with bishop juxton who administered the communion to him nye and godwin two independent ministers knocked at the door and tendered their spiritual assistance say to them frankly said the king that they have so often prayed against me that they shall not pray with me in mine agony but if they will pray for me now tell them i shall be thankful dinner had been prepared for the king at whitehall he refused to eat sir said juxton you have fasted long to-day the weather is so cold that faintness may occur you are right replied the king and took a piece of bread and a glass of wine now said the king cheerfully let the rascals come i forgive them and am quite ready but the rascals were not ready a series of contests had taken place regarding the executioner and the warrant to him moreover the military commanders hunks and fayer appointed to superintend the bloody work resisted alike the scoffings the jests and threats of cromwell and had their names scratched out of the warrant and hunks refused to write or sign the order to the executioner this dispute occurred just before the execution took place hunks was one of the officers who guarded the king on his trial and had been chosen for that purpose as the most furious of his foes he had like tomlinson become wholly altered from the result of his personal observations colonel axtell and colonel hewson had the preceding night convened a meeting of thirty-eight stout sergeants of the army 
to whom they proposed that whosoever among them would aid the hangman in disguise should have one hundred pounds and rapid promotion in the army every one separately refused with disgust late in the morning of the execution colonel hewson prevailed on a sergeant in his regiment one hewlett to undertake the detestable office and while this business was in progress elijah axtell brother of the colonel went by water to rosemary lane beyond the tower and dragged from thence the reluctant hangman gregory brandon who was by threats and the promise of thirty pounds in half crowns induced to strike the blow the disguises of the executioners were hideous and must have been imposed for the purpose of trying the firmness of the royal victim they wore coarse woolen garbs buttoned close to the body which was the costume of butchers at that era hewlett added a long gray peruke and a black mask with a large gray beard affixed to it gregory brandon wore a black mask a black peruke and a large flapped black hat looped in front a horrible butchery was meditated in case of the king's personal resistance for by the advice of hugh peters staples were driven into the floor to fasten him down to the scaffold the king meantime had had the satisfaction of receiving a letter from his son charles by mr seymour a special messenger enclosing a carte blanche with his signature to be filled up at pleasure in this paper the prince bound himself to any terms if his royal father's life might be spared it must have proved a cordial to the king's heart to find in that dire hour how far family affection prevailed over ambition the king carefully burnt the carte blanche lest any evil use might be made of it and did not attempt to bargain for his life by means of concessions for his heir it was past one o'clock before the grisly attendants and apparatus of the scaffold were ready hacker knocked on the door of the king's chamber bishop juxton and herbert fell on their knees rise my old friend said charles holding out his hand to the bishop and he ordered herbert to open the door hacker led the king through the present banqueting hall at the further end of which a window had been taken out and a passage constructed which led to the scaffold raised on the street the noble bearing of the king as he stepped on the scaffold his beaming eyes and high expression were noticed by all who saw him he looked on all sides for his people but dense masses of soldiery only presented themselves far and near he was out of hearing of any persons but juxton and herbert save those who were interested in his destruction the soldiers preserved a dead silence this time they did not insult him the distant populace wept and occasionally raised mournful cries in blessings and prayers for him the king addressed a short speech to the bishop and to colonel tomlinson which last person stood near the king and yet screened from the sight of all the world in the entrance of the passage which led into the banqueting hall the substance of the speech that the king made was to point out that every institution of the original constitution of england as the church lords and commons had been subverted with the sovereign power that if he would have consented to reign by the mere despotism of the sword he might have lived and remained king therefore he died a martyr for the liberties of the people of england he added that he died a christian of the church of england in the rights of which he had just participated while he was speaking some one touched the axe which laid enveloped in the black crape on the block the king turned round hastily and exclaimed have a care of the axe if the edge is spoiled it will be the worse for me the executioner gregory brandon drew near to him and kneeling before him entreated his forgiveness no said the king i forgive no subject of mine who comes deliberately to shed my blood charles had probably guessed the cause of the delay of his execution in the trepidation of the executioner and thought that if the man refused to perform the bloody task there might arise a diversion in his favor in that case the other masked ruffian sergeant hewlett would there is no doubt have perpetrated the murder and was placed there for the purpose lest the firmness of the common executioner failed in action nevertheless the king spoke as become his duty as chief magistrate and the source of the laws which were violated in his murder the wretched brandon might have revenged himself by mangling his royal victim on the contrary he was convinced of the justice of the answer and behaved most reverentially to him on the scaffold the king put up his flowing hair under a cap then turning to the executioner asked 
Is any of my hair in the way? I beg your majesty to push it more under your cap, replied the man, bowing. The bishop assisted his royal master to do so, and observed to him, There is but one stage more, which, though turbulent and troublesome, is yet a very short one. Consider, it will carry you a great way, even from earth to heaven. I go, replied the king, from a corruptible to an incorruptible crown, where no disturbance can take place. He then threw off his cloak and George, the latter he gave to Juxton, saying, with emphasis, Remember. No explanation of which mysterious injunction has ever been given. He then took off his coat and put on his cloak, and, pointing to the block, said to the executioner, Place it so that it will not shake. It is firm, sir, replied the man. I shall say a short prayer, said the king, and when I hold out my hands thus, strike. The king stood in profound meditation, said a few words to himself, looked upwards on the heavens, then knelt and laid his head on the block. In about a minute, he stretched out his hands, and his head was severed at one blow. A simultaneous groan of agony arose from the assembled multitude at the moment when the fatal blow fell on the neck of Charles I. It was the protest of an outraged people, suffering equally with their monarch under military tyranny, and those who heard that cry recalled it with horror to their deaths. When the king's head fell, Hewlett, the gray beard mask, came forward to earn his bribe and subsequent promotion. He held up the bleeding head and uttered, this is the head of a traitor. A deep, angry murmur from the people followed the announcement. Two troops of horse, advancing in different directions, dispersed the indignant crowd. The royal corpse was placed in a coffin, and followed by Bishop Juxton and Herbert, was carried into the palace of Whitehall, where Cromwell came to see it. He considered it attentively, and taking up the head, to make sure that it was severed from the body, said, this was a well-constituted frame, and promised long life. Crowds of people beset the palace, but very few were admitted to see the corpse of their murdered monarch, over which Colonel Axtell, the person who was so peculiarly active in his destruction, kept guard. Sir Purbeck Temple, with infinite difficulty, and by making great interest, was admitted to see the remains of the king. As the coffin was enclosed, Axtell said, if thou thinkest there is any holiness in it, look there. And the king, added Sir Purbeck Temple, seemed to smile as in life. The body was conveyed to St. James's Palace to be embalmed. Here it remained till February 7th, when it was conveyed for interment to Windsor, followed by Bishop Juxton and the attached gentlemen who had attended on the king in all his wanderings. The king had expressed a wish to be interred by his father in the royal chapel at Westminster Abbey, but Cromwell forbade it, having, for an absurd species of ambition, reserved that place for himself. He answered, that opening the vaults at Westminster Abbey would prove an encouragement to superstition. He probably dreaded the excitement of the populace. When the royal hearse, with its poor escort of four mourning coaches, arrived at Windsor Castle, the coffin was placed for the night in the king's late bedchamber, and the next day brought down into the noble hall of St. George. Four bearers of gentle blood, belonging to the king's late household, in deep mourning, carried the coffin on their shoulders. The pall was sustained by the Duke of Richmond, the Earl of Hertford, and the Lords Lindsay and Southampton. The most profound sorrow was visible in their countenances. The afternoon had been clear and bright till the coffin was carried out of the hall, when snow began to fall so fast and thick, that by the time the corpse entered the west end of the royal chapel, the black velvet pall was entirely white, the color of innocency. So went our king white to his grave, said the sorrowful servants of Charles I. The roundhead which caught the governor of the regal seat of Windsor, rudely interrupted Bishop Juxton, who with open book met the coffin reverentially. Witchcott prevented him from reading the beautiful service of the Church of England as profane and papistical. It was found withal that no inscription had been placed on the royal coffin. One of the gentlemen present supplied this want by a simple but effectual expedient. A band of sheet lead was procured, and they cut out of it with pen knives spaces in the forms of large letters, so that the words, Charles Rex, 1648, could be read. 
the leaden band was then lapped round the coffin. Half blinded with their tears, and with the gloom of impending night, thick with falling snow, the faithful friends and servants of Charles I lowered his coffin among that portion of England's royal dead who repose at Windsor, and left him there without either singing or saying, or even the power of ascertaining the precise spot where he was laid. The mourning people of Charles I wrote many elegies on the deep tragedy of his death, which was perpetrated before their eyes and in their despite. The following lines preserve some forgotten historical traits. They were evidently written at the moment, and are valuable, because they identified the tradition that the wife of Cromwell, a good and virtuous matron, shared in the general grief for the murder of her king. The first couplet alludes to an assertion of some of the rebels in their treaties, that they would make Charles I the most glorious monarch in Christendom. They made him glorious, but the way they marked him out was Golgotha, the tears of our new pilot's wife, could not avail to save his life. They were outbalanced with the cry and the clamor of crucify. The sons of dragons that did sit at Westminster contrived it, and the vile purchase crew will have their sovereign hurried to the grave, cause from that conclave came the cry, it was expedient he should die. Him they delivered to the hands of those accursed bloody bands, to make his sufferings more complete, he suffered to without the gate, the king is dead, the kingdom's hearts thus cry, though the law says the king doth never die, but laws had died before his blood was spilt. Therefore, as he was ready to lay down, his mortal for a true immortal crown, this his own epitaph, he left behind, which men and angels to his glory sing, the people's martyr and the people's king. The trial, death, and burial of Charles I, had taken place before the queen, besieged as she was in Paris, could receive the least intelligence of these awful incidents. End of section 12. Section 13 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 8, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Henrietta Maria, Chapter 4, Part 1. The queen remained in ignorance, not only of the death of her husband, but of every particular relating to his trial, until February 18th, 1648-49. She was beleaguered in the Louvre, in double circles of siege and counter-siege. That portion of the French troops, still loyal to Anne of Austria and her son, the young king, besieged the insurgent city of Paris. But the frangeurs, knowing that the Queen of England warmly favored the royal party, kept strict guard and watch round her residence, in order to prevent any communication between her and the court at Saint-Germain. Thus was all intelligence cut off, since it was not without the greatest personal risk that any agent of Queen Henrietta could pass both circles. Nevertheless, despite of siege and counter-siege, rumor had carried the portentous tidings to the Louvre, and it was whispered, only too truly, in the queen's household. But the agonized hope, to which Henrietta still clung, was so pitiable, that no one would mention the dreadful report, which had not yet received official confirmation. No one of her household dared plunge her into the despair they dreaded, without being sure that the fact was past dispute. Lord German, however, thought he could prepare her for the worst, by inventing a rumor that the king had been tried, condemned, and even led to execution, but that his subjects had risen en masse, torn him from the scaffold, and preserved his life. Unfortunately, this tale raised no alarm, but rather increased the false hopes in the sanguine mind of the queen. She knew, she said, how dearly the king was beloved by many, who were ready still to sacrifice life and fortune in his service, and she was sure, now the crisis had come, that the great body of his subjects, to whom he was really dear, would be roused into activity by the cruelty of his persecutors, and that all for the future would go well. While this terrible suspense continued, James, Duke of York, suddenly made his appearance at the Louvre. He came in while the queen was at dinner, says Father Cyprian, knelt down and asked his mother's blessing, for such is always the custom of English children when they have been absent for any time from their parents. 
the queen received him with transports of joy she had some time previously written to him to expedite his arrival but the tumultuous state of paris had prevented his journey he was guided to the arms of the queen his mother by sir john denham the cavalier poet greatly exhilarated by the arrival of her favorite son the queen rose on the morning of february eighteenth with the determination that a fresh effort should be made to obtain tidings of her husband she entreated a brave and faithful gentleman of her household to proceed to saint germain to ascertain what news the queen regent had lately received from london the messenger accordingly undertook the perilous service of passing and repassing both circles of besiegers and set off for saint germain in laye where the court of france was then resident those who knew the dreadful secret anticipated the agonizing scene that would ensue if the messenger ever succeeded in making his way back and after pere gamache had said grace after dinner lord jermyn entreated him not to retire but to stay to offer the yet unconscious widow all the consolation she could derive from the ministers of her religion oh the dull anguish of those hours of suspense when the shadow of the fatal event was casting its gloom over part of the assembly and the heart of her most concerned in the approaching tidings was still agitated by the sharp pangs of hope the actual truth had been communicated to pere gamache who thus had nothing to distract his observation from the effect of the authentic tidings on the mind of the hapless queen but what words can we find so forcibly to delineate this climax of a royal tragedy as those of him who drew it from the life at this grievous intelligence says the pere gamache i felt my whole frame shudder and was forced to turn aside from the royal circle where conversation went on for an hour on divers matters without any subject being started which had the effect of diverting the mind of the queen from the dire inquietude under which it was secretly oppressed at last she complained piteously of the tardiness of her messenger and said that he ought to have returned before with his tidings then lord jermyn spoke the gentleman dispatched on this errand he said is known to be so faithful and so prompt in executing all your majesty's commands that if he had had aught but very disastrous tidings he would have been in your presence ere this whatever they may be replied the queen i see that you know them full well i do indeed know somewhat replied lord jermyn then the queen dreadfully alarmed entreated him to speak less darkly and after many circumvolutions and ambiguous words he at length explained the horrid truth to her who never expected such intelligence oh the cruel kindness of those who undertake to break calamitous tidings by degrees and yet sudden death has been known to follow such a tale too bluntly told and indeed the communication as it was almost stopped the springs of life when the widowed queen at length was brought to comprehend her loss she stood continues pere gamache motionless as a statue without words and without tears a great philosopher has said that ordinary griefs allow the heart to sigh and the lips to murmur but that extraordinary afflictions terrible and fatal cast the soul into stupor and by locking up the senses make the tongue mute and the eyes tearless if the good father had been like charles i himself a reader of shakespeare he would have described the state into which the royal widow was plunged by that exquisite quotation the grief that cannot speak whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break to all our exhortations and arguments the pair continues our queen was deaf and insensible at last awed by her appalling grief we ceased talking and stood round her in perturbed silence some sighing some weeping all with mournful and sympathizing looks bent on her immovable countenance so we continued till nightfall when the duchess of vendome whom our queen tenderly loved came to see her weeping she took the hand of the royal widow and tenderly kissed it and at last succeeded in awakening her from the stupor of grief into which she had been plunged since she had comprehended the dreadful death of her husband she was able to sigh and weep and soon expressed a desire to retire from the world to indulge in the profound sorrow she suffered 
Her little daughter was with her, and her maternal love found it hard to separate from her, yet she longed to withdraw into some humble abode where she might weep at will. At last she resolved to retire, with a few of her ladies, into the convent of the Carmelites, Faubourg Saint-Jacques, in Paris. Before Henrietta went to the convent, her friend Madame de Motville obtained leave to see her. It was the day after she had learned the fatal tidings. Madame de Motville's friends had made interest with the frangeurs to permit her departure from Paris to join her royal mistress, the Queen Regent of France. She was anxious to know if the afflicted Queen of England had any message to send to her royal relatives. I was, she says, admitted to her bedside, where I fell on my knees, and she gave me her hand, amidst a thousand sobs, which often choked her speech. She commanded me to tell my queen, the state in which I found her, that King Charles, her lord, whose death made her the most afflicted woman on the wide earth, had been lost because none of those whom he trusted had told him the truth, and that a people, when irritated, was like a ferocious beast, whose rage nothing can moderate, as the king, her lord, had just proved, and that she prayed God that the queen regent might be more fortunate in France than she and King Charles had been in England. But above all, she counseled her to hear the truth and to labor to discover it, for she believed that the greatest evil that could befall sovereigns was to rest in ignorance of the truth, which ignorance reverses thrones and destroys empires. That if I was really faithful to my queen, that is Anne of Austria, I should tell her these things, and speak to her clearly on the state of her affairs, and she finished with an affectionate remembrance I was to make to my queen in her name. Then the afflicted queen gave me some orders, relative to the interests of the young king, her son, become Charles the Second through the lamentable death of his father. She entreated that he might be recognized as such by the king and queen of France, and that her second son, James, Duke of York, might receive the same entertainment as the king his brother had previously done. As she reiterated these requests, she wrung my hand and said to me, with a burst of grief and tenderness, I have lost a king, a husband, and a friend, whose loss I can never sufficiently mourn, and this separation must render the rest of my life a perpetual torture. I avow that the tears and words of this afflicted queen touched me deeply. Besides the sympathy I felt in her grief, I was astonished at the words she commanded me to repeat to my queen, and the calamities she seemed to foresee for us. Nor did I ever forget the discourse of this princess, who, enlightened by adversity, seemed to presage for us such disasters. Heaven avert them from us, but we merited them all from the justice of God." Thus does Madame de Motteville clearly indicate that this warning message, which was duly repeated by her, from the mourning queen of England in the depth of her misery to the queen regent of France, had the effect of delaying that awful revolution, which in these our latter days ravaged France, and which is yet rife in the memory of many of our contemporaries in the present century. Often did Queen Henrietta say to me that she was astonished how she ever could survive the loss of Charles, when she so well knew that life could contain, after this calamity, nothing but bitterness for her. I have lost a crown, she would say, but that I had long before ceased to regret. It is the husband whom I grieve, good, just, wise, virtuous as he was, most worthy of my love and that of his subjects. The future must be for me but a continual succession of misery and afflictions. It had been well if those historians, who choose to represent this queen as indifferent to her husband, had taken the trouble to read the testimony of this witness of her conduct, and at the same time, to have identified how worthy the virtuous life and noble sentiments of that witness made her of belief. For without the least democratic bias, Madame de Motteville moderately, but firmly, indicates that there were abuses needful to be reformed in the government, both of France and England, which could only be effected by the sovereigns of either country, acquainting themselves with facts as they existed, and conscientiously learning the truth of all that was going on under their government. Most faithfully, as a true friend of humanity, has she preserved the testimony of Queen Henrietta Maria, uttered in the agony of bereaved affections, 
that if her husband and herself had learned the truth in time, much of their own sufferings and those of their people might have been averted. Queen Henrietta, continues her friend, had enlightened and noble sentiments. In consequence, she keenly felt all that she had lost and all she owed to the memory of a king and husband, who had so tenderly loved her, who had given her his entire confidence, and had always considered her above all persons. He had shared with her his grandeur and prosperity, and it was but just, as she said, that she should take her part in the bitterness of his adversity and sorrow for him, as if his death had taken place each day that she lived to the last hour of her life. In fact, she wore a perpetual widow's mourning for him on her person and in her heart. This lasting sadness, those who knew her were well aware, was a great change from her natural disposition, which was gay, gladsome, and apt, to see all the ordinary occurrences of life in a bright and cheerful light. From that hour she surnamed herself La Malarousse Reign. The royal widow left the Louvre amidst the tears and sobs of her attendants for her temporary retirement with the Carmelite nuns, Faubourg Saint-Jacques. Her last words were to commend her little daughter, the Princess Henrietta, to her affectionate governess, the Countess of Morton, charging her to take care of her manners and conduct while to me, that is Père Gamache, she left the instruction of this royal infant. Directly she entered into the convent, she gave herself up to prayer, to mortification, and a course of meditation on the inscrutability of the decrees of God, the inconstancy and fragility of human life, and of the riches, grandeur, and honors of this world. Too soon was she roused from the holy calm, which such salutary exercises give to sorrow, the affairs of the king, her son, and of her own family and household, being in so bad a state that they commanded her utmost care, her wisest counsel, and even active exertions, and I was obliged to seek her, to urge her to leave her peaceful retirement with the nuns and return to the Louvre. At that time, her son, Charles II, was at the Hague, where he was recognized as king by the states of Holland. It was the wish of the young king to remain there, but the strong military despotism of Cromwell was too formidable to the states of Holland to suffer it. The queen wrote to her son to come to her. He arrived in the summer of 1649. The mother and son had their first interview at Saint-Germain, and afterwards she returned with him to her abode at the Louvre. Two of the royal children remained prisoners in England. One of these was the hapless Princess Elizabeth, the other the little Duke of Gloucester. They were soon after, for a few months, consigned to the care of their mother's former favorite, the treacherous Lady Carlisle, who for none of her good deeds had been favored by Parliament with the grant of eight thousand pounds per annum for their maintenance, but with a strict charge that they were to be deprived of all princely distinction. We now and then gather the movements of Henrietta from the narrative of her niece, Mademoiselle de Montpensier. It is well known that Gaston, Duke of Orléans, secretly favored the Fronde, and maintained a species of facetious neutrality between the Queen Regent and the Parisians. He chose to be the arbiter between the people and the court. Gaston affirmed that his sister, Queen Henrietta, took the part of Anne of Austria against the Fronde. He strove to rid himself of her embarrassing presence in Paris, where she unwove the meshes his shallow ambition was spinning. He was, however, a character whose affections always ran counter to his policy. He was angry with Henrietta, but finally forgave her. She declared that both loyalty and gratitude obliged her to espouse the cause of the court, but that her advice was pacific in regard to the people. We have the evidence of Madame de Motteville that such was truly the case. Mademoiselle de Montpensier made Charles II feel her resentment for her political pique with his mother. He was still endeavoring to gain her hand. One day, soon after the triumphant return of Mademoiselle de Montpensier from Orléans, where she had really done much good by her intrepid decision in a moment of great popular excitement, Queen Henrietta addressed these remarkable words to her. I am not astonished that you saved Orléans from the hands of its enemies, for the Pucellet had, in the old times, set you that example, and like the Pucellet of Orlan, you began the matter by chasing the English, for before you went thither, my son was chassé by you. 
I paid my duty to her as my aunt, as Mademoiselle de Montpensier. But I was forced to be less frequent in my visits to her, for it is not pleasant to dispute perpetually with persons that one ought to respect. Although Condé and the heads of the Fronde held the queen in great estimation, the rabble of the Frangeurs pursued her with insults whenever she appeared beyond the gates of the Louvre. At last she would go out no more, but remained in a state of siege, suffering a thousand privations, with a patience which silenced all murmurs among her household, who often observed that, whilst their queen seemed so satisfied, they ought not to complain. Henrietta found herself, however, so useful to the queen regent, that she would not quit her sojourn at the Louvre. Though alarmed for her safety, she was perpetually entreated to come to Saint-Germain, and share what they had there. Once or twice, Henrietta went to Saint-Germain to visit the queen regent and the young king. She was, however, glad to take the escort of her fantastic niece, Mademoiselle de Montpensier, at that time heroine of the Fronde, who conducted her to the gate of the Chateau of Saint-Germain. On one of these occasions, Mademoiselle de Montpensier makes a great merit of reconciling her father, the Duke of Orléans, to Queen Henrietta. At last Henrietta found it was impossible to remain longer at the Louvre, and retired finally to Saint-Germain. Her journey was a very dangerous one. The people menaced her as she went through Paris, and her creditors threatened to arrest her coach. This scene, which was perhaps more trying to the generous spirit of Henrietta than all her other misfortunes, is confirmed by the malignant exultation of the roundhead newspapers. From the superabundance of spite in the Republican party is to be learned the fact that the young king, in his deep mourning for his murdered sire, rode by the side of his mother's coach, and guarded her person in this dangerous transit. The enemies of the royal exiles seem to think that the reproach of poverty would make all the world view a circumstance so deeply interesting, with the scorn they did themselves. The royal children of France, with the queen regent, came to Chateau to welcome the unfortunate Henrietta and her son, after their perilous and miserable journey, and they conducted her to her apartments in the old Chateau of Saint-Germain, which were, in all probability, the same angle looking over the Partre and Place des Armes of Saint-Germain, which was subsequently more celebrated as the place of her son James II's last exile. The melancholy old chateau, desolate and degraded as it is at present, has survived the gay sunny palace of recent date, built on the terrace above the Seine by Henri Cotte, and looking out over the pleasant land of France. Anne of Austria would not live in the old grim castle, because it affected her health, and indeed the stone trench surrounding it, which was at that time full of water, must have been injurious to Queen Henrietta, who often suffered from pulmonary maladies. The sojourn of Queen Henrietta at Saint-Germain proved, however, but a temporary visit. The fury of the civil war abated. Her mediation became so needful with Condé and Lorraine that she, in the summer, returned to Paris, and was actually there, August 18, 1649, when Anne of Austria and her young son, Louis XIV, made their grand entry into the metropolis. After giving an audience of forgiveness to the principal frangeurs, they paid a state visit of condolence to Queen Henrietta on the death of her husband. These royal relatives, when they had previously met at Saint-Germain, had found opportunity to discuss the melancholy subject. Therefore, nothing was mentioned likely to agonize the feelings of Henrietta. The young king of England, observes Madame de Motteville, was there in his deep mourning for his father. It was his first formal state recognition at the court of France. Early in September, this prince resolved to set out for the Isle of Jersey, which still, with its sister islands, acknowledged its allegiance to the royal house of Stuart. From thence he resolved to pass to Scotland or Ireland. The queen was greatly averse to this scheme, and reproached her son and Sir Edward Hyde, that is Clarendon, with neglect of her advice. At that time, her differences had not arisen to any great height with Hyde. She expressed her esteem for his great integrity and devoted love to her late husband, and said, that she wished he would always be near the young king, because he would, she knew, deal plainly and honestly with him, and advise him to live virtuously. 
it was agreed by charles the second's privy council that chancellor hyde should depart on an embassy to spain to supplicate for assistance against the english regicides queen henrietta expressed her regret that the means and times of this valuable minister should be thus wasted she said that if they would listen to her advice she could tell them beforehand that they would find the court of spain cold and unwilling to render any assistance this the chancellor owns he found by experience was exactly the case the queen and the chancellor seldom agreed yet she always rendered justice to his uncompromising sincerity one day at this juncture when talking of her affairs among her ladies a dangerous habit which she never left off her majesty expressed some resentment towards a person who had been influential in the council of the late king who always spoke the fairest words to her and courteously promised compliance with all her wishes even suggesting to her to ask of her husband indulgences she had never thought of before yet she found out soon after that he was the only man who advised the king privately to deny her the very same favors some of the queen's ladies had a great curiosity to know who this double dealer was but the queen persisted in concealing his name one of the ladies present said that she hoped it was not chancellor hyde no replied her majesty be sure it is not him for he never uses flattering compliments to me i verily believe that if by my conduct he deemed that i deserved the most infamous name he would not scruple to call me by it the lady repeated this saying to the chancellor who was much pleased with the queen's opinion of him the young king notwithstanding all his mother's remonstrances persisted in his intention of venturing into his lost dominions to seek his fortune queen henrietta was alarmed the youth of her son and the desperate state of their party in england took from her all hopes of success and as she found that he would not listen to her she desired lord jermyn to represent the danger to him the young prince replied it is far better for a king to die in such an enterprise than to wear away life in shameful indolence here the high resolve and daring adventures so frequently undertaken by charles the second before he was twenty form remarkable contrasts to the indolence and reckless profligacy in which his manly years were wasted charles the second went to jersey in september sixteen forty nine with his brother james duke of york and was proclaimed king of great britain in the loyal channel islands scotland being offended at cromwell's recent change of the british kingdoms into a republic sent deputies to negotiate with charles the second who received and conferred with them at jersey and this proved the commencement of his temporary recognition in scotland and of the series of wild and daring adventures in which he engaged from his landing in scotland till his escape after the battle of worcester a large portion of the irish people were desirous that the attempt of the king should be made on their shores which was doubtless the reason why cromwell visited that devoted island with the fierce scourges of fire confiscation and the exterminating sword in the year of blood sixteen forty nine a visitation which drew from a noble english historian albeit never too sympathizing in the case of ireland the appalling comment that since the middle of the sixteenth century the miseries of that country could only be compared with those of the jews after the taking of jerusalem a foreboding instinct warned the royal mother to prevent the reckless courage of her young son from leading him among these scenes of horror queen henrietta did not believe the time ripe for movement but she advised her son if he ventured to bend his course to scotland rather than to ireland they parted but it lists not here to tell aught of the passionate regrets that broke from the sad prince or perils that befell him in his wanderings nor of that famed oak in the deep solitudes of boscobel the health of the queen sunk under the reiterated trials which marked the dreadful year of sixteen forty nine she went to the bath of bourbon the same autumn that she parted from her son on her way thither she passed through moulin the retreat of her friend the duchess of montmorency whose calamitous widowhood bore some resemblance to her own this illustrious lady was nearly related to henrietta's mother being a princess of the house of orsini she had dedicated her youth her beauty and her life to the memory of her lost husband the last duke of montmorency 
it is well known that cardinal richelieu laid the foundation of his despotism on the ashes of that hero the widow of charles i could trace the commencement of her sorrows to the malign influence of that same stony-hearted politician in the spirit of sympathy the queen went to the convent of the visitation at moulin where in a chamber hung with black the widow of montmorency kept watch over the urn that held the heart of her murdered husband although that true heart had been cold in death for many a long year the widow of montmorency was as popular in france for her charity and piety as her husband had been for his valor and heroic qualities all mourners sought the duchess de montmorency for consolation no one needed it more than the royal widow of charles i the illustrious kinswomen wept together and received consolation from the sympathy of each other henrietta maria had given over her son for lost after the battle of worcester the particulars of his return are thus mentioned by her flippant niece mademoiselle de montpensier all the world went to console the queen of england but this only augmented her grief for she knew not if her son were a prisoner or dead this inquietude lasted not long she learned that he was at rouen and would soon be at paris upon which she went to meet him on her return i thought my personal inquiries could not be dispensed with therefore i went without my hair being dressed since i had a great deflection the queen when she saw me said that i should find her son very ridiculous since he had to save himself in disguise cut his hair off and had assumed an extraordinary garb at that moment he entered and i really thought he had a very fine figure and saw great improvement in his mien since we last parted although his hair was short and his moustaches long which indeed causes a great alteration in the appearance of most people lady fanshawe was at the court of the exiled queen at the time of the return of her son after an absence of upward of two years she says he had attained a majestic stature and had grown manly and powerful in person coarse in features and reckless in expression all his rich curls had been cut off for the purpose of disguise and were replaced by a black periwig he was far more changed in character than appearance all the high heroic sentiments derived from the classics all the noble romance of youth which usually brings forth grand fruits in manhood were obliterated by his visit to his native land mademoiselle de montpensier found to her astonishment that her mute cousin charles the second had in his absence from france learned to speak the french tongue with the utmost volubility and while she says we walked together in the great gallery which connects the louvre with the tuileries he gave me the history of all his adventures and escapes in scotland and england in which to her french imagination nothing was so marvellous as that the scotch should fancy that it was a crime to play the fiddle the morning after this promenade queen henrietta gravely renewed with this princess the subject of her son's passion she said to her that she had reproved charles but that he still persisted in loving her all this infinitely flattered the vanity of la grande mademoiselle but touched not her heart charles was too cool a lover to please her but she coquetted with the anxious mother and paraded her hopes of being the empress of germany or the queen of france many a bitter pang did this heartless woman give the fallen queen of great britain by her own account sometimes henrietta would observe to her that her son once the heir of the finest country in the world was now considered too beggarly and pitiful to aspire to the hand of the rich heiress of domes and montpensier then sighing the unfortunate henrietta would narrate all the wealth state and luxury of a queen in england at this narration the purse-proud heiress owns that she deliberated within herself whether she should make a merit of accepting the young king in his distress but then the doubt was whether his restoration would ever take place which doubt finally turned the scale against the royal exile the unfortunate widow of charles i found that she had in vain administered food to the vanity of her niece who liked her son well enough to be jealous of him but not well enough to make the slightest sacrifice in his behalf the contest that charles the second had maintained for his hereditary rights from sixteen forty nine to sixteen fifty one caused his young sister and brother who still remained prisoners in england to be treated with additional harshness by their jailers the republicans 
Reports arrived at the Queen's court that Cromwell talked of binding her little son, the Duke of Gloucester, apprentice to a shoemaker, and that her daughter, that young budding beauty, the Princess Elizabeth, was to be taught the trade of a button maker. There really was some discussion in the House of Commons relative to the maintenance of these royal orphans, in which Cromwell said, that as to the young boy, it would be better to bind him to a good trade. But the nearest approach to their degradation was, that the young prince's servants were directed to address him only as Master Harry. At his tender years, a top or even a marble, more or less, is more of consequence than a title or a dukedom. But the young prince was neither harmed in mind nor body by his republican jailers. The fair young princess Elizabeth was unfortunately of an age when the reverses of fortune are felt as keenly, nay, more so, than at a more advanced period of life. Perhaps her death wound was inflicted by the agony she suffered at the touching interviews with her father, interviews which drew tears down Cromwell's iron cheeks, it may be supposed, gave mortal pangs to the tender mind of the young bereaved daughter. The princess was, says Père Gamache, of a high and courageous spirit, and possessed a proud consciousness of the grandeur of her birth and descent. The anguish she felt at her father's murder was, still farther aggravated, when she was forced from the palace of St. James, the place of her birth, and carried to Carisbrook Castle, the scene of his saddest imprisonment, from whence he was dragged to die. She perpetually meditated on his bitter sufferings, and all the disasters of her royal house, till she fell into a slow but fatal fever. When she found herself ill, she resolutely refused to take medicine. Her little brother, Master Harry, as he was called, was her only companion. She expired alone, sitting in her apartment at Carisbrook Castle, her fair cheek resting on a Bible, which was the last gift of her murdered father, and which had been her only consolation in the last sad months of her life. Sir Theodore Mayern, her father's faithful physician, came to prescribe for her, but too late. He has made the following obituary memorial of the death of this princess, saying, She died on the 8th of September, 1650, in her prison at the Isle of Wight, of a malignant fever, which constantly increased, despite of medicine and remedies. The queen, her mother, resumes Père Cyprian Gamache, did not learn the sad death of the young princess Elizabeth without shedding abundance of tears, but the grief of her brothers, the Duke of York and the King, bore testimony to the fine qualities this beautiful princess possessed. All the royal family had, considering her great talents and the charms of her person, reckoned on her as a means of forming some high alliance, which would better their fortunes. Her lot was, however, very different. She was doomed in her opening flower of life to know all a true steward's heritage of woe. The young Elizabeth's melancholy death occurred in her fifteenth year, she was buried obscurely in Newport on the 24th of September, 1650. End of section 13.